Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Regional Championships of Europe. My name is Will Hall, better known on the internet as the Will Hall EXP. This man to my left, well, that is Hall of Famer Martin User, and we are going to be bringing you 15 rounds of Modern this weekend. That is right, Modern, the best format of Magic. Let's come at me if you're doing a wrong chat. Where well, we're going to have over 948 players, a European record, have turned up this weekend, trying to battle it out to get themselves a slot on that Pro Tour, which is happening in Europe later on in the, in the, uh, in the year. Of course, top 24 players are going to be getting invites to that, with two more getting to Worlds. So let's get the prizes up on the screen. Let's see exactly what they are playing for. Here it is for everybody at home. You can see, so on top of the... the Entry to the Pro Tour, which let's be honest, that's what everybody is here for. Everybody seen how good Barcelona was. They want to come to Amsterdam and they want to be able to ballot out against the best in the world. Well, we're going to send 24 players to that. More importantly, we're going to send two more players to the World Championships in Las Vegas at the end of the year. And then for the top 64, they get their share of $100,000 prize pool, which, you know, can't turn your nose up to that. But how are they going to do that? It? It's a two-day tournament, 15 rounds of modern, cut to top eight. Well... Day one, and that's the first goal today, is they need to get a six and three record. That means they've got three losses that they can have throughout the day, potentially, or you know how draws and points work, but they need to basically have six wins to advance back to tomorrow to ballot out with the rest of uh, the players in the room, the best players in Europe to try and get themselves a slot on that Pro Tour. But I believe we've got players sat down. I believe they're ready to go. Martin, who are we going to see and what decks they're playing? Uh, we have two, two of the most, uh, you know, important players here or two of the most cool players uh we picked obviously john emmanuel de, de pra the french world world champion super well deserved uh he is i believe on table two and we also have mario Luis garcia who basically single-handedly revived the rakdos grieve deck so we thought it would be cool to to feature that playing against james uh wheatman who is on coffers black which is a deck that won one of the uh big modern tournaments uh in europe last season and we're off to the races. She starts with one of the new retro boarded. Let's say, you know, she, she's upgraded a little bit here. She's uh, I like that. Got the yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm slowly doing the process at the minute. I love these old retro boards that just got uh, printed in the latest set. And following up with my number one pick for best uh, one drop in modern, a turn one a Ragavan. But now we're going to see Fortsies on the other side. And it's going to reveal a hand of Fortsies, Grief, Terminate, Shieldred, and a Takanara. What do yeah. you take here? <laughs> Oh, uh, so Coffers is typically great against these, like, super slow, greedy mana bases kind of decks. In this matchup, I think it's still... Uh, wait, I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to piece together exactly uh, what's going on. So Thoughtsy is from James. Yes, yeah, so the Ragavan is already on the table. Okay, Ragavan's already on, on, on the table. Uh, there's no scam card for Grief, right? So, yeah, I mean... Well, the Always good when your opponent's uh, fort seizing you, you know your Ragavan's going to connect. And we've got this yeah. stigma at the minute in modern where you just can't let that little monkey hit you. If you let it hit you, bad things are going to happen, as we see here. Top card, don't worry about it too much. It's a swamp. But more importantly, I get to ramp a little bit. I get to get a treasure. I can now follow up with something like a Blood Moon on one turn closer to getting the Shieldred down next turn. Which, for a full drop in modern, you've got to do a lot. And really, Shieldred, she does do a lot. Yeah, Marlo's with a, th with a Grief in hand that... She's choosing to keep, which makes sense because next turn she's going to be up to four mana. Uh, she also has a, has a Terminate, not a great card against Mono Black, which typically has a lot of discard, a lot of uh, removal spells of their own, and then maybe cards like Karn or I guess Shieldred is probably your best target in the matchup. Yeah, I'm looking. There's only 10 creatures in the main. That's four Bowmasters, three Shieldreds, and three Dolphy Voidwalkers. Ooh, there it is. And there's yep. Bowmaster coming down. One point of damage is going to go to that Ragavan. That's going to generate a Orc Mass token, which comes along. Now, this card has shown up in every format, and it is a powerhouse in every format it's shown up in. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, Ragavan's great, but have you heard of Bowmasters? Uh, <laughs> probably the, the, the best card in modern at the moment. It is keeping every, uh, Ragavan in check. And, uh, you know, if, you, if you've got access to play it, you've kind of, okay, you don't really care about Ragavan's story. If you're not, Ragavan's still going to be running away with game. But can I interest you in this card called Shieldred, which I imagine we're going to be seeing shortly. A big four drop coming down. But there are lots of answers in this deck. Things like Shieldred's Edict. You know, a bit, bit of flavor text for you there to get rid of Shieldred. Yeah, the, uh, mon the mono black deck is weird. Because if you, if you take Lord of the Rings out of the picture, then the deck is kind of like a bunch of mediocre cards. But now with the one ring and with Bowmasters, the deck gets to play two of the top five cards in the entire format. Uh, but the mana base is also quite awkward sometimes. If you it, 
if the deck doesn't work, it feels like you're playing limited. Uh, if it works, then you know it feels great. Also, if you play against these decks with all these all these duels and fetch lines and triumphs, uh, then Karn for for Sundering Titan is is typically what what wins you the matchup pretty easily. So it looks like the two draws that we didn't know about was uh, one was the fetch to go get the swamp, and then we're going to use the grief first, clear the path, make sure our shield will live. We get to get rid of Shudra's Edict, put that in the bin, and we see a hand of two Yagmoth's Will. I was still one of um, Yagmoth's Will. Hello. Yagmoth's Will. Yeah. Oh, that's, <laughs> not, that's not legal in this one. Too much cube for Will. Too much cube for Will. Uh, Yagmoth's Tomb, and uh, I missed the, 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 the last card there. I was too flustered on my cube explorations. But we're going to pass the turn back. How can we go um, move forward here? Maybe this is the time we need to deploy one of these Yagmoth's Tombs. Of course, turns everything into swamps, not only on your side, but also your opponent's. And I believe that the Lord of the Rings ones are very fancy. Love to see it. And here comes a Dolphy Boardwalker. Dolphy's going to come down. Of course, we can tap our uh, um, Field of Ruin here for black because of it. There it is on the screen for you. This one, when you've got some sort of um, undying effect, can be used greatly with uh, Fort Seizes. We've seen that in the Pro Tour oh, the yeah. finals. Where it's like, I'll take that. that I'll take Ulamog. your Ulamog. Yeah, thank, <laughs> thank you very much. It's, all, it's also great in the, in the Living End matchup. We probably shouldn't bring that up because, uh, well, Christian Kokano is in the room. He traveled all the way from America to play in this regional championships. So, um, you know, he managed to qualify. He's come back. He's had a lot of success in Europe at all to every level. In fact, he, he won a classic here. Then he won the, and then he qualified in the regional championships. And then he went onto the Pro Tour and came second in the finals. Yeah. Against that... None other than Jake Beardsley. What a story. Yeah, exactly. It's great. And he's back. Passing the turn back. What are we going to do? We got a we got, uh, draw four mana. Yeah, I think the longer the game goes, the more I would favor James. Because James's cards are, are more powerful in the late game. Cards like Karn, you know, his his uh, sideboard full of one-offs. Cards like Cityscape Leveler. Uh, yeah. Mario Lewis with kind of a slow draw. I mean, she had a pretty good draw. Started with Rogavon, you know, into a into a Grief. But uh, Bo Bowmasters took pretty good care of that. There's a Terminate for the Voidwalker. But she has to pass the turn back. Doesn't want to trade for the Bowmasters. Makes sense. Maybe you want to wait for another... Scampies. Interesting. I feel like I'm. I wouldn't. I'm not. I don't hate the trade. Like it's still. I've still got two cards for my one, right? Because the grief comes in, takes a card. Now you're using another two cards on the battlefield to get rid of it. I don't hate the attack there. Maybe she's looking, waiting for some sort of a undying effect mm. here. But there's the land drop we didn't know about. So now we've got four mana. How are we going to move forward here? Good morning, chat. If you're watching from wherever you are in the world, let us know. We are monitoring it. We will be seeing uh, you know, how you're doing this morning. If you're playing today, what deck would you bring? As a Khan, the great creator hits the battlefield. I've never seen Martin move so quickly to the uh, sideboard of all the different tools that you can go and, uh, <laughs> go and look up here. I'm just putting Twitch chat on, okay? Well, uh, what do I'm you basically want? Just, I'm basically just waiting for the moment when somebody tells us that you cannot use... Uh, Bloodstained Admire to tap for mana when there is Urborg in play. <laughs> <laughs> you wait, you wait. It's early. It's early for some people in the world. It's early for us here. Obviously, we are in Belgium, in Ghent. Lovely little city. Had a little walk around last night. We got options to go and find here. We've got Sip Escape Levers. We've got Cursed Tombs. We've got Ensnaring Bridges, uh, Liquid Coating, Sundering Tines, Ballista, uh, Charles of the Void, the Stone Ring, the One Ring. I yeah. Feel like Oh, we're going, I was thinking I would probably go for one ring there, but it does leave us open to something like a Grief uh, or a, a Fort Seas mm. follow-up. So we're just going to go with the Walking Blister here. It's going to go to hand. Yeah, I think the most exciting cards at, at the moment are certainly the one ring. That's how you get ahead. That's how you start go, you know, drawing a bunch of cards, uh, getting some card advantage. Uh, there's also Cityscape Leveler, but I think we're a little too far away from that still. A couple of coffers needs to be drawn for James to, to enable that. Grief. And yeah, there's also the one ring, but what you mentioned, I, I like keeping that in the in the sideboard for now and maybe grabbing that next turn uh, with the card to sort of protect it against uh, a discard spell. We got Grief was drawn for the turn. So I like the sequence here, get the attack in first. Yeah, now Mario Luz has to attack. She has to pressure the Karn, but James can easily just block. Uh, I think he's deciding whether he wants to just chump it or... Oh no, he has to, he has to double block anyway, because... It, 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 the thing is, yeah, it, yeah. The, it's going through his head now, right? Is if I block, what if she has an undying effect? How bad is this for me? I'm going to lose a card in my hand. Not got away with it. Happy with that double uh, with the double block there, getting it off, and the follow up is going to be another grief. Looking at that hand of our own Shieldred, Walking Blister, which you knew about from the Khan, and 
we've got the another well another Yagmos tomb. We don't really need a redundant copy of that. She decides to go with the shield dread. That's going to go to the bin. But now we get to untap with this Karnak for your loyalty. We can now go get something like the One Ring and that on the battlefield. It, we know yeah. how far that can run away with the game. The One Ring looks extremely appealing here. You're still going to have your Karn on one loyalty after the activation. You, you get to pick the One Ring. Uh, you get to start drawing cards. You get 660 life, so no risk of dying anytime soon. And once, once you start drawing more cards, uh, you're going to be able to, you know, really start pulling ahead. All right, question for you in chat. What is your favorite art of One Ring? Ooh, I, I like <laughs> this one. Oh, okay, okay. Like the the the, the full art. I like the orange in, in, in the art. It, it, it looks really, really, really neat. I, I feel like Posty's got us all, right? Like, he's, he's got, him a, he's mm. got, he's got the, the, the one one. That'd be pretty uh, gangster to turn up to an RC with that, or even the Pro Tour. Here comes the One Ring coming down. This is the, as you said, the one for the uh, the four-piece set where you got Frodo, Go, uh, Gollum, and Sam. All trying to get that ring in, in there. Yeah, the one that Posty has. His chat's going to, the Posty one. Yep, got you, got you. Current, that's going to go to the graveyard now because we can't obviously go face with it. because We now have protection. Shield is going to hit back. Okay. This is a good answer that's to a, good, a One yeah. Ring. That's a good card to have. On the battlefield against the One Ring, and Jane. again, that Bloodstained blood, uh, that Bloodstained Mire is being tapped because of Urborg. James did know about Shieldred, though. Remember, um, does have the Walking Ballista in hand still, but can't make it too big yet. We're really looking for something like a Coppers off the top that would be able to let us generate a large amount of mana. Yeah, and these mono black decks typically have a lot of re removal. Uh, sometimes they even play uh, some sweepers. James actually does have double damnation in, in his deck. Uh, there's Fatal Pushes, there's March of Wretched Sorrow, as you mentioned, Shielders Edict. I feel like we're doing this to either thin the deck or withdraw a Fatal Push. Like, it the, the, the doesn't make much sense mm. here, right, to yeah. do this. Everything's a swamp anyway. Uh, how many copies of four Fatal Pushes in the deck? Yeah, Field, field of Ruin and, and De Demolition Field uh, are not only in, in the deck to, you know, punish the greedy mana bases with all the duels and triumphs, but you can also use them to sort of enable revolt uh, for your fatal push. Oh, little uh, shuffling inconvenience here. Let's have a little look. Where are we going to go? What's the follow up play? Oh, yep, fatal push was the card that was drawn. Shield is going to go to the graveyard. Now we're kind of free to use this one ring whenever we need to. That was in the upkeep as well. Yeah, James really wants to protect his life total here because the the, the one ring is going to start uh, damaging him a little little bit. Um, I think he takes one from the ring, though. I think he should be at 15. Yeah, same. I think they might have uh, skipped over that a little bit. Two confusion. We'll get that passed down to the... Uh, is that a field of ring? The spotter. Yeah, it's, uh, it's the one of the... Alternate, I think it's the, there might be the Lord of Rings one or something mm. like that. Yeah, the Lord of Rings one. I think it was from a, a commander deck or something along those lines. Make, it makes our life real hard when you're mm. a commentator and you've got to learn not only all these different sets, but all the secret layers and all these like spicy one that people play. But we, we've got you, chat. We've got you. I like how you can, you know, tune your deck to your liking. Like James clearly using a lot of these Lord of the Rings cards, uh, including the, the really cool basic lens. Uh, Mario Luz, on the other hand, uh, you know, preferring the the old art of all the cards, the old frames on the on the new shock lands, uh, including the Apex lands. Yeah, I think I'm more I'm more I'm kind of a mix of both. I like it. Just all looks good. It, yeah. yeah, that's what wizards know how to get my money. If they, they, yeah. could, they could print a terrible set, but put really good basics in it. Yeah. I'm gonna buy the set. Yeah. It's, it's really annoying. All right, well, James takes three from the Grief, then two more from the... Yep, Life Total is now being updated with not only the Ring Trigger, yeah. but also the Grief Attack. And maybe we're just nickel and diamond here, because if we don't find another Ring to be able to reset that Ring, it is going to end this game quickly. But the good thing about it is you get to draw all these Yeah, you, you get to draw half of your deck in the meantime. Plus, cards like March of Red Sorrow are going to help buy James a little bit more time should he find one. Yeah, it's always a good side relief as well when you go tap my ring and they you know, they say sure there's no bow mass that comes down in response yeah, yeah, yeah. like oh, okay cool i've got a load of cards now what can we do still don't have a coffers the namesake card of this deck that may enables it to generate a large t amount of mana especially as now everything is a swamp so it would generate six mana from itself and slowly we're going to reach a point where if more Luz has removal in in her hand uh she would be able to start thinking about possibly killing grief her own grief in response to March of, of Red Sorrow to 
to not enable the, the life gain and, and maybe hope that James is going to die to his own ring if he doesn't find another copy or if he doesn't find uh, Karn the Great Creator to... Oh, wait, no. He, he already got one from the sideboard, so Karn mm -hmm. doesn't actually work as a way to reset the ring. No, no, no. He's already found that one. He's got, just got three copies floating around in that deck. And she does have a lot of reach. We've got another Shield Dread in the deck, two Lightning Bolts. We've got four Bowmasters and a Colligan's Command. So we've got a little bit of reach here. So if we do get that oh. life title quite low, we could end up finishing off with just, you know, pointing Ben spells to the face. Here we go. Untap. Big draw step. And I like, like, even though all of her lands are all... Oh, here we go. Oh, uh, okay. Well, yep. That's another ring. I mean, she's uh, been fetching, even though her lands are already... Uh, swamps purely just to, to kind of trying to thin the deck, so to speak. People talk about this, and you know, it mm. reduces maybe by like 0.2% of your, your top of your deck drawing. Ooh, look at that. That's a Takanuma that presumably brings back the Shieldred here. Yeah, it's got to be the best card, especially in the face of a ring. And I like bringing back the Shieldred instead of a Grief, if there is one in the graveyard, because Grief, at this point, yeah, my opponent has set, you know seven, eight, nine cards in hand. Like, is it really going to help me if I Grief one of them? You, well, you, still, uh, you can't do it this time. Yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to win here. So if the game goes long, uh, pretty good chance my opponent ends up winning if they get to use all their cards. So I'm just going to go for the Shieldred and hope that my opponent, you know, maybe somehow hasn't drawn a, a, a removal spell. And maybe my my shield is going to be able to win me the game, so pl playing for the win rather rather than playing not to lose, but uh, but eventually lo losing in five turns anyway. This is an open decklist tournament, remember? So you know you'll be able to find the deck lists online for everybody at home, but also the players get to know exactly what their opponent has brought in their seventy-five or ninety-five, depending. Um, you know they can go bigger; they don't always have to play. You know, Yorian's not allowed anymore, but. Or mean that they can't go up to 80 if they don't want to. Or 76. Is or 76, yeah. yeah Seen yeah, a few yeah. of them. What's the... Is it Battle of Wits, which is like 300? Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> like two, 250 or something. But Frank recently wrote an article for the Metagame Mentor, and his aggregate list of, pri of Primeval Titan amulet deck was 61 cards. <laughs> yeah, that, would, that would drive uh, our good friend Matei crazy. He hates a 61 card deck. Yeah, I mean, I guess it, like to, to some degree it, it, it makes sense. You have a lot of silver bullets that you don't want to draw and you still want to have them in the deck. But it, 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 is, it is interesting to me that 61 is the aggregate list. Would you count Baseju as a land or a spell in that deck? Yeah, Baseju is just... I, I keep talking about how Baseju is just super busted. Another Fatal Push Ooh, enabled by... Wow, look at that. But there's a scam card. Yeah, we're now... Not that after all. Uh, we, we, we see Evoke in this uh, booth. Evoke is an Evoke card now. That's how we have to say it. It's a oh, okay, dying okay, card. Okay. But either way, either way, at the end of the day, that Shield Red does come back, and it gets the plus one, plus one as well, so it's even more of a beat stick than it originally was. That is not what James wanted to see, especially while he's got a ring on the battlefield and life at seven. And now he's tapped down a little bit as well. So only got three mana this turn, potentially four if he managed to play a land. Coffers would be the ideal land of choice right now. Let's have a little look. Oh. Yeah, if this deck doesn't have coffers and Urborg, then the mana base can be really it, awkward. That's what I found when I was playing this deck. Like I always found like it was uh, always going to be an issue when I didn't have the perfect mana, and because mm. you've got so many like field of ruin effects, and then you got coffers, which doesn't even tap for mana in yeah. the early turn, and it, it is pretty rough. Your opening draw is double sign in blood, double field of ruin. <laughs> All right, well, another ring replacing. The old one, so at least James is not dying this turn. This turn. That gives us protection. So essentially a time walk for James here to not take damage yeah, from we, the creatures. We are, we're just trying to adjust the, uh, the lighting a little bit at the minute, chat. You can see it's gone a little bit dark there. We're going to try and get that uh, adjusted so it gets a bit lighter for, for you all. It's also dark for us. I promise you no one's turned the lights off in this lovely uh, hall that we're currently in. Where Remember, if you just tune in, we've got basically nine... 148 players all turned up this weekend for the regional championships to battle it out. Try and get them slot themselves a slot on the Pro Tour. Here comes the Fable the Mirror Breaker. Now we spoke, like, I feel like all I've done in commentary of the last year is talk about this card and how good it is. Like, it comes yeah. in, it brings the Goblin Shaman token, which, did you see the, the nice meme going around on Twitter saying that the token for this is worth more than a time of growth now? Oh, oh yeah, I did see that. I did see that, and as someone who was trying to get rid of my my uh, yeah, realizing that they're ten dollars now, that, uh, it's pretty yeah. upsetting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's no. say they they lost their their collector uh, value.
I did see someone uh, the other night when I was watching a stream playing it in Yagmoth, and I thought that would be pretty interesting. I don't know if it's uh, going to turn mm. into a staple in that deck or not. But uh, So my hope is for something like a Pioneer Masters, and hey, Tarmogoyf is back in, in, in you know, at least Pioneer. <laughs> maybe we're going to get you excited about playing it in the format. and Maybe we can get these cards like Snapcaster and Liliana and, you know, all these cards, like Dark Confidant. Uh, that would be cool again in some format where they would matter. I'd like to see Bob. They just did they just uh, reprint Wait, Bob as well. Bob, yeah, maybe Bob is actually standard legal. Yeah, that card is just yeah. Do you remember how that used to be the best creature in mm -hmm. in, in Magic? <laughs> okay, well we're showing our age right now. As Walker Blister comes down for free, that's three cameras on it. Wow, but th that's James just breaking. So let me fix. So we're gonna take. Hun, oh no! So we can block the shield dread. We yep. can shoot down the grief. We take two. We take two in our upkeep. But then we can never get rid of the shield drag because it's got the uh, the wicked roll ca counter on it. Yeah, unless Ma we gain life. Mario Lewis is looking for a removal here. The second chapter from Fable lets her discard. I think that's a thought season a land for two new for two new cards. And if she finds a removal spell here, then yeah, James J James bricked a lot. No March of of Red Sorrow. Uh, no Cable Coffers. Yeah, we got. Basically, she's got two lightning bolts, two fatal pushes, one Colligan's command, one Martin collapse, but that's in the graveyard now. That's the her ways to getting that off the battlefield. Oh, I suppose the second terminate as well, actually. But so we're gonna go through the motions here: block, shoot, block, shoot, get the grief go into the graveyard, one to your face, because why not? Might as well. I'm gonna drop. James is gonna go down to free life here. Yeah, now James is in a weird spot. Like he would like to use the ring. To draw some more cards, but can you really do that if you're a three life? Also, I guess he would just die to shield red now. Three mana. Uh, take two. He took two from the from the goblin, so he can't he can't actually activate the ring. Well, no, because the the shield red's gonna do two now in the in the upkeep. So I think the life titles need to be updated. I think we're at three life. Yeah, yeah, we're now three, gonna yeah, go down yeah. to one life, which means bowmaster is now lethal draws. Wow! Uh, yeah, just scooping it up. Yeah, so that 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 came down to Mario Luz playing for the win and, and getting back the shield dread with the Takenuma instead of going for the grief and maybe, you know, trying to take one more card away from your hand and, and you know, slow you down a little bit. But, but that would eventually just lead to her losing anyways in, in a couple of turns because of the ring. So she went for the sh shield dread hoping that James would break. Sometimes that that's all you got to do. You know, if all you can beat is a couple of lands in your in your opponent's hand and maybe they draw two more lands, sometimes that's that that's what you want to what you want to do, and that's what you want to play for, and that's exactly what what happened. All right, we'll see if we can get the sideboards up on the uh, screen for you all at home, because this is an open deckless tournament member, so we can have a little look at what's going on. So starting over on the coffers side, this is the full 75 registered. Obviously, it is a Khan deck, so we don't really sideboard too much, but we do have a couple of extra options in here. Talk me through this. Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty typical uh, mono-black coffers deck. This one doesn't have the two-mana draw spells, though. I see no... Sign, Sign in, in blood and no knights whispers. I do see the two profane tutors still though. That that card is surprising to me uh, that it still finds its way into you know some of these builds. In yeah. the in the sideboard, yeah, as you mentioned, a lot of one offs for Karn, but also double chalice, triple duress. So you still have a little you know a little bit uh, to bring in. You know, for example, an extra chalice to bring in for the cascade decks, duress against you know some kind of combo. What would you bring in in this control? matchup, if anything? Uh, so. Duress is not really a card that I think would be too good in the matchup. Like it, it, it's okay, but since you already have Thoughtseize, I don't think you need additional, uh, additional discard. discard. Uh, Duress not being able to take Grief or Shield Dread, I think, is too much of a liability. Uh, Chalice is not a card I want to bring in. So it, it it depends if basically one of the one-offs, you know, is maybe good in the matchup. Maybe you want to bring in uh, the Filigree Silex or something, but I, I don't think that would be too good. Uh, okay. So I think you're going to mo mostly just leave everything in the sideboard. I don't mind uh, the Dolphy here, right? It turns off the Undying effects. Oh, yeah, there's one. Like, like, yeah, it's just a random I, I one that. Dolphy yeah, yeah, in the side. I did miss that. I missed the one. Let's have a look at the other deck and see if we can see what uh, she's brought this weekend. So now we've got a few more options here of things we're bringing in. What do you like out of this? So you can board out some of the removal, right? Because the opponent has... Uh, Shield Red, so yeah, I still want to keep something in, but maybe not as much. Maybe Lightning Bolt doesn't make as much sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, since you know, killing bull masters isn't isn't all that relevant. Um, maybe to ha ha having uh, double push, double terminate is maybe you know one 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 card too many. 
Uh, now it depends, you know, how Blood Moon interacts with uh, Yavmoth. So I would probably be uh, thinking about that, maybe asking a judge exactly how the Lay layers is. work with Lay Magus, yeah, with Magus <laughs> of the Moon and, and, and Blood Moon. Uh, other than that, Chalice and Explosives, that's for different matchups. Leyline as well, Curse Totem. Also for car for decks like Yavmod or uh, Scale. So may maybe bring in like that one Cola Guns command as a as a value card. How about a Bone Crusher Giant? Yeah, I think shoot I myself. Ring protection now gone. Yeah, for the win. yeah, yeah. I think Bone Crusher is perfectly reasonable. It's also like a creature for like the the mid game. Like your three mana slot is is basically just the fable. So having an extra three drop could be okay. And as you mentioned, it, it goes around the the ring protection because it says that damage can't be prevented this turn. Uh so that that kind of goes around the, the protection clause from the ring. Cool. Right. Let's see how the players are getting on down on the feature match. See if they they've shuffled up and ready to set off into this game number two. So I'll remind everybody, if you just tune in, welcome. Where have you been? We're just kicking off, so you haven't really missed much. Just get one match. We are at the European Championships, the regionals. This is where we're going to be sending 24 players to the Pro Tour and two more to Worlds, but that is going to be tomorrow. Today, the first goal is getting a X and free record or better, and then we get invited back to today tomorrow where you can battle out for their share of $100 thousand dollars cash prize as well as those pro tour world slots that we spoke about we have 948 players battling out in 15 rounds of modern all weekend open deck list cannot wait this is my favorite format by far to cover to watch i actually qualified to play in this one today but i decided to, you know i wanted to be in the booth for it i enjoyed the booth a little bit more plus let's be honest I'm not going to do too well in 948 players <laughs> I, don't think I, don't, I don't think i'm going to do too well in that one I'll get Tron too many times and tilt and fire in the corner or something. Round one, mono red burn. <laughs> <laughs> get burned. Lose the die roll. Round two, Tron. Mm. Turn three, Tron. Yeah. Scoop. Go home. Easy. Okay, starting off, just a swamp on the side for James. How are we going to start in? This is the scary bit. Like, do they have the explosive uh, evoke draw that we potentially going to see? It looks like Whoa. we do. Grief ditch and grief. Okay. What would you like for my hand? We see Double Khan, Fatal Push, Shieldrix Edict, Dolphy, Voidwalker, and the second Swamp. Wow, so only a second land, but Double Khan. So James needs to draw a bunch of lands from the top of his deck, and there is two removal spells and a two-drop creature. So, yeah, it depends on what Marcia, uh, what uh, Marilus want, wants to wants to play for. Like, does he want to play for the long game? Maybe still take the card. Maybe does he want to ho hope that James doesn't draw lands, leave the cards in his hand, uh, take one of the removal spells? Maybe it just it kind of depends on the texture of her own hand. Also, I suppose if she does have the uh, undying effect as well, because mm. you know, you, are we taking one card here or two cards? How are we going to roll? If she does actually have the undying uh, cards in hand. I do see one of them. Do you see a not dead after all, which of course is a. Uh, wow. There we go. I'm going to take these two removal spells. We're going aggressive, ladies and gentlemen. We're going aggressive. Okay. Love to see it. I like that. Because Dolphy can't block anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Yeah, exactly. You have a shadow creature that can block, and then you have two four drops uh, that also don't really block. So that, that's a pretty slow card. So, yeah, Marlos decides to go aggro. And this is the awkward thing about, like, the when you're playing against these grief kind of, you know, undying effects. It's also four mana, so it's really hard to get off. The fatal push doesn't turn off. Yeah. Shocking this in. We know that there is a Ragavan in hand as well. I imagine that's the one we're about to see, and that is going to be dashed wow. in. This is just the one-two punch in this deck, which makes it so powerful. Go over the top of so many decks. I don't think there's many decks, if any, in the format that can deal with this amount of pressure. This is crazy. And she gets a treasure as well. So next turn, if she has a land, she's up to four mana. So she would be able to play a shield dread, maybe another grief. Imagine a fort sees here. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That, turn two is like... Thank you very a much. Triple fort sees, due plus got power on the battlefield, hitting you. Yeah, it's crazy. That's brutal. Yeah, this, this is the power of this Rakdos deck. Uh, it just gets to play so many good cards. Not only do you have the grief and the undying effects, you also have uh, Ragavan, one of the best cards in the format. You have Thoughtseize, one of the best cards in the format. You have access to really good sideboard cards, Leyline of the Void, Blood Moon. You know, those are cards that can completely turn off certain uh, certain strategies. So this is why the Ragdos deck is so good. She did have options to Thoughtseize there as well. She does have a Thoughtseize in hand, so I, I imagine she's got a more powerful four drop or potentially even a free drop mm. without the extra land in hand. Probably masterfully, but you know, that's uh, what we saw. We saw a takedown, one of the uh, LECs. Here in the, from Legacy that put in. That's how she qualified for this tournament. Yeah, she won the she won the last one in Barcelona like a month ago, 
uh, over 500 players. First one after the banning of Fury and of the Beanstalk. Which kind of has changed the format a little bit, but like this deck mm. was that powerful. It, it's still really good without even green. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It just, you don't get that turn one, four, four double striker to really close down uh, the games against, which are really good against Tron and, you know, the, kind of the slower decks in the format. Yeah, it also turns out if you still have Bowmasters in the deck, maybe you don't you don't rely on Fury as much. Don't get me wrong, uh, being a Yagmoth player, an Infect player, basically a creature deck player, I'm really happy that Fury yeah. is not in the format anymore. But it's still it's still a struggle oh, against yeah. Renan Six, uh, Bowmasters, Fire Eyes, all, all these cards. We're gonna see a Colligan's Command main deck that is going to go get two damage Darby Boardwalker and you discard a card. Interesting. We're gonna discard this Khan. Yeah, Especially when James is missing land, by yeah. the way. James stuck on the on the two lands that he had in his opening draw. And then before it sees, yeah, we're just we're just turning everything off. We've got the pressure on the battlefield now. Two mana, is this the edict? The oh, uh, edict oh, wow. ripped okay. off the top. That's gonna deal with the grief before combat as well. So only one so damage coming across from the wicked roll. James has Karn and one new card. I guess we're gonna be able to see what it is. And a and a void walker. Yeah, I think here I like taking the Karn. Uh, because the Voidwalker, it, well, I guess it depends on, on Marlu's hand, but if she has a removal spell, the Voidwalker isn't, isn't all that threatening, and the Karn can, you know, end up uh, getting James back into the game, but it, it, it obviously depends on the hand. Well, he's got a rip land land, and that's the first one, Field of Ruin off the top. We know about Ragavan, though, so there's definitely one unknown and Ragavan in hand, and James, knowing that we know have, there isn't an answer for it, this Ragavan will be able to connect if she decides to dash it. She could get a little bit spicy and just try and hard cast it and dodge a removal for a turn. Let's have a little... Like, Finn just going back and forth about life totals. Yeah, I think James just played the Field of Ruin and is considering using it right away on the Blood Crypt. Well, it's open deck list, and let me tell you, there is a no basic mountain in this deck. Oh, wow, yeah, so good, good heads up play by James there. Uh, took his time looking at the deck list in the in the three minute period where you can study your opponent's list, and now it paid off, and he's able to take Mario Luce off of red off of a red source. So red, obviously, in this deck used for things like Colligan's Command, Magus the Moon, Modern Collapse, Lightning Bolt, Ragavan, and Fable the Mirror Breaker. So yeah, if any of these are going to be stuck in our hand, if we don't have another red source, also our Blackleaf Cliffs are going to be coming into play tap now because it's going to be our fourth land drop. Maybe this is what we need from James to survive. Draw step is a wow, red wow. source. Another Don't blood crib. There we go. Easy. Easy gamer. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to come into play. Do two points of damage. Of course, it is the new retro boarded ones. I am a fan of these. Ragavan's going to connect. Going to hit another it's land drop. Kind of happy that James doesn't have that now. Generates a treasure token. By the way, I don't know. Have we spoke about these play match yet? that we've got on the table. Yeah, they're really I, cool. I really yeah, like yeah, these yeah, play yeah, mats yeah. on the table. How do we get them? It says Gen. It means it can't be used after this weekend. Surely we can maybe I think snirkle you, these away. Yeah, I think you can get them at the prize wall normally. There's also a special deck box made by Ultimate Guard and uh, Legacy like European Tour that has like a special logo engraved on the box. So if you want to pick one of those up, uh, one of those up, it's, uh, it's on the prize wall here or at all these events rather. Well, we say there's 948 players playing today, but there's loads more than that in the room. We've got side events going on all throughout the day, plus we've got the Classic tomorrow. Yeah, even the LCQ had like 350 players. But we, we, we were literally walking in this morning, didn't we? And there was just an army yeah. of players, and we're like, geez, this feels like a GP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back in the day for, you know, any of you boomers out there watching in chat, remember what GPs are? This is what it's feeling like right now. Good times, good times. So the Colligan's Command was going to have a Dolphy Voidwalker um, counter on it because it was obviously the way that the things stack and get resolved. So you can see that at the top of your screen. That's why there's a dice on it. Dolphy Voidwalker is the follow-up play. That's going to put a little bit more pressure on the battlefield. Also, be scared if we do draw something like another Grief or Fort Seas, but that's the fourth land drop for James. Now he's got to decide. Do I play, I'm gonna, do I play my Khan and I get a one shot at getting something from my sideboard or I tick it up and there, but then... Ragavan can also connect with it, and then I've, it's basically useless. I think we've got to try and one-shot mm. it, but then what do we one-shot it for? And my guess is, I, I say the ring, but maybe there's a bridge, and Stone Bridge is going to be pretty good here. Yeah. Especially you, as the Colgan command has been used. You can get the, you can get in Staring Bridge, you can get the one ring, you can also get Walking Ballista. Uh, that would be pretty reasonable, but I think I think the bridge here probably makes the most sense. As you, as you mentioned, there's not a lot of ways for the Grieve deck 
to get rid of an artifact no, and the Kulligan's command has already been played, so... There's one extra in the sideboard, so if that came in, that means there's one more answer in the deck. If it didn't, I mean, she just left the one in, there is no way of getting this off the battlefield. It does have to sacrifice our Khan, though, because we can't deploy it this turn. Mm -hmm. We are very low on resources, but I do feel like that is the card that can get us back into this game, if at all. At 11 life means we're not in, you know, we're not scared of too much damage going to the face with a couple of lightning bolts, but realistically, this isn't the match for them. I wouldn't be surprised if they actually got uh, taken out of the deck. So, do we go for the bridge? I think that's what we got. I think we got bridge and ring pulled to the front here. Are we just going to hope the top of the deck doesn't? We're going to go for ring. Okay. Valuing cards over life total. Yep, that, it does not go into play, unfortunately. Okay. I th I thought the bridge looked wow. Oh, well, it doesn't no. matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter anymore. And I'll get your ring as well. <laughs> oh my word! You can play the ring. Oh my Imagine god! The last it was an undying effect in hand. Now it's like, yeah, I'll have your ring. I'd, I'd actually play the ring. I think ring's probably more important over Dalfi. But they're saying that she is at eight life, so maybe. Yeah, not. yeah. You also pretty much almost have a tutoring clog here. So, oh, like, well, never mind. You have to kill the card. Yeah, so yeah. Free yeah. Khan. Free Khan to the face. There's a coffers off the top. James would like that, but also wouldn't like that right now. It's good in his deck, but right now he needs answers. Something in the shape of maybe March of the Wretched Sorrow would be pretty good here. We've got some fatal pushes. Even Orcus Bowmasters could start dealing with a little bits on this battlefield. Draw step. Yeah, James needs another ring, maybe another Karn, and then try to get the the ensnaring bridge. Is it a fatal push? Well, we'll take you off a little bit of red mana. <laughs> I now I'm going to shuffle, but there's no more basic. Yeah, and now with the treasure, though, Mario Lewis can just keep playing, keep, keep dashing to Raghavan. If it keeps connecting, she's gonna, so she, she's always going to have the uh, the extra treasure from it. So not a huge deal just yet, but still good for James to do that. The thing is, I don't understand why we're doing this now. Because, like, Fatal Push works no matter what. We don't need to trigger a vault. I'm sure there's a line, and I'm sure we're about to see it. Um, yep, yeah, we're just talking about shuffling options. Have you seen these sleeves, by the way? I love these sleeves. They got all the little, all the mana symbols from yeah, like, the last 30 years of magic. They look cool. Two treasure tokens plus swamp. And, all right. Wow, okay, there it is. There's a fatal push. We didn't really need to do it in that sequence, but it thins the deck a little bit, I guess, plus turns off a little bit of red mana. But here comes the dash Ragavan. What can we hit off the top? Looking for a one ring. Uh, wait. Oh, that's a march. Okay, that's the alternate march. I think. I hope. It looks like the march to me. Wait, wait. Don't we need to use one of the treasures to dash it? Yeah, yeah. She does, but she generates a second treasure because uh, she connected. She she has two treasure tokens. Oh, there uses were, one th of them. there were two before. Okay, yeah, never yeah. mind. Never mind. That dice does not w line up well on that treasure token. Oh, it it it, it has a second dot. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So now she's going to go use one to in this. No, she's going oh, to use the Penuma. Okay. Mills over three and gets back. Guess Dalfi. So what does she has? Yeah, what does she have access to? It's a Void Walker and was there a Shield Dread? I don't think there was a no, Shield Dread. No, I think she. I think it's just Dalfi. Yeah, I mean, looks looks reasonable to me. Like another attacker is is you know all I want. Ideally, I, I would like to be able to play it right away, but. Uh, this works too. All right, so now James has a has a one or two draw steps to try to get back into the game. This needs to be a car and it needs to be a ring. Dalfi, it's yeah. something. It's just not something. I guess it blocks <laughs> the other Void Walker. Well, not when you draw a Terminator off the top. So now we're going to use our last treasure token. This is going to dash the Ragavan. That's going to connect. Drop in James down to five. Top card treasure token made. Man, Ragavan is so good. This this card is <laughs> four C's, not great here. Yeah, yeah. Is is that your Hall of Fame expert opinion? I, that Ragavan is a well, good Well, I I recently started playing a little bit of Historic Brawl on Arena, and you can have a commander there, and you can. When I was you know researching the format, I'm like, wait, I can have Ragavan in my hand basically every <laughs> game for turn one. This is insane. How can anyone play anything else other than that? So that we got dueling Void Walkers. Ragavan in hand, one unknown. Okay, this is a uh, tomb of Yagmoth's will. No, why are you saying Yagmoth's will? <laughs> I literally, I had to stop playing cube, ladies and gentlemen. I play too much cube. 
forcing storm every time. <laughs> yep. The thing is, I think I'm big brain enough to play it, and I'm really not. Like every time it goes really bad for me. Oh. Here comes a um, fable off the top, so that's good. We still got red mana, I believe, at the top of your yeah, screen. Yeah, from there. the treasure. Yeah, the treasure. But we're gonna use it for this um, ragavan. Why not? It's a free attack at this point, basically. It's gonna hit another one off the top. Don't need that. Follow up, play another two two that makes uh, more treasure tokens. Seems good to me. Yeah, now Marlos has a has a has an interesting option. Do you play the fable here and overextend into a possible damnation? Because that would be a card that James could draw. But if you don't, they, what if James draws? You know, March of Red Sorrow, kill one of your creatures, gain four life. So now you just basically have have to count the outs and decide which one of the which one of the places is better against what your opponent has in the deck. Draw a card, look into the graveyard. What what can that what can that that be? I think they're just saying, what can I draw? What unless it's no, they don't even have it could, it could be a Takanama, but that's gonna use okay. a lot of mana up, yeah. which is not gonna be something that we want. Remember the um the Dalfies are now gonna be turned on. So we can use it's still going to be that have that Colligan's command at the top, which we can use this turn if we need to. James needs Maybe he's looking a at the shield dread of his own. Or maybe he can, he, that's what he's thinking. He goes, Colligan's command returns a shield dread from the graveyard. If I think that's what they're looking for, seeing if there mm. is one in the graveyard. Because that would also deal with the Dalphi on the other side, or even the Ragavan. We could go block, tap, sack, shoot the Ragavan, and then return a Dalphi? No, the Dalphi will get dis, uh, under the other Dalphi. Jeez, there's so many layers in this game that we call Magic the Gathering, ladies and gentlemen. And. Oh, wow. We. No, that, that Dalphi gets put underneath the other Dalphi. I'm just going to get that tidied up down there. Not it's going to make too much difference, but it might. I'd like to keep it a clean state. Okay, so now Marlowe's gets to play the. Just, we discarded the Void Walker. Yeah. Okay. So this is now a lethal attacker. James on three needs to draw a removal spell or something. Wow. Card, card but no third enough. land for the bridge. But I'm just saying, if there's anything for one we could have got there, there is absolutely nothing. So no, she manages to take it down. Yeah. Well, well played by Marlou's and a little unlucky for James that he he bricked so many draws in the in the first in the first game where he just needed to find a couple of coffers, which was presumably. Uh, good enough, or a removal spell for the shield dread. So, yeah, good match. That's kind of the problem I've always had with this deck, is when it goes up and does its its game plan, it's it's like, oh my word, how does this deck ever lose? But when it dawdles, its mana base is really bad, yeah. it doesn't draw it, it get its card engines going, as in the one ring, generating and then able to draw lands, sweeping up the board with things like Damnation going on, but if you know, sometimes you don't get there, unfortunately, Starting off on an own one, but that is not going to be all doom and gloom. Mm. We do have a backup feature match for you all. So it looks like we've got Yagmoth versus Rhinos. I would have bet that this one would have been over a long time ago. This is a bad matchup for uh, Yagmoth traditionally, but it is in the hands of, of course, our world champion, John Emmanuel Dupra. Yeah, very well deserving world, world champion. John Emmanuel's always in the in the top 16 of pretty much every Everything. every event he plays in. Uh, he practices a lot and, you know, turns that into into a lot of experience and a lot of precise gameplay. So very happy for him uh, to have won after, I think, coming second in one of the previous years. Puts a lot of reps into it. So it looks like we're in game number three. So there is a Agatha Soul Cauldron with, I believe, is, is that a Halfling? Yeah, Delight Halfling underneath it. I love Soul Cauldron, by the way. That card... Is basically mean any deck that this card can be in, I play. So I'm playing it in Yagmoth, <laughs> I play it in Scales, I play it in uh, Heliod now. But here comes Rhino's doing this powerful draw here. It is going to go Cascading, potentially try and put a Crashing Boothills on the stack. But we're going to call for two, and that can only mean one thing. We're going to get a Jailer and put that into play in response, which means these Rhinos will not enter the battlefield. Super heads up play there, and that's why we play the deck. There is, there's Jailer on the battlefield. We're going to see if we can get that up on the screen for you so everybody can have a little look-see. And I was about to say, you know, with that much untapped on that turn, this could only really mean one thing to me. It's kind of, I'm getting mm. signals out. There's a call of calling, and it's going to be finding this Jailer. So, yeah, feel free to cascade. <laughs> Go crazy.
Yeah, I'm not going to cast it. You don't have to cast a card, I don't think. No, no, no. no. When you cast it, yeah, you choose. Behind the scenes question, what table is this? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to find the deck list here. In fact, I can just... Uh, 96, I think. Thank uh, you very much. Maybe 93. I'll tell you again. Why? They're basically working out that there is not going to be eight power hit in the battlefield this turn. That has got to be a big W for Jean Manuel this turn. Big tempo swing there. And that's kind of what you need when you're on these Yagmoth decks. It is real hard to try and fight through these. Mm. If uh, if they manage to get four fours on the battlefield, which don't line up great to you, they have trampling, so your little creatures that you can make with things like Grists don't line up well against it. It's really hard to get it off the battlefield. But uh, yeah, plus the opponent has cards like Fire and Ice to deal with yeah. the with the Death Dash tokens, for example. Yeah. And here comes the uh, Flame of Alor, Lord of the Rings card printed, and we do have a Wizard. Mutable. Wow, yeah. We generated the Mana uh, Muta Vault. Remember, it is every creature type. So we're going to go destroying this cauldron. And putting five damage on to the Soul Jailer. We can't boost it up, unfortunately, to get it out of five toughness. So we're just going to probably put an extra counter on, I don't know, I'm guessing the Dryad Arbor, because we can. Players just having a little talk about this. This is one thing that, you know, we, we, you'll see a lot is the players talking and judges kind of getting involved a bit because, of course, we are in Europe. Everyone speaks a there's a different language. There's a lot of different languages in Europe if you're, if you're not from here. Yeah. You know, me, myself, I can really only speak English, and it's kind of a curse at times. And uh, But some people are multilingual. We're talking... Maybe they're trying to sort out life totals here. They're trying to work out what each player should be. And what's Frank's in the chat, of course. Keep us all up to date on all the latest. Oh, I uh, think what I think what uh, happened is the yeah. Jean Emmanuel played a Blooming Marsh, but had a Dried Arbor as his third land in play already. But that was kind of hidden in the in the in the creature zone, so the Blooming Marsh should have been tapped. Yeah, Blooming Marsh, of course, only is untapped if there are two or uh, three or less lands in play. At that point, it enters, it would be the fourth land, so it would come into play tapped, which means the cord could not have happened that turn. Wow. So, yeah, this is Dried Arbor doing Dried Arbor things again. When, speaking of Dried Arbor, Gabriel Nassif is in the room today, <laughs> <laughs> battling it out amongst everybody. So um, This is really awkward, though, because how do you fix that? Do you just go back to the point where the marsh comes into play tap but then you can't find the jailer which well, means yes, that the, well the jailers that means the cards have got to go back in the randomizer we're gonna we get uh, yeah the judges down there going through it for us all here so why we they we kind of let them sort it out let's see if we can get the uh the prizes on the screen let's see what we can talk about what is everybody playing for this weekend while we sort out this judge call because you know we don't need to see that we'll get the conclusion of it for you all but we've got 948 players turned up this weekend to ballot out for their share of these prizes that you see on your screen. $100,000 on the line for our top 64 players. Go a little bit up there, you start getting re-invites to Naples, which is, of course, going to be the next RC here in Europe. And then we start moving in to the slots. Top 24 get themselves a slot at the Pro Tour. That is going to be PT Amsterdam. Happening in Europe in June, I want to say. Is it June, Amsterdam? Uh, I believe so, yeah. I think it's June, which, yeah, you know, I'm pretty sure you'll see us there, and plus everybody in this room, because nobody wants to miss out on that. Those Magicons are great. No matter what format you're into, it is just an absolute amazing weekend through and throughout. But then at the top of your screen there, first and second, get themselves invites to the World Championships in Las Vegas at the end of the year. So much in that sentence is great. You get to go to Las Vegas, you get the World Championships, and you qualify at the start of the year. So you don't have to worry about the grind for the rest of the year. It's kind of, you're on easy street. You're gonna, it's, you don't have to worry about it. Oh yeah, I'm already going to Worlds. It's January, doesn't matter. I'm going to Worlds already. And you know, two people this weekend are gonna be able to say that. Have those bragging rights for the rest of the year. It's gonna be pretty sick. Okay, we're gonna move back down to the match. Oh no, we're not. We're gonna look at our beautiful faces. But it looks like they're sorted. So let's go down to the match. You can get a nice little glimpse of this, uh, you know, this, this nose warmer that I've got currently sat on my face. So it looks like they are they're trying to rewind, is what I'm getting told from our table spotter. I'm not entirely sure how that's going to work, but yeah, this this usually takes a little, little little bit of time because you need to, you know, properly explain to the judges what is happening, mm -hmm. what exactly happened. They have to assess the situation. Okay, you know, how much time has passed since the since the infraction? Then maybe do we back up? Is it too late to do that? 
uh, maybe they have to ask the head judge. So yeah, this usually takes takes a while to to fix, but that's always what you should do if you figure out it's you know something happened during the game that shouldn't have happened. Always call a judge, or if you're not sure, you know what a card does. You know, people use a lot of uh, foreign cards, not just English ones. So if you are not sure, just you know raise your hand, call a judge. They're here to here to help you, and uh, it's 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 nothing against your opponent. You're just calling the judge to to do their what job. We'll, what we'll do is we'll come back to the booth and we'll just talk a little bit, and when that's ready, we'll uh, ask our producers to take us back down when they start playing again. And we get the answer. So we'll come back to the booth. We'll have a little. You can see uh, our beautiful faces who it turned up. Obviously, Will Hall, Martin User. Martin, you played in a lot of tournaments in your life. Yes. I, I, I feel that's a factual thing I, I can say. I think I spent around 350 or 400 weekends uh, playing Magic at tournaments away from home, not counting like local tournaments. This is just you know, going away from the Czech Republic <laughs> to a different country, which is a lot. If you add that up, that that's a couple of years of, of my life. That, so, you know, you're a good person for me to ask this question to. How do you prepare for a tournament like this? You're turning up, you know it's modern, you know that there's going to be a large number of it, actually the largest in Europe, over 900 players. How do you prep for this? Uh, it depends on the format. So for modern, and we keep saying that, for modern is a format that really rewards, uh, you know, having a lot of expertise with one deck experience, you know, practicing one deck over and over, making sure that you know every matchup, you know how to sideboard, you know how to approach, you know, different types of, of matchups. So for Modern, uh, the way I, I would uh, practice for this is I would just try to pick my deck at least a week before the event, you know, rather than that, more more, more than a week. Uh, and then I would just play a lot, you know, play a lot of leagues on, on Modo, play with my friends. Uh, also, if you play a lot online, make sure that you actually practice in person because of all the triggers, you know, Moto does that for you, Arena does that for you. So make sure you yeah. play a, a couple of games, you know, in person with, with your friends uh, to try to get used to all the triggers. Uh, and yeah, I would just I would just pick a deck early and then and then play a lot with it and you know make sure that I learn all, all the matchups. I have a good sideboard, good sideboard plans, and, and everything like well, that. Say, moving on to sideboard is this is an open deckless tournament. How can I use that to my advantage going into this, as opposed to a closed deckless tournament? How can I kind of utilize the open deckless to my advantage? It, I mean, gives you perfect information, right? So the more experience you have, the the more you played against all these cards, the may the more you played post board against all these decks, the more you should be able to figure out exactly how to tune your deck against what they have. In in a world of closed deck lists, that's different because yeah, what if my opponent has this? What if my opponent ha has that? Also, d this comes into 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 play when I'm choosing my deck because mm -hmm. let's say I'm playing a combo deck. Let's say I'm playing Dredge, for example. If it's closed deck lists. Then for every game two and every game three, I have to bring in cards like Abrupt Decay or you know something to deal with my opponent's boomer, mana crypt <laughs> or you know Relic of Progenitus or maybe they have Ley Line. So how do I play around that? And you know I have to bring in all these cards, you know just in case they maybe have that with closed deck list. That that changes everything. Maybe That's I know that you know they don't have any. With uh, Gavin Asif did that at the Pro Tour when he in his testing for the Pro Tour he picks uh, Living End. And he said, well, I, I know what my opponent's going to be yeah. bringing in. I know, I don't need to guess if I need to bring in my endurances or my subtleties or my, you know, art, uh, artifact destruction or my enchantment destruction. I know exactly what the hate is towards yeah. me so I can sideboard correctly for it. And that deck is super powerful. Be interested to see what the uh, the meta is going to look like. We're trying to work on getting the meta game breakdown for you all so we can get not only tweeted out on all the socials, so if you're not following Legacy on, on the social medias, you need to go do that right now because that's where all the information is going to be, especially the deck lists, which we know everybody likes to see for our top eight when we come into the, the later rounds tomorrow. But uh, also you get to stay updated on what people brought this weekend, what decks did well over the weekend. We'll have a day one matter game and we'll have a conversion day two tomorrow. So you can kind of see, oh, a load of people brought Yagmoth, but didn't perform too well on day two, so we kind of moved that across. But um, how are we getting on? Are, are they playing yet? They're not still not playing yet. Okay, cool. Well, we can have a little look at what you're saying, chat, because that's one good thing. Is we have these uh, this thing called technology these days, and we can see what you're all saying to us. How are we all today? Hope you're having a good one. Um, some uh, I just see a lot of wills. Will mustache? Yep. Okay. I have a mustache, ladies and gentlemen. That is correct. It's a uh, it's a life choice, and uh, I'm sticking with it. I kind of wish it was not as the color it was, but here we are. Uh, da -da -da. So open deck list. Why is it open deck list? Why do we pick? In the, or why are these larger tournaments now open I mean, like in the Pro Tour? It's mainly to help coverage because everybody here watching, all of you in the chat, you want to see the deck list. You want to see what these what these people are playing, and you, you don't want to wait till Sunday evening. You you want to see them now. Uh, if we if we run out, run open deck lists, we kind of level the field. If somebody gets put in a feature match, we show their list. Then the people you know that 
often get picked for feature matches would be in a disadvantage. So this is why we have open deck lists. It also dis disincentivize, you know, scouting and yeah. having people run around, you know, writing down what everybody's playing to share it with their team. So we eliminate all that. Uh, if it was up, up to me, I prefer closed deck list. I think I think closed deck list is is better. It rewards uh, it rewards uh, creativity. It rewards you know coming up with new deck, new strategies, transformational sideboards, cards like mana type that your mm -hmm. opponents are are not going to expect. I love that. Uh, but I, I I I understand why we have to have. Uh, open deck list at, at these big tournaments. On that one, I hope that they resolve the issue. So we'll go straight back down to the matchup and carry on where we left off. Uh, I'm going to have a little look. See, wow. looks like uh, in the end, no rewind because of the cascade. Just a warning. Uh, yeah, so basically, there's going to be no rewind. So yeah, let's get back down to the table. I cool. <laughs> yep. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what. I imagine Jean Romel, because of his mistake, because he's such a gentleman, and you know, at this sort of level, he he conceded. He's like, look, I, I didn't mean to do what happened. It is what it is. That's what we're we're and, being, uh, being told. Yeah, if 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 you have an advantage that you got, you know, through a mistake uh, that you didn't mean to do, mm -hmm. uh, and the judges said, hey, well, too much stuff happened. We can't we can't reasonably rewind to that point. You 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 you're, you're just gonna have to keep playing. Uh, John Emanuel said, "Okay, well, I wouldn't have been in this spot because it wasn't possible. So, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna scoop, and you're gonna w win the game. So, yeah, that was a, that was a good way to 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 solve that. I I still remember this one European GP where somebody played a creature on turn two, and then like two turns later, he's attacking, and the opponent's like, wait, how do you have this eight sixteen in play? This is like a nine mana card, and the opponent's like, oh wait, it looks like this two, it it looks like this two drop that I have in my hand. I guess I must have mixed them up, and the judge is like, well, two turns already passed." You're you got to have to keep your eight sixteen in, in play, you know. So, <laughs> so sometimes sometimes these things are are hard to uh, rewind or figure out exactly. It does um, help when you're against the world champion though, who is already qualified for worlds. You know what I mean? Like he's already got the re invite. He's the only person yeah, can well, go and say that in the world. Uh, yeah, I've got a re invite to the to world championships. Plus, you know his integrity. It, it's huge. He is such a gentleman if you ever speak to him, and he would be like, oh, "It's my mistake. Absolutely honest mistake to happen." We can all kind of see. Why Dried Arbor doing its shenanigans? No one really, you know, he's not trying to play for an advantage there. He's like, look. You can also see. figure out that, like, okay, well, let's look at my hand. What would have happened mm -hmm. if the Cascade spell resolves and you get your crashing footfalls? Then you have two 4-4s. Four oh, wait, okay, my hand isn't great. I think I would have died. Yeah, it makes sense for, for me to concede because that's what would have most likely happened. And it's my mistake, so. Yeah, it's, it is what it is. And it's done. It's moved on. He's going to be starting 0-1 in this tournament. But it happens. He's the world champion. I'm sure he'll be able to bounce back from it. I'm being told that there's no more games left in the room and there's no more time left. So we're going to call an end to round number one. We're going to shoot off, have a short break, and then we're going to get the other pair of casters in and they're going to bring you round number two. So don't go anywhere. We'll see you shortly. Wow, that's awkward.
Welcome back to the Legacy European Tour. My name is Filipa and I'm here with Skura, also known as Islands in Front. Today we have the regional championship here in Ghent. The format is modern, 948 players qualified, but only 24 will leave this weekend with a qualification for the Pro Tour. First and second place will also get an invitation to the World Championship. Let's take a look here at our structure uh, of the tournament. The format is modern. And day one, we have nine rounds. You need six wins to advance to day two. In day two, we have six rounds and then a cut to top eight. Let's take a look at our prize structure. So we have $100,000 in cash prizes alongside those very well sought after invites. Yep. Two players walking out here with that world invitation. Biggest event of the year. And what matchups are we having here? I think our players might be ready in the backup. Yeah, I, th I, th I think they're getting ready right now. Uh, when it comes to the matchup specifically, we do not know yet. So it's going to be a little surprise for all of us in the booth and you watching. Um, so we will see. Yes, yeah, so we'll, let's switch back to the floor. Uh, we're watching Piotr uh, Gogowski Canister. Amulet Titan versus Marco De Lazzaretti on Esper Reanimator. What do you think of this matchup? Well, uh, Amulet Titan is a popular deck. Uh, Esper Reanimator, not so much. So this is pretty much an unknown quantity. Uh, now, uh, Canister will know exactly what's going on in Marco's deck, and Marco will know about, about Piotr's, but it's the, it's the Esper Reanimator that probably normally gets an advantage because of like this kind of catch you off guard factor. Um, and now in the open deck list, that's that's not really the case. Yeah, and this is open deck list, which completely changes the way that the players can approach the matchups. You know, if you're against a more aggressive deck, maybe you shouldn't keep a certain end or just switch things, uh, knowing what you are going against. Yes, and exactly, yeah. our players getting ready, both of them won round one, because we are already in round two here of the of the European Championship. Yeah, and players are yeah, looking at their opening hands. And let's see if we keep sevens. And let me open the deck list. So I know exactly what's going on. Because I, I fully expect questions about this Esper Reanimator deck. Yeah, we start there with Preordain. Let's yeah. take a look here at the top two cards. Oh, okay. So the deckless is pretty, pretty much what you would expect if you thought of Esper Reanimator. It's a combination of Grief, Solitude, Atraxa at the top end, uh, Falage Archaeologist to set everything up, the Fairy Time Raveler, Gorius, Vengeance, and Ephemerate. Um, and now we see Force of Negation pitching Tainted Indulgence against a turn one Amulet of Vega. So yeah, we're already into the action firmly. I can see Preordain, Tainted Indulgence, Solitude, and Hallowed Fountain in hand for Marco. And I think there is Sunhome Explore for Canister. Two mana. Let's explore. Draw yeah. a card. Yeah, Explore is much less exciting when there is no amulet there. Now we see Vesuva copying the opposing island. Starting with the ramp, already at three lands there. Yeah. We, we, now we can walk up to, you know, Dryad, then, then the One Ring, and then the Titan, just, just walk your way up. Just walk your way up. Fetch end step four. It seems like Watery Grave. That works really well in conjunction with the Hallowed Fountain in hand, making it the, the trifecta of blue, white, and black. I see that this Esper Reanimator list does run three to fairies, which is actually a card that can be very good in this meta that we've been seeing of so many cascades, so much cascade. Yep, yeah, certainly. That's that's a good call. It also has utilities in other matchups, like, like for example, here it can bounce an amulet, bounce a saga, bounce dryad. Mm, yeah, so the, so it it does some stuff pretty now on the stack. A lot of card selection. Yeah, we also saw that tainted indulgence there. Oh, Priya Dane, keep both on top. That's that's confident. That's confident. Now shock this one in. 
And let's get that Fala Iji boy down. Trigger. We've come a long way since Augur of Bolas. Let's mill. Atraxa, Atraxa, Tainted Indulgence, take it to hand. Now, Tainted Indulgence has a very interesting piece of text because it's not just card selection. Tainted Indulgence says that you can you draw two, then you discard unless there are five or more different mana values. And now we've got one, seven, two, zero land, and three, which is exactly five. But the one ring. There we are. We are drawing a card there. And pass. What ways does Marku have to reanimate those Atraxes in the graveyard? Potentially as well, uh, we have the Grizzlebrand. Yeah, so Gorius Vengeance is the way to do it. One black instant speed spell that we actually see played right now. Atrax on the battlefield, reveal 10. Choose different, car uh, different cards of types, or of different types. And we've got Ephemerate, Teferi, Teferi, Force of Negation, Preordain, uh, another Gorius Vengeance, Grief, so much is going on there. That's a, that's a bang, and bang a turn if I've ever seen one. And this deck is exactly built around for you to get max value out of these attracts as well. You have Planeswalker, you have Land, you have Instant, Sorcery, yes. Creature. Yes, yes, absolutely. Now, I'm actually curious about the, the not... Not including Leyline Binding, because these decks typically play Leyline as a way to interact with the opponent. Now, Marco has Solitude and Grief as interaction and Force of Negation on the stack, and that's it. Well, Teferi, I guess, counts. But yeah, he opts for a no Leyline Binding approach, which is actually pretty decent in this matchup, because Leyline Binding is a liability against cards like Moseju. Exactly. Oh, la la. Oh, oh la la. <laughs> Ephemerate on my Atraxa trigger. Let's take a look again at our top 10 cards. And here, Marco is able to choose between a good selection of cards, <laughs> a lot of options. Yes, yes. I think now he's looking at like a, a third of his deck or a quarter of his deck. Now, ephemer the way Ephemerate works is it rebounds and can be replayed on the next upkeep again in addition to the one picked up on, uh, here. So Marco might actually just see his entire deck and just choose the best cards out of each each sequence. That's... Now, he might even have 11 cards in hand or 20 cards in hand. It's not important if there are no tools to actually thwart uh, Canister's plan. Now, Solitude is decent. You need a clock, but Atraxa is one. So I think we can actually master something here. Yeah, definitely a very uh, good deck, very different deck from what we have seen. And I noticed, as you said, you talked about the Leyline Binding. I noticed this deck does not run any enchantments or artifacts, which yeah. could be an extra advantage uh, with the Atraxa because it's another type of card. Uh, but also, it does serve, it does not have anything that can uh, die to Seju, for example. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So yeah, that, I think I think that was a good choice because. He must have considered Leyline Binding because, I mean, you usually do consider it in these kind of mid range wide decks, but the decision of not playing it, I think it's pretty decent. Now we're double-checking something with the judge. Uh, we're talking probably about the types chosen. I think he may have taken two creatures with the previous trigger or something. I think it's about maybe the protection with the ring. Yeah, so we'll 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 ask our floor floor spotters. And we'll find out soon enough. But still, I mean what's going on here is indeed very dynamic and very I mean the advantage bar is way to the left there. It, um, I'm not sure if chat remembers, because nowadays we don't use these terms. Oh, so it looks like what happened is that while selecting the cards with Atraxa, uh, Mark would select two creatures, Atraxa and Grief as well. And Grief, yeah, okay, so the, it, was, it was the double, double creature choice, uh, which is problematic. 
Yeah, so here, Mark, we're reviewing the choices there from Atraxa. Now, it shouldn't be, be a big problem in general, because, yeah, there are just such a plethora of cards, you might as well discard it, not choose it. And good thing we have a judge always on the floor to yeah. also make sure that these things don't go unnoticed. Exactly. Yeah. Corrected there, and we are back. Okay, so 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 what's the situation right now, Philippa? So okay, let, let's let's just take a look at. So it looks like Marco is shocking an Allowed Fountain. Land for the turn, going to cast <laughs> a preordain. Yeah, after 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 drawing like ten cards, Let, let's preordain. Card, card selection, yeah. It's, it's always good to have more cards. Yeah, we're cleaning up. This card face. Yeah, and the hand is, 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 is a banger. We are going to take here damage from the ring. A very clear pointing to the trigger. That's good. Piotr so, down to 19. I did see that Marco has some interaction that does not cost any mana in end. Yeah, convenient, convenient, yes. I mean, th this is where I think you really want these elementals, like Solitude or Grief, in the decks that can gust you up, so you don't lose actu you don't actually lose cards that much when you pitch them, and you know, the One Ring is one way, attracts apparently is another. So it looks like Piotr here drew two cards from the ring, to see what's the best that he can do this turn. See, so we're drawing some cards. Now we deploy Amulet of Vigor, which is the card in this deck, has the name. But it immediately eats a Force of Negation, so we've got two for two forces and amulets. And that's one way to interact with no mana available. And there's more in Marco's side. Oh, yeah, there is more coming. No more forces, though, it looks yeah. like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, okay, okay, third amulet, okay. Let's see if this <laughs> one resolves. And it does seem to. Okay, so so now Piotr has a, a land drop. So, oh, please, Ottawara, maybe like Dryad now? Okay. Looks like that's it. Okay, so Dryad, now we play Vesuva as the other land drop. We, thanks to Dryad, we untap it. We are not sure what the copy is. And pass back. Now Ephemerate gets rebounded, but actually targets Falage. And I assume the reason is that you actually want to get into the red zone. Just start attacking. This attracts a, is a 7-7 seven, seven lifelink yeah. choir. And all the other keywords that yeah. are probably on there. Yeah. Looks like we have another force in end now. Yeah, okay. For that fourth amulet. That is going to come down. Piot with no sagas. Sagas are the premier land in the amulet titan deck. The fairy time raveler comes down. Let's see if, if it bounces something. Looks like it just plus. So now Marco is able to until oh minus and bounce the draw there. Oh okay, that's clever. That's clever, isn't it? Bounce your the one ring into grief take the one ring. Now we will see if the decision is adjusted based on his hand, but that was a that was a nice 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 idea there. We got double packed. Now both packed. Oh, okay. And so we double, we double took the pacts, attack with the Traxa. We're still, I think, holding up Force of Negation for that ring. Yeah, we are. Oh my God. And we, and we have Solitude. We've got Force Solitude up, having double griefed, and we've got another Ephemerate coming. I mean, th this deck, this game, looks literally unbeatable. Yeah, and... <laughs> 
Piotr there down to 12. That Atraxa just needs a couple of turns. Yeah, just two attacks and we're done. Not gonna lie, it looks pretty impressive. Yeah, Griff also has mana, so the Dryad cannot block it. Yeah, but that's assuming we do not ephemerate it, because when we do, it would have summoning sickness for that one singular turn. So, four mana, the one, one ring. But we know there's four Sinan. What's the leftover? Two mana left. Uh, tap, untap, Dryad, pass. So now, if Piotr top decks, like, for example, Primeval Titan, uh, Solitude can take care of it, but but the search still happens. So maybe we can we can master something there. And what do you ephemerate? Oh, for Lige, actually. So we do want to get into the. Oh, because Piotr is empty-handed right now. Okay. Oh, you can take ephemerate, go to combat, attack, and then ephemerate in the draw step, to make Piotr essentially not have a draw, which should lock up the game. Then we draw, draw for the turn, yeah. The fairy plus. Yep, I think that's that's going to be the play. Not attacking because now Benis could be blocked. Exactly. Seven damage, Piotr down to five. And yeah, let's see if that happens. Piotr draws. Marcos as well, ephemerate. It's Marcos with Gardens. He takes the draw, keeps it in hand, but it doesn't seem to be possible to defend against that flying Atraxa. GG is call called Marco 1-0. Game Kanst. 1 here for our Esper Reanimator deck. What yeah. a surprising choice and working out pretty well here. Can we take a look here at our deck list to see our players can sideboard? So we are looking here first at Piotr's list, the Amulet Titan. Philip, what do you think of this list? How would you approach this sideboard? Yeah, so th this looks pretty stock. Uh, we've got all the classic tools. We don't we don't have any Azusas. We've got Crumbling Vestige and three Demycosis Gardens, which I have heard is a bit of a uh, controversial choice within the Amulet community, that you're playing three Gardens and opt for that Vestige. Otawara to get rid of problematic cards. For example, Elish Known, that otherwise can't be really taken care of. When it comes to the sideboard, ah, uh, Bojukabog uh, looks good, but uh, Tor Torwood script maybe, but other than that, uh, I wouldn't say much is there. So let's see how the reanimator deck uh, yep. can tackle it. And we have here the list, as we saw the three Teferi's Time Ravel that work pretty well. That's, that's such a great card. Um, and we see here the full deck list about the sideboard. How do you think we are going to approach game two here on the draw? Yeah, yeah, I think many more tools uh, for, for Esper Reanimator. We've got Fragmentize, a card I have not seen since uh, Kaladesh Sealed. Um, Subtlety, you know, excellent in the matchup because you can play it for free or hardcast it and just put the Titan back on top, adding a bit more pressure. You've got Prismatic Ending to exile the Amulet, which is, you know, the name, so you can also exile Dryad when you have three mana. So overall, I like the Esper Reanimator sideboard and overall composition better than Piotr's in this matchup. But who can fault Karista? Coming into this tournament, you expect Scam, Yogmoth, you know, Cascade, Murktide. You do not prepare for Esper Reanimator. Yeah, I saw like Cursed Totem sideboard, which is very good against, for example, Arden Scales we saw yesterday and other decks as well. But here, not being prepared to face Esper Reanimator. And, and that's where the strength of this deck also comes from. Nobody is expecting this yeah. particular matchup. Uh, some people might not even know how to sideboard properly for it. Yeah. So even though it's open deck, and even though Piotr knows what he's playing against, his deck is not ready for this matchup. And now... Players shuffling in, getting ready to start here. We are ready round two. There is nine rounds today, and players need a score of six wins at least to make it in day two. That's the first goal. Yeah, but six wins in such a tough field, 
that is so many, so many prominent player today. Like we've got people like Gabriel Nassif, Elliot Bussol, Ben Jones, Arnie Huschenbeth. Uh, we've got uh, Jendrik Schmidt. We've got Andrea uh, Paimonti, Andrea Mengucci, Andrei Straski, and the list literally goes on. Like the the field is stacked today. So having six wins, pr pretty big challenge. A lot of familiar faces. A lot of great players qualified to be here. There are 948 players that had qualified to be here today. The floor is full. Yes. It feels really nice yeah. to feel so many people enjoying magic, enjoying modern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's buzzing. Like, like, dude, it's it's full of players, exciting to to battle it out. Uh, you know, playing some side events as well, trading cards. So yeah, you you would be you would have to be here to to to, to really feel it. Uh, but that's not a problem because we've got even more events in store this year. So worry not, Prague, uh, Naples, I think, and Bologna, and Bologna, yeah, are are all waiting for you to come uh, this year, March, April, I think. Plenty of time to book your flights. Okay, let's take a look here at our hand. Looks like Piotr already kept, but Marco here needing to. Mulligan again. Yeah, so going down on cards, the question is uh, whether Marco's deck mulligans well or not. And I think it's it's okay because like if you've got some key pieces like two la let's say two lands, Gorio, Indulgence, Atraxa. Now, mind you, this would be also a keep on seven with random other two. Um so because the deck plays so many pitch spells, right? Let's say now two subtleties sided in, four force of negation, four grief, and four solitude, mulliganing hurts you in that regard because you have fewer resources to be able to pitch. So you might be forced to bottom them. Only one land. Yeah, one land. But this, there is a pre -ordain. That's true. That can definitely help there find it the second land. Okay, we're bottoming. I do. I didn't really get a good good I look. Oh, we're bottoming Priadain, are we? Yeah, we do have grief, <gasps> Atraxa, and I think Ephemerates. And oh! now a force. Force after the amulet, uh, which is like like we do have prismatic ending. That's why we kept it. But force of negation, otherwise, is not really good. You'd have to pitch Atraxa. But b yeah, bottoming Priadain is pretty bold. Pretty bold. And let's see here what Marco chooses to fetch. Looks like we grab an Allophallon and tapped. And let's see what's the plan here for Marco. So it looks like we are starting with the Grief pitching a Traxa. Let's take a look here at the end. We do reveal quite a lot of interesting things. Yeah, but because we can so because we can have ephemerate, we go and double discard, and because of how ephemerate works compared to, for example, non dead after all, is that you get another effect on the next turn. So you can just discard the one drop and the three drop, wait a circle, um, and then it comes back to you. You discard the titan and leave Piotr, aka Canister, with just double land. Yeah, and Marco first, they're making Piotr discard the dryad. Okay, so we play a land that was drawn uh, to copy the amulet. Yeah. Uh, but now we will, yeah, do this. Response, copy. Keep the copy. So there is still just one amulet, uh, which will be ending it again because there is another one. So we might actually win on or off of one land. I'm just passing here. Marco draws. Attacking there with the grief. Yeah. And now, and I think, yeah. So now we put a sticker on immediately in the face of another prismatic enemy coming down. He does say amulet and Marco here reading the card. And this land is fairly recent. It's from last year, I think.
Yeah, Piot is in a really tough position. Like, even if he deploys, for example, Dryad here, uh, it still cannot block Grief, which which is the power of Grief. You know, has menace apparently, uh, on top of everything else it does, has an evasive keyword. So yeah, land pass. Now we, we draw going, we, we we draw another force of negation, and, and we've got ephemerate again. Wow! Canister down to fourteen life. Force of negation important on this turn because it makes it impossible to play the one ring. Marco here leaving the dream with one grief and one land, trying to keep up. Oh, pass the turn. Oh, another prismatic ending. But this deck is so interactive, right? Like this Esper reanimator. Maybe you would expect something very linear, but oh no, no, on the contrary. Let's remember that Marco moved to five. Kept only one land, has yeah? one land. Yeah. So canister here with explore, able to draw and play an extra land for the turn. Or is a saga? Yeah, now, Piotr is walking up to six mana. Right, right now, he's got six. So Marco will have to ephemerate. And if Piotr has double Titan, oh, he might actually draw out of it. So let's not discount Canister just yet. So pass the turn, and we'll surely now see. Yeah, draw. Do this. Ephemerate. Let's take a look at the end. And there it is. One. Oh, and there is Titan. a pact, but there is a force of negation. Oh, no. So oh, my goodness. So we do know that Piotr does have the pact, but it's getting countered. Yeah. So we force of negation pitching uh, another force of negation. Yeah, we can make... No, we can make a token from Saga, take three down to five, make another token. Now we can block... In theory, because we know there is prismatic ending. Uh, but yeah, Pio so Piotr has to top like something pretty decent. Uh, draw another land. I mean, first land. Marco still needs two more turns with attacking with the Grief to be able to finish off the game. Make a token. Untap. And what would you get here with the Urza Saga? Yeah, typically the choices are amulet or expedition map. If you take expedition map, you might want to take something like functional, like maybe another gardens to have some you know copying capacities. Uh, Slayer stronghold, for example, to give it like a combat relevant keyword doesn't work because you don't have the requisite mana. Make another token, and yeah, that resolves. So now we have two tokens, in theory, able to block that grief. Yeah, exactly. And it looks like it's expedition map. It is It is expedition map, yeah. Now, the Mycosyn's Gardens can copy non-token artifacts, so it unfortunately cannot become another construct, which it would be pre pretty useful if it, if it could. And we can take a look here at the card in the screen as well. Yeah. It can also filter mana, mind you, the second ability. So now the gardens becomes expedition map. We crack the original expedition map. Find another saga. So the plan is to just double block the grief. Now, much to Piotr's disappointment, Marco will just untap and pl play prismatic ending. Uh, but then Piotr will have another token... So, I mean, yeah, it might be possible, but Marco cannot run and uh, cannot draw another removal spell. Yeah, Piotr is going to probably go down to two here, but then Canister does have time to rebuild, make some extra tokens, and then potentially block that grief in the following turn. But yeah, this is going to come down to, to a single combat step. Uh, I, th I don't think Piotr has blocked anything this game or even this match. Like he hasn't declared a block this entire match. All the damage uh, dealt was with five attacks with Grief. Yeah, let's... Uh, we've got... Yeah, Prismatic Ending, which we knew about. Takes care of one of the tokens. We're attacking there for three. Piotr down to two. Yeah, down to two. Ephemerate in hand. But there is no more removal spells. 
and just go. So we do see draw a favorite a yet again. Wow, this is I this is painful. I mean, and so any very interactive on top of that. Oh, four mana in response. Are we enduring? Maybe. But I uh, do I remember seeing an endurance in the list of of Piotr's. No, there isn't. So what is he paying for, tapping for mana for? Oh, we are to warring. Oh, that's good. Okay, that that's this. That's a great response. And now, uh, Marco. Ooh, another saga. We and do. then attack. Oh, canister. It is open deck list. Canister knows that there's no ace creature ready to attack, no way to deal two damage there. Well, Canister really outmaneuvering this game. Uh, okay, now I I'm sitting upright now. Oof. Let's go. I love me some good back and forth. These channel lands are really strong. Otawara, Busejo. Yeah. Yeah, that, that it's a very interesting addition to the game. Um, because now every, every deck basically plays at least one. But they're interactive pieces, so uh, I like, I like. The more interaction, the better. Marco playing Island and saying go. We know there's a Titan Indulgence in end that can be cast in instant speed. Oh, Urza Saga is such a banger. And I those mean. constructs are getting bigger and bigger every turn. Marco down to 13. Yeah, Urza Saga just single-handedly carrying this game, searching out Tormod script. I have to say, I've played a fair, a fair amount of Urza Saga in Jeskai Breach, and woof, it's a drug. I mean, the moment you start playing with Saga, it's very difficult to stop. Yeah, attack you. How much damage is it? So it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, times 2, it's 12. No, no, no. what? Marco down to, down to one, yeah. What? Canister. And we might have a, a return here. Marco at one, Canister at two. Oh, oh. oh my God. Look at that construct. Yeah, that's GG. That's game. Wow, that's unreal. What a game. Marco started with only five cards, only one land for a lot of turns, getting carried on by a Grief and Ephemerates. And then Canister able to just swing back and grab the victory. We have already our backup getting ready, but what did you think of this match? Yeah, that, that, th this particular game was was it was insane. I mean, yeah, as you said, five cards, one land, bottom preordain, keep playing, you know, and just 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 have everything that you need in the right order, smashing the opponent seems like it right also balancing the ephemerates getting rid of every possible draw step they could have uh not ephemerating sometimes on your turn to get the damage in like seemed perfect until it wasn't i really like how urza saga shines so bright here in this game for canister and i really love when this happens one player showcases the deck in game one another player showcases the other deck in game two and now we are going to have a game three and see who comes victorious after all yeah uh, will it be canister playing amulet titan or our esper reanimator marco uh playing here now on the play and hopefully not mulliganing as much. Mulligan to five really cost that game in the end. Yeah, and I now feel and I feel weird for having said that reanimator might not mulligan very well. Where well, Marco just did that. So apparently it does mulligan very well. Uh but yeah, grief. Grief is really, really strong, I have to say. Yes, yes, you, you you've heard it first. RC Gent, Grief is a really good card. Uh but Ephemerate. Ephemerate, I think, is a very interesting pairing because we're used to the not dead after all type of effects, right? But ephemerate, well, 
you've got more uses out of the ETB effects. App uh, clearly has been working out. You know, but like if you bring such a deck to this tournament, like you must have tested it. You must have run it through, you know, half a dozen, dozen, dozens of leagues to see that it works. So, yeah, again, overall, very interesting choice. And let's switch over now to our players. They are getting ready to play game three. They all have access to each other's deck list. Yes. So they might taking this time to just look at sideboards, what exactly your opponent is playing. Do you think they might change the approach here to the sideboards on game three? That's a good question. Um, they might. Maybe, maybe if Marco, for example, is on the play, he doesn't have as much interaction like prismatic ending because it doesn't fit the, the curve as well. Um, but I, I, I think it's mostly a resubmit type of situation. And it looks like we have the wrong match there. Let's switch to our main feature match here uh, to see the game three of the players. Yes, that's that's it. That's we just it. take a look here very fast at our backup feature match and um Oh, I see fragmentize. A colorless star, but actually not taking care of the amulet, but Urza Saga. Oh, another amulet there. Does it resolve? There's force in end, but does Marco decide to use it here or no? Yeah, I, I think you do. Like double amulet is just so scary. Just so so scary. So and he passes back, draw, another force, prismatic. Oh my god. Okay, so yeah, we're speaking of interaction, just so much. And white interaction specifically has got so so much better. In the couple, in the past couple of months and years, you know, getting prismatic ending, leyline binding, uh, which has certainly surpassed oust and condemned that I used to play back in the day, path to exiling opposing dark confident, uh, which did not feel very good. Boros garrison, Boseju, three mana available, and a full grip for Piotr Dryad of Elysian Grove. And Dryad also such a great card here for uh, Canister. It looks like Marco. Doesn't have much to do, not having the grief there. Yeah, that's true, that's true. No clock is certainly an issue. There is an old saying, which is probably not a saying uh, at all, but if you're playing as a combo deck, a combo-esque deck, you really want interaction. Yes, you do. You want clock, but you can't just have either. You have to have both in some combination. If you just have a clock, they might outrace you. If you just have interaction, they might outdraw you. You need to clock them, to actually get the game over with and have some additional disruption, primeval titan, double land drop, and it just resolves. It just resolved, yeah. There's also no solitude, I think, so. Yeah, ephemerate in hand, not doing anything. Yeah, and so we had this situation exactly. A lot of interaction, no clock, no way to actually close out the game. And the window is closing, if not already closed. This is really difficult here. I'm, I'm imagining what Marco can have to get rid of this situation, but I cannot come up with an answer. What exactly top deck does Marco need here? <sighs> right now? Okay, if he top decks Solitude, he can play, I think, Solitude with a white card and then play Ephemerate on it, deal with the whole board. Uh, because I, th I think that's available to him. So I think Solitude is the best top deck. Um, preferably, it would be some card into Solitude. So maybe take it, indulge it into Solitude. Like, let's go run a runner. Why not? Ooh. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Ooh, la, Double la. Urza Saga. And we saw how big those constructs can get and how scary they are. Yeah, now we go with the with the plan of manual killing. No amulet needed, no combo kills here. Gorio's Vengeance is the pickup. 
and the hand is really disjointed. We see double, I think, double ephemerate, vengeance plus force of negation. This hand might as well be zero, zero cards right now. Yeah, unfortunately, no Atraxa in the graveyard there for Marco. And here. Yeah, that's that's really painful. Urza Saga's going to two. Yeah, and some people some people say that Amiletan is actually the best deck. I think actually it is the best deck in the format. Um but you know, but no, for a lot of reasons, you know, it has remained at the top of the meta game through again, different meta games, whether it was Hogak or whether it was Eldrazi, uh, and even right now, and yeah, it seems to you know dodge the bounce a little bit. Complexity is there. I feel like Amulet Titan is such a great deck, but it's very tricky tricky to play. Not everyone can pilot well, and Kenister here piloting this deck beautifully all games. Yeah, he very much does, yeah. And yeah, and GG showing the hand of just pure blanks. And yeah, that does it. Uh, Canister winning one, two. Two to one. Yeah, that, that's, that's the number. And two advancing to now 2 0 oh in the tournament, yeah, which true. is a I'm... great start. A reminder we have nine rounds today, and players need six wins to make it into day two. That's the first goal here in the weekend. In our feature match backup, we have Mario on Rakdos Cam versus Mari Luz also playing Rakdos Cam. So we yeah. have a mirror here. Yeah, exactly. We've got a Grief Mirror. And yeah. Okay, so we see grief with a wicked roll on it, a treasure, as well against Black Crypt, very low in the Black Crypt. Uh, we are in game three, so one and one so far. Marilu winning Barcelona tournament last month in December with this exact deck. Three yeah. Fables of Mirror Breaker and one Bone Crush, Bone Crush Giant in end. Uh, Mario is a well-known Greek player, qualifies for these regional championships multiple times. Yeah, Ragavan, I think it's double Ragavan Takenuma Blood Crypt. I think that is, or a fetch land maybe, but yeah, it's double land, including a Takanuma and double Ragavan. Uh, so we could, for example, dash Ragavan. If it dies, then hard cast the other one. Yeah, things not looking very good here for Mario Luz. Both players already have one win, and here we are going to try to attack. In yep. response, looks like uh, Marilu is fetching there. We know about a storm from Bone Crush Giant that can take care of Ragavan. Yeah, an attack is for 2 plus 3 plus 1 from the Wicked Roll. So that amounts to 6. Um, not half of the life total, unfortunately. But we're stomping. Uh, and if... What you said was correct, and it does seem to be. Marilus is really banking on that land of the top, right? Yeah, there's three Fable of the Mirror Breaker in hand. We know that one crush iron on yeah. the adventure, so Marilu really needs to find that third land to try to come back to this game. Already down to eight life, so two more attacks with that grief, and the game is over. That also has menace. Oh, yeah, he does, yeah. And so and we do see another Ragavan, yeah. So let's see here the top deck. This might be game for Marilus very soon. Ah, uh, okay. Gorkish Bowmasters. Like at least, at least it deals with Ragavan. He does deal with Ragavan, and he does make two bodies. Yeah. But yeah, the, the, the issue is that in this matchup, um, it's both like an aggro mirror sometimes, or a mid range mirror sometimes, or depending on how that game evolves, it can be aggro versus mid range. Okay, so she shoots Grief, and then double blocks Grief. 
and Ragavan connects. Okay, so that, that's the situation right now. Exile the top card. Marilus hopes it's not a land. It is indeed. There's children as well on Mario's side, so that's going to deal quite a bit of damage. Players need to update lives there because Ragavan dealt two damage oh. and also one from Grief uh, from the Not Dead After All Wicked Roll. Oh, a lightning bolt is the pickup. Oof, double, triple fable in hand. So they are confirming the life totals. Uh, yeah, that's tough. That's tough. Yeah, that is yeah. GG. Marilu just revealing uh, the bolt and three fable of mirror breaker. Unfortunately, here not being lucky, not getting that third land. And Mario wins two and one, now advancing and two and zero in this tournament. Yes. Marilu still one and one, six wins, advances to day two, so can still make it into day two. She could even lose twice and still make it. So so. In perfectly good position. Yeah. The, the first match, I have to say, the first match, that was pure magic. That was super exciting. We had back and forths. We had, like, alternative game plans come into play. We saw, you know, the Atraxa thing, double ephemera, draw a million cards. Uh, we saw the Titan, you know, do nothing, 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 nothing. Saga, 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 saga. Uh, yeah. And then, then it worked out, uh, which, which was also really nice to see. Uh, oh, I'm enjoying myself. I'm enjoying Modern right now. Modern is a very healthy format. I like there. There are so many different decks. Uh, we see a lot of Merfolk, Zoo, Rhinos. Uh, we see also Living Ends. Uh, I've seen some Dead Shadows as well. Yeah. Uh, a lot of different decks all over the field. There's 948 players. I'm really curious to see the meta breakdown once that's ready. Uh, I'm really curious to see what the players chose to bring here. It is open deck list, so it's always nice that we can showcase the lists and yeah. show what our players are indeed playing here. And that you can also see at home what deck lists the players chose to bring here. About names and players to watch, what players do we have here in this tournament that um, are known to the public? We saw Canister, which yeah. is uh, a streamer. Uh, we also have Andrea Mengucci. Yeah, we do. We've got Elliot Bussot, uh, a known French streamer, who also does ver did very well, for example, at the Eternal Weekend, but also plays modern uh, with, um, with an interesting weapon of choice. Because in Barcelona, um, he played Blue Red Fairies. With spell status sprite, yes, I, I mean that blue red fairies, and I actually looked up his deck list for this tournament. It's blue red fairies. It is blue red fairies. So he he must just believe this is the weapon of choice. This is how he wants to win this tournament. So yeah, that's that's awesome. We also have Gabriel Nassif on the rhinos. So not blue eye control. All the yellow hat fans. It's not blue eye control. Not even four color. It is rhinos. But, uh, yeah, we've got Andrei Straski on Titan. We've got Marco Del Pivo. We've got, you know, um, uh, Christian Calcano on Tron. Jean-Emmanuel Deprau, who we've watched on Yogmoth. Ben Jones on, on Murktai. I mean, I just could keep going on. Just so many players. Yeah, a lot of uh, well-known faces to the public. I was walking round one to see players playing, yeah. and I saw uh, Strasky versus Arne, two yeah. well-known players of the public, and you just run into situations like this, like good players running against each other. I mean, all the players here are good. They already had to qualify to be here, but those faces there are very well-known to the public, and we want to know what players do you want to see here? Who are you rooting for at home? And what deck would you bring? What deck would you bring, Skura? Uh, so I would bring Blue Red Merktide with Droid. Oh, I thought you were going to say Blue Red Fairies. No, 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 no. I, I'm not that crazy. But I would play Triple Droid in my Blue Red Merktide list because Droid is the way to go. And I, I don't at me. This is the way to go in Merktide. Um, but if I were to play something else, or oh, I mean, properly different, that would be just Kai's Station Breach. A deck I'd play like for like a year or two years even, like very extensively. I love the deck. It's excellent. It's stimulating. Uh, it, it's rewarding. Uh, would you bring Merfolk? 
Uh, no, actually, I would not bring Merfolk to this tournament. I would bring Zoo. Oh, you would? Okay, okay, okay. Zoo, zoo gamer. gamer. Okay. I like Domain Zoo. I think it has a lot of strong cards. Yeah. It does a lot of cool things. I do not like my Kavu being destroyed for uh, the Tishana's Tidebinder, but without that, <laughs> that aside, uh, the deck is really strong. Uh, it's not Tire 1, but it's definitely a good deck. But there are so many choices. I see some players in Tron as well. Um, Tron, which did very well in uh, the Lord of the Rings Pro Tour last oh, did, year. Yeah. Then we haven't seen it that much for a while, but I know of um, a certain team that decided uh, some players to bring Tron here, so we might see some really good Tron players here. Um, wh what do you think of this deck here for the tournament? So Tron has fallen off a bit. That that's true. So it was it was very very popular back at the PT as you mentioned. There was Tron, and it was Rhinos. It was basically PT Rhinos Tron, and Tron has fallen off because it can still be preyed upon, and that's mainly because of the comeback of Merktide. So Merktide comes back with Preordain, all happy to battle it, and brings you know Magus of the Moon, Blood Moon, Alpine Moon. Spell pieces, force of negation, and, and the tempo, and you know, in the pressure, and so Tron doesn't really like that. Um, also, we've got Amulet Titan, where you have to raise them, uh, but they could just just turn to you, turn three you, and there is nothing you could have done. Um, so yeah, so that that's why Tron fell off. But then the meta game like, like mishmashed a little bit. So so now everything is like tenish percent. So I guess because it's less homogenized, you no, know, Tron came back. Uh, you know, in the hands of Christian Calcano, for example, who, yep. who who certainly knows what he's doing. I'm curious what the list is because they've been innovating with the list, like playing now, maybe not four but three Sylvans crying to sagas. Uh, yeah, so movie, a lot of moving pieces there. Yeah, and uh, I wanted to talk to you a bit about the state of modern. Uh, we have been talking about how the modern uh, specific sets, like Lord of the Rings, the yeah. Modern Horizons, uh, have shaped modern a lot in the past years the format has been changing constantly do you think the the format changed a lot after the ban of the fury as well as of the beanstalk or is it still sort of the same i would say genuinely that it is the same but you just just take a screenshot of the meta game back then take out four color midrange we're good because that's literally the meta game it is the same including for example ragdos grief but just without the four color, which some people didn't really like because one, the people who play four color wanted four color. And two, some people preyed on four color because it was very prey uponable. For example, JSK Breach did really well against four color because it overloaded on removal, but couldn't really interact with anything that's not the creature. They had a huge problem with it. So again, same meta game, just no four color. And we've got Rhinos on top right now, followed by Ragnar's Grief, as I mentioned, Golgari Yogmoth, um, Is it Merktide, and then Amulet Titan, and then like six, seven, eight in order. Could be a lot of different decks. Could be Scales. We Hammer. saw a lot of that yesterday. Amor as well. Zoo, I think Zoo might actually be at the, the, the sixth, seventh spot. I also have seen a lot of players uh, with the Mono Black Coffers. That deck did one Sophia in October, the LMS there. Do you think that deck has potential to bring victory here for this tournament? Uh, also, actually, I will take it as a broader point. I think, much to all of our satisfaction, any deck can win this tournament. It, and I genuinely think that. So I've got a very firm top five, which probably constitutes around 50% of the meta game. But I think any deck could be taken, tweaked a bit, and just take it down. For It could be Jeske Ascendancy, it could be Merfolk, it could be Blue Red Fairies. And uh, so, yeah, yeah, it's just. That, that's why I like the format. Now, Coffers might just take it down uh, tomorrow. Two rounds are done. We still have seven more to go today. Tomorrow, there's a six rounds and a cut to top eight. Let's take a look here. What our players are playing for? What are the prizes? Over $100,000 $100, in cash prize alongside other prizes. 
uh, but I think the most sought after prize are those qualifications. Yeah. Top 24 do qualify for the Pro Tour. First and second place uh, can walk away here with an invitation to the World Championship, the biggest tournament of the year. And one thing that is really nice about these regional championships is exactly this, the qualification for the World Championship. Uh, what do you think of the feeling of arriving here to a regional championship and when you get into that top eight and you're like getting closer to that world championship invite? I can only imagine that the top four match for this qualification can, it has to be just nerve wracking. Like every single person's dream has to be playing at the world's championship. And it's, it's just so, it's, I think it's the fact that it's so far away but it's also so close at the same time. Technically, anyone in this room today can, and some people will, win this qualification, right? So, you know, you, you can do it, but it's, it's difficult. It's, it is far away and yet so close. So, it has to be nerve-wracking. Uh, and I cannot possibly imagine the, the feeling of satisfaction when you do win that. I mean, it just has to be the best day of your life, honestly. And if you do not get there, but you still make the top eight, you are qualified anyway for the Pro Tour, yeah. which is another way that you have to try to qualify, qualify for the yeah, World yeah, Championship. Yeah. And also, top 36 qualifies for the next RC. So even if you cannot uh, make it to the Pro Tour, you can try again in the next RC and do it all over again. Next yeah. one here in Europe is in Naples. Uh, it's around three months or four from now. Yeah, I think it's yeah. in May, end of May. Um, and... How can players there are curious? How can they join? How can they be here? How can they be feature matched maybe one day uh, in these tournaments? Where is the path to qualify for these regional championships? Yeah, so if you want to be at, the, at an RC, a thousand person tournament with like 20, you know, pro players who you've seen uh, all over the place, then you need to qualify through RC queues. So regional championship qualifiers and there are just so many of them. You've got them locally, probably, or maybe in some nearby cities, right? Big cities probably have them multiple times, you know, probably you know, four, five, six, ten per season. Um, so you can try to qualify there. You can also play online and qualify through that. But you can also come to the LMS series, which is literally this. Uh, so, for example, come to Prague very, very soon or come to Bologna. And then you can play this tournament, be in the top 32, if I'm not mistaken, and then get a qualification for the, uh, for the RC. So there are multiple paths to get there, multiple opportunities to get here as well. Also, on top of all of that, you could come, like a lot of people, like, like 400 people did it yesterday, and play the last chance qualifier, the very, very last tournament to get you here. And then 400 players battled it out yesterday so that the top 16 uh, at, at seven and two or better could actually get the qualification. So yeah, multiple, multiple ways. And the way it works now is that it's by season. So this was the modern season. We had modern tournaments qualifying here for the modern finals. Next one is going to be standard. So if you do qualify for the, um, the regional championship in Naples, it is going to be format standard. So your local game stores are either going to be running standard events or limited events. It can also yeah. be sealed. You do have ways to be here with other formats. So, for example, if you come to an LMS, they are going to both be in Prague and Bologna. The main event is modern. So you can qualify through the standard tournament yeah. by playing modern. Imagine that now you practice so much for modern and you want to play it again to try to qualify uh, and then only start with the standard. But a lot of options there for the players to start locking these tournaments and the path to the Pro Tour. Yeah, and then the path to the Pro Tour and then, and then you know, RC, so this is why I love this system, uh, because it's so clean. You begin locally, right, and an RCQ level, very, very local, right? Your own, your own uh, LGS. Then from the RCQ, you go to the RC, which is a European tournament, right? And then from the RC, you go higher to the PT, and you go higher to Worlds. There's a very clear path when you go micro to macro, uh, which I really enjoy, and it's very easy to understand, right? You play the small one, then the bigger one, then the bigger one, and you just go up. So, very clear, 
um just started your little game store and you might be here in the next one and a lot of people curious about the meta breakdown there's over 900 players so there's first a filtering to just make sure that the players are indeed uh naming and labeling their decks correctly so yeah. we don't have any or try to avoid uh, some of these decks that are mislabeled then after that People are working behind the stage very, very hard on getting that meta breakdown. And as soon as we have it, we will, of course, share it with everyone. You can go follow Legacy European Tour Twitter. That's the first place where the meta breakdown is always posted. Uh, as well, here on the stream, we will show you. We are also very curious to see the meta breakdown for this tournament. So, meta break. So, I had a question, I remember. What do I think that the meta game is going to look like today? compared to tomorrow. And I honestly think it's going to be very, very similar, if not the same. Um, so we'll, we'll check if that prediction is correct, but I'm calling it right now. The top five decks I've mentioned today multiple times, uh, they will match it. They will match yesterday and it also be true today, but that remains to be seen. Yeah, and we are closing here on uh, ending these round two. Round three, we will be back soon. We try to avoid some of these uh, delays sometimes, but in tournaments over 900 people, what happens a lot of times is that there's always that one table that is in extra turns and got a judge call, and that sometimes does delay things a bit, but we always have our company here to talk about the meta, the formats. Next, we're going to have uh, the set, the murder set yes, exactly, in February. Yeah. Uh, do you think any of those cards from the new set will be played in modern? So I'm calling a single thing which is a, the Surveillance, right? The Surveillance, I think they've got a lot of potential. We'll see if they see play. But for example, Esper Reanimator. Ooh, Esper Reanimator. I think they would like this blue-white or blue-black Surveillance. So this is my call, but that remains to be seen. Yeah, I think at this point, Modern is waiting for that Modern Horizons tree in the summer to shape up the meta all over again. Uh, players really excited about that, about those strong cards that are made for Modern. Yeah, I'm curious how, they, how they're going to shape the power level, because MH1 was completely different from MH2. And then Lord of the Rings was also much different than MH1 and 2. So I think the direction they're going to go with MH3 is very interesting. Right? It, it could be power level, but it could also be, you know, they could still make very powerful cards, but for example, a very powerful card that will clearly slot into scales, but you can't just generically play it, right? Or a card that really slots into reanimator shells, but you can't really play it in Merktite, compared to generically powerful cards like Counterspell, you know, Ragavan in any red deck, Saga, etc. So I'm really curious how they're going to approach that. Yeah, I'm really curious as well to see how the format changes and I'm really excited about modern season. I'm kind of sad that it's ending. I was starting to enjoy more and more modern, playing more and more modern. I actually, before uh, this modern season, didn't play a lot of modern. I started playing to, to practice as well for these tournaments. I started playing more folks to main zoo, mill. I love mill against Tron, just saying it does work pretty well. Um, and I'm sad that it's coming to an end but i'm also excited to start the standard season yeah. and to have this uh, diversity and every player can okay now it's the standard season i might not be a fan but then there's probably another season coming it might be pioneer it might be modern it might be um limited i don't know uh, we have a lot of options there and um I'm really, really excited to see how things are going to turn out with this season. Do you like the approach of the seasons here uh, that are is being taken? Yeah, yeah, certainly, because it allows every type of player to be able to showcase their skill and, you know, pioneer player, dominate their format, maybe take a break, or maybe it's also a kind of incentive to try to learn something new, right? Because maybe you only play modern, well, Try Pioneer, maybe you'll like it. And a lot of people will probably just like it, right? Try Standard, why not? And then, then they'll find that they like it. And because it's always Pioneer more than Standard, um, again, sometimes limited, as you said, maybe you don't have to learn anything beyond that. Keep it to three formats, buy three decks, update them from time to time. Modern, the most rarely. Pioneer, maybe a bit more. Standard, every season probably, right? And just keep them in rotation. And uh, yeah, and play like that. And for the limited players, there's always limited RCQs at the local game stores. Sometimes the classic qualifiers here are also uh, sealed. And uh, then in the Pro Tour, there's all, always the 
draft part of it. Uh, so there's still some action as well for the limited lovers. Uh, and I think that's going to be it. We are going to conclude here round two. We will be back shortly for round three. Uh, let us know what you are expecting to see, what decks do you want to see showcased here, and we will see you soon.
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the European leg of the RC, the regional championships. My name is Will Hall, better on the internet as the Will Hall EXP. That man's my left. That is Hall of Famer Martin User lifting yet another trophy. Why not? And that is what everybody <laughs> is playing for this weekend. We've got 948 players turned up to ballot out in the largest European regional championships to date. And they're all battling out in 15 rounds of modern action. We're going to bring you nine of them today. We're going to head straight into round number three. We've got players set down. So we're going to move straight down to it. And we're going to talk about what decks they're playing and who is piloting them. So Martin, tell me, who is piloting what decks? I think we might have a chat uh, favorite deck, which is Merfolk. On the right side, Filippo Gian Grandi playing a Merfolk deck against Jose Moniz, who is on, I believe that is Amulet Titan. Yeah. So yeah, Merfolk is also one of my favorite archetypes. I always en enjoyed playing that deck. And I think it's one of the few creature decks in the format that doesn't actually use that many X1 creatures that you would be relying on, you know, as much as the green decks, for example, if you're running Birds of Paradise or Noble Hierarch, then you don't really want to play against Bowmasters. But Merfolks, they have a lot of tutus and a lot of lords to try to pump the other to, to try to pump the rest of the team. So Bowmasters is typically not that big of a deal. No. And was, you know, but one of the you know, uh, Joe there on the left of your screen, very well known on Twitter for piloting Titan, uh, you know, at high levels, always trying to nibate this deck, make, make, uh, try new cards in it and move forward. So it's gonna be good to see that uh, this deck in the hands of a master. To me, I personally think Titan is the best deck in the format. I think if mm -hmm. you can if you can master this deck. You're gonna your percentage of win weight is gonna go through the roof. It's just it's so hard to pilot. It might be the best deck, but also the hardest at the same time. Yeah, yeah. You need you need you need to you need to have a lot of practice with the deck and you need to have a lot of like brain power to really go through all the possibilities that you have. That's where I struggle, you see, the yeah. brain power bit. <laughs> There's always so many different options, uh so many different lines you can take. Uh yeah, I agree. I think I Amulet is certainly one of the one of the best decks in the format, or it could it could very easily be the best one, uh, depending on you know how much you practice with it. And that's kind of key in modern, right? Is is getting the reps in with your deck. Not everybody can afford every deck in modern. Yeah. It is a you know it, the price tag is going up a little bit in this format, let's say, but because you, you can't kind of bounce around from it, you've got to learn one or two decks, stick to them, have a cyborg plan. Like I you know I still play Infect. I've got a big box of probably about 200 cards that could go mm -hmm. in but meta depending. It's, it's just learning your deck through and through what cards are going to be good in what meta and you've got to try and make that meta game cool when you turn to these up to these big tournaments like the regional championships. Merfolk though kind of plays out more of a tempo style, right? Yeah, and also you play a lot of creatures. You don't really have that much interaction. Mero Regery, Re sure, you can tap a blocker, you know, every now and then. But for example, here against, you know, Jose's, the one ring, there's not much that Filippo can actually do. He didn't have a Force of Negation, which is a card that Merfolks sometimes run. Sometimes they run Dismember. Sometimes they run, I think, Spreading Seas, I think, is, is, is mostly a thing of the past. There's not that much Tron anymore. Uh, Tishana's Tidebinder, though, that's a good card against the one ring. Hello. That's a, that's a new one that's been printed. And every single time I see this card played, I learn something new about yeah. it. It's always something, trig something different trigger that is working in some sort of different style. We saw, I believe you you saw a cool interaction yesterday with with a Kavu, and how it's able to take out oh, a, yeah, a, a you Kavu. Can just kill the card yeah. basically because it, it it has no tax and it's it's effectively a zero zero. You can stifle fetch land, so you can you, you can turn it into a stone rain. You can, uh, you know, when somebody has a card in suspend, uh, when you take take the last counter off, uh, you can basically counter the card that way. Uh, lots of different things you can do, and I remember when the card came out. Most people are saying, "Yeah, this is kind of overhyped. Maybe it's not as not, not as great." Uh, but it turns out that it's been it's been uh, having a lot of impact in modern. Yeah, it's it's very good. I, I like. This. Would you say Stifle is too powerful for modern? No, no, definitely you, not. Do you reckon, reckon they, they could print that in modern? It would be kind of good. Yeah, wait, isn't it legal in modern? No, no, no. It's Okay, okay. That's yeah, maybe. I guess it it would completely change the 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 play patterns and when you crack your fetch land. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes you have to do it on your own turn to not run, run into a stifle. So it would certainly change the format in a in a in a weird way. Maybe not in a in, in a fun way because nobody really wants to get get wastelanded. You know, early on for one blue mana. So. No, and I'm very greedy. I like to keep my one landers. As you see here, lots of land on the battlefield for both players. Uh, we've got a few triggers going on the stack. We're going to untap our lander. Of course, every time you play a Merfolk, we can tap or untap a, I believe it's a permanent. I don't think it's, it has to be a land. It can be a permanent, so it could be a creature. But we're using it for our advantage with our lands. So we're going to turn everything sideways. No blockers on the other side. Normally, Merfolk, 
It's very hard to block with Island Walk, but don't really need that because there's no islands on the other side, but also there's nothing to actually block. But this is the scary bit. We're untapping, potentially going to have two amulets on the battlefield this turn. Could just be GG's. And, you know, in the hands of a master, like Joe's on the left of your screen, I can't count it out. I think we're going to, and th this is where trying to be a play by play caster is really hard. I'm like, <laughs> so they're going to do this into this, into this. But right now, we've currently got the Ozzy Saga trigger on the stack. We're going to tap the one <laughs> ring, draw two extra cards in response. Because, you know, maybe we want to go get, um, I don't have the deck list in front of me, but maybe we want to go get, I imagine it's another amulet, but have other options like uh, an exhibition map could be the other option. So he's looking at what lands has he got, what lands we need. Maybe he's got all the cards he needs in his hand already. So he can, uh, you know, oh, I just need that one extra bounce land or something. So I can go get myself the expedition yeah, map exactly. and use that to bounce. And he's going through that. And this, this is what I mean. These are the lines that I'm not big brain enough to play around. You have all these options. Like, okay, I can start with a summoner's pack. Maybe I get a dryad. That's going to allow me to make a few extra land drops. Maybe Azusa is, is the way to go. Maybe if I, if I you know, squeeze in the, the, a, a way to get amulet. Uh, somewhere in there, I'm going to untap a bunch of lands. But meanwhile, there's a judge standing behind you telling you that you have to make a yeah. play. So, yeah, this is not easy. So, here's some uh, mana tokens going to start flowing. We've got colors floating. So, I think that's why he's deciding. is either what do I go find or do I make a construct here? Do I have enough mana uh, and resources this turn to not only do my game plan, but also add a construct to the battlefield? Decides to float the mana. Goes and gets himself a second, second amulet. And wow. this, is, this is where you get the, 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 yeah. the one turn shot. Now he's thinking, is that what do I need to play around? I'm guessing t uh, tie binder mage is a, is something from the Merfolk side. It can just completely turn off the two mana. Yeah, uh, I mean sometimes they run, you know, force of negation. Oh, Trickster. Trickster's the one I'm thinking. Yeah, of. Merfolk Trickster. Sometimes they can have you know a different kind of counter spell. That's that's historically been something that Merfolk uh, like to play. Well, and this is where it's, when you're sat opposite this and your opponent gets out all the mana, you're like, oh, okay. Yeah, that's not looking good. <laughs> Here we go. So now they're gonna he's gonna. Um, Transmute this Teleria West. Going to go find himself something with a converted mana cost to zero. Yeah, the fact that the Teleria West gets you a summoner's pack basically means that you can transmute your land into a primeval titan or into one of the creatures that, that lets you make multiple land. land drops. Or you can get a mount slant. Yeah, there's there's always so many possibilities and so little time. That's, it. That, that's where my experience is. I'm like, oh, you're always going to get summoner's packed. I don't think, oh, actually, he's like worked out. He needs yeah. to get the bounce land. That's the key piece we're missing. He's going to go through it. This is certainly a deck where if your friends tell you, hey, Amulet's really well positioned for this weekend, and you just pick it up and <laughs> no, you play no, your no. first round as the first game, you're not going to do well. You really need to practice a lot, and you need to be in these situations where you have all these different lines, and you need to already know, like, oh, yeah, I've been in the spot multiple times. I know exactly that right now I need to do the X, Y, and Z, and, and you know, go, go from there. So that is a Dryad of the Assyrian Grove, I believe. I think that's the... Yep. All dryad right. of the Assyrian Grove. There is a su subtlety. So that's going to put it to the bottom. Don't need that right now. But that does mean we, you know, we'll put, maybe we were playing around. We needed the extra land drop from that this turn to carry on. Going to have a little look-see. Got a lot of nice cards here. That is a... Oh, my word. We're testing me here, aren't we? I think that's an Azusa. Uh, the alternate heart Azusa. So we get to play two more land drops for our turn. Of course, with this bounce land, that is going to be four mana each time, two green and two blue. As long as we play one more land drop, I'm pretty certain that's an Azusa. Testing my play-by-play -play secret lair skills right now. <laughs> and yeah, because we got the one, I'm going to go out. And that is definitely the Azusa secret land. I'm pretty good at my secret land, uh, uh, my secret lair alternate art ones, mainly because I spend way too much money on them. I think there should be more cards with Phyrexian language and, and Sparse Blur. Oh, yeah. time, all my, my, my Infect deck has got four of each. I had to buy four of all those secret layers just to have play sets of them That's all. That's cool. And now, okay, now we're going to go with the... Uh, we're going to bounce the One Ring. We're going to Otawara that back to our hand and recast it, gaining the trigger of uh, protection from our opponent. I wonder if, if Jose is missing anything, because he did have the option to go for a Titan, but perhaps he didn't have enough mana. He needed to find the Bounce Land to make more mana thanks to the Amulet. So he certainly might be missing something. Um, oh, okay. So we're sacrificing um, Merfolk now to pay the extra one for the ring. The Cash Trigger still happens, but the ring doesn't end the battlefield, but that did cost us two of our Merfolks on the other side. All our mana uh, tokens are going to go to one aside. Shout out to RK Post, who is in attendance this weekend. 
that's one of the other cool things you got. Not only is it the European Regional Championships, we have lots of other side events and backup events going on, but also we've got Ice, we've got Old McGuard in the corner doing play. Uh, you can go and play against some of your favorite pros there. So much happening these weekends. So not even if you qualify, you can still come with your friends and have an awesome weekend. We're turning everything sideways, but I'm pretty sure that one ring triggers on the stack. No, the one ring didn't resolve, right? Yeah, but it, it, it doesn't have to resolve, right? Doesn't it just? It's a cast trigger, I think. Can we? Can you get that up so I can have a look? Yeah, I think it's a cast trigger. I could be wrong. We're gonna check that. My, mine's on it. He's getting in there. It'll be. I think it'd be a little too good. Is it ETB? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When it enters the battlefield, okay, you okay. get the protection. Uh, that makes more sense of why they're turning things over then. You you did make me second guess myself. <laughs> though. I'm like, I've, wait, maybe. But normally when it happens, I'm in a bad place anyway, and I'm I'm you know half tilted, but I'm like, oh, not again. <laughs> it's fine. Chat's helping us out. Thank you very much, chat. And we are watching everything you're saying. So you know, if you've got any questions or anything for that, please feel free to ask us. This is going to be a two-way conversation all the way throughout the day for all the casters. Remember, nine rounds of modeling today, followed by another six tomorrow before we cut to that top eight. And that's where we're going to find out which two players in the room are going to earn themselves World Championship invites to Las Vegas at the end of the year. Right now, we're just getting a lot of mana floating. That's another Azusa. That's the full art Azusa that got printed in the Commander Legends set or something like that. And that's going to enable us to have three land drops for the turn. With a bounce land equals a bucket load of mana. That's the official amount. I think I see eight mana currently floating. Transmuting. Go find a summoner's pact. Are you going to offer the cut? This is, <laughs> this is offer the cut. I'm going to cast this. Are you going to sacrifice your whole board to try and stop me, even though I've got eight mana left floating? I would like to cast this summoner's pact. It resolves. Primeval Titan. Oh. Yep, and now things are going to start happening. <laughs> no, I think when you have two amulets out and the first one resolves you can actually go you can almost cast all four i think in one turn yeah i don't want to get ahead of myself <laughs> like we, we, we don't know you know the cards in hand sometimes one of the lands necessary to to make that happen is is, is in the player's hand but you know slayer's slayer's stronghold in combination with boris garrison and and sun home um the fortress uh fortress of of, of the legion is a uh, is a way to you know get multiple uh titans into play then you know make them make them attack because they have haste and give them double strike and and you know just all win the, out all of the nowhere. Crazy yeah. so of course uh we've got merfolk on the camera which means a merfolk master has to be in chat hello mr nikachu mtg hope you're well thanks for paying 30 dollars on your plane wi-fi just so you can watch today the european <laughs> regional championships i can tell you one very cool thing that i remember to this day when I, I was watching a gp i think it was alex hayne playing in the in i think it was a top eight of a grand prix and Alex is in a situation where it's not looking good. He has like a primeval titan in hand, uh, but only tapped lands in hand and five lands in play. So he needs to he, he needs to draw an untapped land. He draws and it's like another bounce land, for example. And he he doesn't have a he doesn't have an amulet. So we're we're all thinking, okay, well he's dead. And then he plays a, a Vesuva, which I'm gonna put that on the screen real Copies quick. Copies target land on the ETB, right? Yeah. Do you know what it does exactly? Uh, I think it doesn't come and play taps and copies target land yes if it's, but if it's tapped if it's not tapped it... but you may do that and there was an orborg in play and he just plays the vesuva oh untapped chooses word. not to copy it produces black mana and just casts the titan how crazy is that big brain play right there and then you know that's haynes is one of the masters very very oh, good sure. at magic yeah, yeah. alex is one of the one of the one of the best players He's uh, back when the MPL was on and you all had to stream. He was one of my favorites to watch because he used to just sit there with his cowboy oh, with, hat on. With, with the sombrero. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it was, it was, yeah. I always and, ask him to bring it back. And and this this shows you exactly the type of player you need to be with Amulet and the type of types of things that you need to know based on the experience. Like, yeah, he's played so much already that, you know, this already came up. And now he knows for every single time that you can do this with Vesuva. These are the types of things that uh, you will learn if you if you know if you play a lot with the deck and and then there are these corner case situations where that can be the difference between winning or lo or losing. Hold on, this is interesting. So I'm mm, okay. So we need to win this turn because we're at two life. Our opponent's at twenty. We can make the Titan double strike trample, but there's a blocker on the other side, so it's not lethal. There's no dr there's no uh, dryad on the battlefield to be able to shoot for free damage with Alicates. So this is and this is what this is where the lines in the play. I'm sure he's got the line in his head, and we're gonna all see it together. But that's how I'm reading the battlefield right now. Is this isn't currently lethal yet? I'm gonna move the mana tokens out of the way. That's sure. 
We're going to get the double untapped triggers. So that's a double strike for the Titan. Yes. Wait, can we get multiple Titans in, in play? Well, this is already attacked. So we're not going to be able to finish off with double with uh, attack damage here, I don't think. So yeah, we chum block that. So we go, we drop to two. How do we get the last points of damage across? Are we going to play like a ring or something in, to follow up to give us protection? Just see a little land in hand. As long as life totals are correct, which we will double check. Or we've got three blockers versus three attackers. So anything that can get rid of a blocker, anything that can turn anything into an island. I know we don't have island work walk currently. We had to we had to throw that one under the bus. Everything's gonna get turned sideways. Well, there are three I'd, blockers. I'd like to move to blocks. This must feel great. The fact that I'm allowed to block normally doesn't happen against uh, the Merfolk list. Damage is gonna happen. We're gonna see one hex catcher hit the graveyard. Primary will tighten left on the battlefield. One card in hand. Pass the turn back. Pay for our packs in the upkeep. Let me talk about how that how packs work <laughs> in a minute and how much I hate that new rule change. It's just a land in hand, and we're gonna scoop it up. And that is gonna be game number one. See what I mean about having to pilot this deck masterfully, going to two, working out the blocks, and just you know. What a close ending, though. I think if Philippe drew any Merfolk there, thanks to the Reacher, you would have been able to tap one of the blockers, and yeah. uh, Jose was at two life. So, so yeah, half of the deck was was probably lethal there uh, for Filippo, but Jose takes game one. Well, let's see if we can get the deck list on the screen for you all at home. Because remember, this is an open deck list tournament. So we're having a little problem with Millie at the minute, so we're going to just have it here in our... <laughs> a little in, bit of a problem. Huh? Yeah, just a little problem. So we're, this, this is the exact <laughs> list that they've got. So looking at that sideboard there, four defense grids, three dismembers, two engineering explosives, two generous Ents, two Splunkings, one Azusa, one Wirecoil engine. What would Six, you bring in here? 60 cards. I just want to mention that. 60 cards. Because Frank, Frank just did his uh, Metagame Mentor yeah. article, and the, the aggregate list on Titan had six, 61 cards. Uh, so a lot of people found that that interesting, but yes, yeah, so sometimes there's all these silver bullets that you know these lands and, and creatures you want to try to fit into the deck uh, that maybe it makes sense to play the extra card. Uh, but yeah, here if you expect your opponent to have a lot of counter spells, I mean defense grid could come in, but you also have well, there's uh, a lot of flash merfolk as well, so it could also work in that way, right? Uh, yes, uh, dismember explosives that could also come in. The merfolks typically are uh, two casting costs or mana value two. So explosives is certainly a card I would be thinking about bringing in uh, just as a sweeper uh, for a lot of the, the most important merfolk. And can be found off Teleri West. Exactly, and you can find it uh, with your mana base. Yeah, a Worm Coil Engine I don't think is all that great in a matchup like this because of the cards like Mero, Mero uh, Regery being able to, to tap it as a blocker. So that that's more for a matchup like Burn. All right, let's see if we can get the other deck list up. Let's have a little look, see what how merfolk have brought or what is the exact 75 they brought this weekend. At least they're going to try and get it up for us. Looks like there's a little bit of confusion behind it. This one. I promise you there was at least 75 cards in this Merfo list. And uh, we're going to try and get that up on the screen for you all. But while, we, while they do that, and they're kind of working on the background for us, we, let's talk a little bit more about uh, some of the spices. Oh, you've got it. Okay, we've yeah, got it in front think, of us. You I go for it. Tishana's Tidebinder is the new spice, right? Like most of the cards in the deck have been the same for a long time. Uh, Merfolk, Trickster, Lord of Atlantis, you know, Vodalian, Hexcatcher, like those are some of the some of the most uh, most obvious cards. Mero Regery, uh, Subtlety is one of the newer additions, you know, since since Modern Horizon. There's also the the one to uh, Richard and Dog Hand, which kind of acts as a as a Richard and Port if you need. Uh, lo lots of ways to to give your creatures island walks. Some of them already have it. Uh, either vile, obviously the the most important card in the deck. So a card that doesn't see much play anymore. Yeah, because the, the small creatures are just not very well positioned. Yeah. Do you think it's good enough to print in standard and pioneer now? Uh, I mean, I think it would, it would be fun. I think these these creature decks are are you know fun to play sometimes if you're if you're into that. It's it's it's. Uh, I think it's important for the ecosystem for the creature decks to also exist mm -hmm. for the metagame to be diverse uh so i like vile maybe we could see it in pioneer uh we'll, we'll see 
Oh. There's actually two copies of Spreading Season in Philippos uh, main deck, which is good in a matchup like that. Putting it on a on a bounce land, you know, could be nice. But at the same time, the opponent can also use another bounce land later to bring the card back back to their hand. So uh, it's not as good as as it is against something like Urzatron, for example. Uh -huh. Looks like we have the deck on the screen night on the screen. There out. you go. Yeah, we've got it for you. That's what we have bought this weekend. So we have got one Stone of the Erich, one Subtlety, uh, two Force Negations, two Hercules Recall. Hello. Uh, three Chalice of the Void, two Cursed Tome, uh, three sorry, Cursed Tome, and three Dismembers. Anything you like? I feel like Subtlety is the main one I'm looking at here. Yeah, also Forces uh, definitely coming in. You want to counter that uh, Amulet. You want to counter, you know, some of the, so, some of the packs uh, that they play. You can you can actually maybe even bring in the chalice like depending on how many cards you're you're boarding out, uh, you can have chalice and just bring it in and have it be uh all right I'm gonna counter your summoner specs you're running four summoner specs I have your deck list, I see these in your deck so I'm just gonna preemptively, uh play a chalice for zero and that that means you're not gonna be able to resolve a summoner spec. Right, I'm getting whispered in my ear that game two is started. So let's head down to the match and see who is going to be able to take down game number two. Is it going to be Amulet Titan? Is it going to be Merfolk? Let us know who you're rooting for in chat. Who do you want to be able to take us down? Do we want to go to a game three? I love game threes of Magic, especially at high level. And this is the highest level we can play in Europe. This is where we're going to be sending 24 players to the Pro Tour. And just the to cherry on top, two more players to the World Championships in Las Vegas, end of the year. Cannot wait for that, but we've got a whole year of magic before we get to that. Only one person in the world can currently say they are qualified for the World Championships, and that is our current World Champion, Jean-Manuel Dupra, who is in attendance this week. Did pick up the round one loss, obviously was on camera, had that little misfortune, but, uh, you know, I'm sure he's bouncing back and playing super, super strong with um, Yardmoth. This is what he chose. He also told me about the why why he he changed the art of the arbor uh arbor dried arbor dried arbor. Why could I think of that? Dried arbor. He swapped the art of it last second mm. with his friend, so he would remember to always have this one up front, and then still forgot. And uh, he was telling me about it. But here we are. Yeah, let's let's print the forest creature. There's nothing that that can <laughs> that can go wrong with that. Uh. What is it with French players in that card? That's what I'm saying. All right, we're starting off. We are. Uh, obviously, Merfolk will be on the play here, starting off with the wow. powerful Tide Shaper on turn number one. Turn one, Amulet, and no response for from Filippo, so no Force of Negation for him. And that's big. Like, uh, turn one, Amulet, that, that's the best start you can have with the with yep. the Amulet Titan deck, because that basically uh, allows you to combo off, that, that, that enables the whole, you know, bounce land. Uh, combo. There's no 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 uh, summer bloom anymore. Like that was even that was even crazier back then. If you if you went turn one amulet, turn two summer bloom, bounce land bounce land bounce land make six mana play a titan on on, on turn two. I'm just working on getting the uh, records on the screen for you all, so you can see what these uh, players are. They are both currently two and zero. Oh. All right, so tap to Laria. Yeah, we're going to swear that. We're from the chat. Grazer. Followed by a Vesuva, which I think copied the Minamo on Filippo's side. That's the one that gives it the ability to bounce target land, right? Or bounce itself. I think it untaps a legendary permanent. Oh, is it that one? Okay. Yeah, uh, Oboro is the one that you're thinking of, I think. Ah, uh, that's the one I'm thinking of. Yeah, yeah, to untap target legendary permanent. Not too many of them floating around over in the amulet side. We're going to go to blocks. Do you have some sort of Lord effect? No, you don't. So we're just going to take the three points of damage here because there's no islands on the other side. Now I'm tapping. Blue Blue needs something like an Urborg that would fit <laughs> super well into the Murfolk deck. Like, yeah, all your lands are, are, are that, islands now. I imagine that Mr. Nikachu would also agree with you massively That'd on that be cool. one. He's like, yeah, I want, to, I want something that I can play at no loss to me, but my opponent, all their lands are islands. I mean, black has it, green has uh, yeah, no, Maya. We're only probably a matter of time. Maybe they're slowly going to print the other three as well. All right, so there is a bounce land returning the Polaria to hand. In response to that, Jose is going to float three. He's going to find engin en engineered explosives, exactly what you said during sideboarding. Mm -hmm. And since there is two lords on the other side of the battlefield, uh, that would be pretty good at the moment. So I think Jose is also already playing it for two, using that 
Gruel Tour for red and green mana, but Hexcatcher yep, using so the ability. That just gives it the, the Murphy decks a, that extra interaction, that little bit of a, you know, resilience when you start playing against decks, casting spells that you can start throwing your creatures at them. Obviously, they have to pay the extra one. They're like four, mini four spikes. But now we've got four land on the battlefield. A couple cards in hand. Do need to apply more to the battlefield. Ideally, we'll be turning some of those lands into islands as well. But it's not great when you uh, spread and see something when they've got the ability to just bounce that land back mm. to the hand and it just falls off, right? So, Yeah, is actually making a great point. Because because of because of cards like flash fires, and boil, <laughs> and choke, printing a blue or white or board would probably be a little a little too wild. There's a, a really nice video of me. I think back in the Euro days, I'm like seven land. I go to like t gain myself an extra turn, and my opponent just in response boils me. I was like, Ugh. Mm. and talking about uh, taking extra turns and playing a primal turn is kind of like taking an extra turn. But I would kind of smell this. You know, my opponent passed the turn, four mana up. What could it be? Of course, it is a subtlety coming down. Deciding to keep that one on top. That's where we want it, we want it to sit. So that's a good chance that could come down next turn. We do have, I believe, five mana on the battlefield. So only one land drop away, plus with an amulet. There's always a lot of mana for coming in. This is going to be a hit for six points of damage. Ooh, maybe more. We're going to... Is this before blocks? I... I'm guessing it's before blocks. Yeah. Before blocks. So that's going to be one, yeah, two, three. Yeah, I think Filippo said, yeah, I'm, I'm going to attack with these three. Jose just went went to blocks, but Filippo said, you know what, wait a, wait a second before that. I'm I gonna... almost, I don't like that. And I'll, yeah, I'll tell you, you why. There's you could no use the reason. trickster to, the, to just tap yeah. the titan and yeah. Because it's a two turn clock no matter what. And, you know, if I can have that in my hand and my opponent plays something like a, a titan, and then go to give it haste. Great, I'm going to tap it in response. But here's a second. That could be costly uh, now. Yeah, second amulet. Or are we just showing strength that you know there's multiple? I've got multiple of them in hand. I just That's want to get more, yep. more on the battlefield. Certainly a possibility. Open deck list for both players. So we're going to know how many's in the deck. So we believe. know that we know that Jose has at least a Vesuva in his hand, so he can play that, return a bounce land float a bunch more mana so you can easily replay the titan and still have some mana left over generate some more mana with the with the titan triggers but yeah it depends on what filippo has in hand if he has another su subtlety if he has uh some other ways to but do something tricky we're under the gun here though right like we have to win this turn or find a way to not lose yeah in our next turn that could be something like the one ring but we don't have ways to generate uh, ways to draw cards. We've got to work with these three cards in our hand. One of them is a summoner's pack, one of them is a primary battalion, uh, and the others are lands, I think. So, how do we go about this? Can I one shot here? No, there's a blocker. Okay, can I get extra lands to. You know, I don't think we've got a blast zone or anything crazy like that, have we? Let me just check. Um, like, Radiant Fountain doesn't do much here. Two life isn't going to do too. But what if I get a, a Otawara? I'm about to an Otawara back to my hand. And then I'm able to, you know, use that in the turn. These are the, the, the lines where it comes really complicated for these amulet players. But if anyone can do it, I believe we're gonna be we're gonna see it from the, one of the masters of Titan. Lots of mana floating. We're up to seven mana now. Eight mana now. Yeah, Vesuva essentially generated four. And now the other two bounce lands generate four more. So that's a Titan with, I believe, two or three floating. Uh, well, we've got, yeah, it'll be two floating by the time this resolves, I believe. Which might just be, because we've got a Summoner's Pact in hand. So we're going to potentially have to pay for some four spike triggers, which might whittle down the battlefield enough. The Titan resolves, that's the most important part. So no subtlety from from Filippo. I think he's got one, land in, uh, one card in hand. Okay. Can't get good eyes on what it is. I guess it's not a tide binder because might have cast that in response to the uh, ETB. These are going to come in. They're going to untap twice. This is uh, <laughs> blowing my mind, but I love watching it. Hope you're all enjoying this as well, watching at home. So untap. Give it haste because we have a white and a, a red floating. Tap again, add more mana, untap this. 
generate more mana. Bounce this. We got free mana in this phase. Now we're casting the Summoner's Pact. While I've got free mana before I go to my next phase of combat so I don't lose this free mana. Do you want to sacrifice your board to make me pay extra? Well, I've got the extra mana for it. This is an absolutely masterclass line. I would not have seen this. I'm not this smart at all. This is a great line playing, so it has to resolve. They know there's five mana on the other side. I can't sack my board to stop that, which means whatever he finds here, there's a good chance it is going to be resolving. It is going to be a dried over listening grove, which now with... So that means we need to have a way to find the Valakut? <laughs> Question mark? <laughs> I'm not even... Yeah, uh, yeah, we don't know what's in Jose's hand, and you know, let's just let's just let him go through the motions, and we're gonna we're gonna tell you how it works. But I'm gonna let him make the decisions here. So, this is bef I don't know what's going on. Oh yeah, so the, well, the first one was the ETB trigger. This one's now the attack trigger. So this is where we get the Valakuts. Now this is gonna do do the triggers. Two triggers coming in. That's gonna be six damage. Remember, we still got a land drop for the turn, I think. Again, question mark. Every land can tap for every mana source. I wish I was this good at magic sometimes. Honestly, I'm like, I just would not see these lines. Double amulet triggers. We're going to untap twice to float a bit of mana. Untap again. So red, white is floating. Now tap this. Going to give the Titan a double strike. Was, was was there a Slayer Stronghold that I missed to just yeah, it's, actually get it, the... It's the it, fancy alternate art, full art, black and white one, I think. It's been bounced back to hand, but now. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, Slayer Stronghold and Boros Garrison is the usually the first two lands that you get uh, with the Titan trigger. That way you give the Titan haste, uh, but also because you just put a bounce land into, into play, you get to return one of those lands in hand, and there's all these... Triggers going on. I can put the Boris Garys in uh, the um, Slayer Stronghold. Hey, do you the... know what would have stopped this? A trickster. A trickster. <laughs> it's going to be pretty rough to read, uh, you know, watch this one back and feel like if I had that trickster in hand, I could have potentially stopped this crazy turn. I'm still not sure if that would. I don't know exactly how it works, but there you go. There's the awkward fist bump handshake, and that is Jose taking it down 2 and 0 oh to Amulet Titan. So well piloted. What an absolute masterclass. We're gonna go. We're gonna go across to our backup feature match where we have got Yargmoth versus Evoke. Uh, we're going to go down into game at number two. I'm being told I'm here, <laughs> and we've got Yargmoth. Okay, cool. Well, here's my favorite card, probably printed in the last couple of sets. Uh, Agatha's Soul Cauldron. Yeah, the card gives the deck so much redundancy. Uh, Honestly, you exile a Grist with this card, you just feel on top of the world. Yeah, it's so good. Yeah, uh, with Giovanni being on two lands here, looks like he actually just played the Black Castle. So there might have been some Fulminator Mages involved. Uh, perhaps Giovanni kept a hand that was kind of hoping uh, to, you know, do a lot with the with the Black Ley Line that I see being exiled on, on the bottom. And it looks like he didn't draw a lot of lands after that. This is rough. <laughs> <laughs> this is there's a lot of mana on one side. There's a Yagmoth, a lot of creatures, and uh, there's Axis Soul Cauldrons. I don't like one thing I've learned in the last year uh, in my casting journey is just cool games when they're over. Mm. With Fury not in the in the uh, meta anymore, this has got to be over. I can't I can't see it not being over. Here comes a Martin Collapse. It's going to take rid of uh, get rid of Yagmoth. And now we're going to just exile Yagmoth. And now all my creatures with plus one plus one counters are Yagmoths. Great, cheers. <laughs> it's like now I can still yeah. sacrifice everything. Uh, if we we have double, do we have? The, hold on, is that the grist underneath? No, no, that's not the grist. Grist is actually a grist. It's not underneath the soul cauldron. A lot on the battlefield right now. Fatal push left in hand. I think we are just like a yagmoth. No, a uh, an undying creature or a quarter cooling away from just being able to lock this one up here and now. So this is going to be the Yagmoth ability of sacrificing a creature, lose a life, give type creature minus one, minus one, and draw a card. So we just, well, we just shortcut it there. We did it twice with the young wolf. So we get rid of the plus one, plus one counter. 
because we put a minus one, minus one counter on it, which brings it back to zero. And then we sacrifice it again to get the plus one, plus one counter on it. Orcish Bowmaster comes down. That generates a Orc Mass token, which happens to have a plus one, plus one counter on it, which means now Alex's Soul Cauldron's abilities uh, for whatever is exiled from it now happen on the Orcish Bowmaster Orc Mass token. And uh, yeah, I don't know how we get back into this. This is a lot. Yeah, you. Oh, now I we're think the answer is you don't. Uh, now think, we're doing the yeah. um, the hidden mode of Yagmoth, which is the proliferate trigger. So the second part of Yagmoth, which you don't see too much, uh, it is pay two black, discard a black card, proliferate. And as we've got a lot of counters on a lot of things on our side, we can start ticking them up. It means that we can ultimate Grist to turn soon if we need to as well. And yeah, we're going to discard the fatal push again to get more counters and stuff. I think we'll, there's blood in the water right now. Everything's huge. One of my favorite things about oh, Agatha, turn. one of my favorite things about Agatha Soul Cauldron is how it turns Fulminator Mage in, into a very very oh. powerful sideboard card. All of a sudden, all your creatures can you know turn into Stone Rains, and that sometimes can win you a matchup like you know playing against Amulet Titan or or Tron. You know, something. that's thirteen points of damage coming across, and that is going to be the win for Alexander on the left of your screen there. G G's, that's pretty cool. That is pretty good thing. So I'm being told that we are, we can't get any more feature matches. That is going to be our last one for the round. But there's still more going on in the room. So I'm going to hit refresh on my screen here and tell you how many games are left in the room. And we're going to keep talking. So we're going to play, you know, we're going to start talking about different things that are happening this weekend. First off, I mean, tell me, we've got the meta breakdown. What everybody's waiting so for. Let's have a little look at what everybody brought this weekend. 980, well, 948 players. And what they bought this weekend. Let's get up on the screen. Let's have a little let's look see at this meta game. So this is the first time we're seeing yeah, that. First as well. time we're seeing it. I have no idea. So most played deck, Team Rhinos. 15%. Yesterday, Team Rhinos was the most played deck in the LCQ, and it was 13%. So it's it's, it's roughly the same. Uh perhaps, you know, a little bit, maybe a little bit of more of an experience field today. Uh and two extra percent. Team of Rhinos most played deck. So yeah, right now, Cascade, you know, one of the most popular strategies. Ragdos Grief second. That's kind of what I expected as well. A lot of my friends were telling me, yeah, I'm just playing Ragdos because it's the most solid deck. You know, it's it's you get to play Thoughtseize, you get to play Grief, you get to take a look at your opponent's hand a lot to see, you know, what 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 kind of deck are they on, uh, disrupt their their game plan. You get ac you get access to some really good powerful sideboard cards, Blood Moon, uh, Chalice of the Void, uh, Leyline of the Void. So. Ragda is just one of the most uh, solid decks in the field and something that I would probably play as well. Uh, Golgar, you have my third. That's interesting. I'm having, I feel like because uh, we had Gre uh, Fury got banned in the format, it's really ramped this up. Plus, we got the new tool of Agus' Soul Cauldron, which we've mm. just seen there. Going really like, you just saw that board state, right? Like, how good did that look? Everything. The thing going problem is it's got a really bad matchup versus Team of Rhinos. It used to be a real bad matchup against the Rakdos uh, Evoke decks. But because of things like Dolphy Void Walk it into Furies, it was like ugh, kind yeah. of rough. Modern is a is a format where you don't really care about matchups too much. You don't want to over prepare for one deck because there's 40 different decks that, that you can face. Uh, but there are some matchups in the field that, like you mentioned, Yav Mod not that great against Rhinos. At the same time, is it Merc Merc Tide? That is a deck that I just spoke to to Arne Hushinbet, who told me that yeah, I'm playing Merc Tide because I think it's one of the best decks against Rhinos. I do expect Rhinos to be the most played deck. Uh, I'm not just playing it because of that, because obviously there are all these other decks, but I like how, how Merc Tide plays out. I like the deck, and I like having a good matchup against the most popular deck in the field. So this is why why he's on on, on a Merc Tide list this weekend. Shout out to the uh, Heliod combo players turning up. Six of those. We need to try and see how they're doing. They uh, That deck is surprisingly good versus Yagmoth. You can't kill their creatures with Yagmoth if they're playing the Young Wolf version. You can't, yeah. Literally, you can't do it. So Something the chat's pointing out is white is not very well represented. And this is true. You get Team of Rhinos, you get Ragnar's Grief. So you have pretty much everything except for white. And I do agree that white could use like something mm -hmm. cool. Maybe Modern Horizons 3 is going to have, you know, some some new cool white card. So I suppose like Hammer Time is the main one, Mike. So Hammer Time, you could probably throw full color or Omnath into that because realistically it is kind of a, a blue-white deck it just has you know splashes for uh, colors for some of the more powerful cards because the mana base is so good in modern these days um because you've got things like leyline's binding solitude yeah um what else is in white is really good you've got obviously everything that's in it's hammer a time good support color but it's not a great main color like you have a lot of reasons to play all these other mm -hmm. colors yeah but white doesn't give you a great reason it's typically a color associated 
with maybe creature creature decks, uh, you know, Thalia comes to mind. These creature decks that perhaps are not super well positioned right now. You know, humans, thanks to Bowmasters, uh, Red yeah. N6, uh, and Fire Eyes, all these cards. Is there anything standing out to you here? Anything you think, whoa, I was not expecting someone to bring that this weekend? No, like a pretty typical modern metagame. 26 Domain Zoo decks. Uh, yeah, it's still, I guess the number seems high because there is almost a, a thousand players. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I think a little bit of everything. Maybe more Titan than we normally have. 8%. Yeah. I think, yeah, that's because of we have these old, these experienced players here. Uh, so that's per, that's perhaps why we're seeing a little bit more combo uh, than than normal. Hardened scales. Now that's another one that I think is a, it's kind of hard to pilot at times. Like it, it's easy when you get the easy sort of okay, that's where counters and stuff go. But other than that, it can uh, it can really just win out of nowhere. It is like the the new affinity, so to speak, right? Yeah, it's also a super hard deck to play. Oh, it turns out I completely lied to you, chat, and I apologize. And we've managed to find ourselves a, a backup feature match. So it looks like we're going to go into game three number here, where we're going to have. Four color Omnath versus uh, Team of Rhinos, which we'll definitely need to get those names changed so they uh, they look correct. Can we get the names changed on the uh, the deck lists? They're spelt wrong. Upper Productions on it, chat. We got you. You've got us, and we've got you. It's uh, it, we're gonna live in harmony here. But this is what like kind of how we do things. Maybe you you've watched some other tournaments in the past or older tournaments. So here uh, the. Uh, Legacy European Tour, we kind of do things slightly different. We start off with two feature matches in our feature match area. And then um, we go from, once one of these tables finishes, we then go out into the field of uh, players out there. Obviously, there's a lot of them this weekend. And we find players on the top tables that are during sideboarding. So then we move them across to our feature match area. So we can kind of give you that continuous uh, coverage of gameplay happening out there instead of giving you extra long breaks or something like that. We just want to give you the most amount of paper gameplay on camera we possibly can. Uh, a lot of, lot of stuff's got to happen behind there, but um, we make it work. We make it work. Can we just talk about these Steam vents? Like, do, do you see any Steam? Do you see any vents? <laughs> is, the, is that a little strange? <laughs> but anyways... I'm, I'm um, upgrading to my, uh, my old art stuff now. So Four, four Color Omnath is a deck that recently had one of its most perhaps iconic card a band which was up the beanstalk so now it's more of a you know maybe going back to to playing uh cards like bring to light which is what we saw yesterday uh perhaps going to a little bit more controlish of a deck which we also saw yesterday with i think one player also running something like a like a verdict in the main uh but i'm gonna take a quick look at Onto Nino's list, what he is running. I say, is there anything spicy in it? Well, I'm, I'm also going to try and get the, the deck lists up in front of us here. Okay, I got it here. You've got it? Cool. That's a. Uh... We need so a little bit of Onto Nino's deck, running right? the usual Ren and Six Teferi, Delight and Hallflame, Solitude, Omnath, Nissa, the One Ring, Leyline Binding, Prismatic Ending. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much a very typical Omnath list. There's a one copy of Fire Eyes, one Reprieve, one Lightning Bolt for a little bit of interaction. Uh, meanwhile, Eric is on Team Rhinos, also a very typical list. Uh, doesn't look like there is anything super out of the ordinary. One thing I do like in uh, open deckless tournaments is the ability to play one-offs and really get your opponent play. As long as you play around like you've got these one-offs, you're going to make your opponent play like you've got these one-offs in hand. So we see like a one-off Lightning Bolt, a one-off Fire and Ice, a one-off Reprieve on the Omnaf side. Free Nissa. Now that's one that... Um, in my experience, it isn't great in multiples, but you know I haven't done that much testing with this deck for, for this format uh, or for this tournament. Do you see Ren and Six making an appearance back? That's one that kind of fell out of favor a little bit, uh, but full four copies in this list, along with three copies of Omna. Not going up to four. So yeah, we're kind of sh trimming down on some of our four ofs to open up slots for these one ofs and trying to use that to our advantage in this open deckless tournament. Looks like both players already picked up a draw in one of the earlier rounds. So. I was about to say, is that a draw or a loss? Yeah, I mean... Let me I'm going to find out first. Yeah, this is a matchup that Antonino can't be too happy about because he has a lot of relatively expensive cards uh, that he needs to, you know, start playing on turns three or four. He does have Teferi, which is one of the best cards for the matchup. But as long as Teferi gets countered, which the Rhinos decks typically have Force of Negation, they have Mystical Dispute. As long as Teferi is on the battlefield, then Antonino has to tap out a lot 
and that that means that Eric can just use that window uh, to resolve one of his cascade cards. But if the game goes long, then Antonina can certainly, uh, you know, start getting his triggers from his Omnath and, you know, gaining some life back and, ma and make it really hard for Eric to uh, really pressure him if, if the only thing he has is two four fours. It's one thing that, like, I feel like a lot of players get joined to these Winos lists, right? It's because it's so consistent at what it does. It's got so much disruption, but yet still so consistent of doing what we're seeing here, cascading into a crashing foothills, which will give us two four four rhinos on the battlefield and they've got trample and a little look at how cyborg i saw a blood moon there definitely not playing around our own blood moon but i suppose we do have the basic forest in play that's the thing with open deck list also if you see your opponent having blood moon in their sideboard you typically want to you know start fetching basics early in the game so you don't just die to it but then does this take it to the next level like does it mean that if i'm the guy with blood moon am i just supposed to not bring it in because the best blood moon is the one my opponent plays around but i never have it Just a basic for turn, four mana, one ring, one ring ETBs. We've already worked about that, but it's not even going to get that far. We're going to discard, uh, exile this tie binder for our force of negation. That's going to exile it. And then the follow up is going to be a ley lines binding. Of course, six mana for that card, but uh, only really costs one when you've got all these different uh, basics in play or basic types in play. Domain. Fan of the, uh, I, I love the, I like the the flavor of domain, like how that mm. that's a mechanic in Magic yeah. now. I really, I do, I do enjoy that. It rewards uh, good deck building. Sorry. There's a mutable. We keep seeing these mutables in these uh, Team of Rhinos decks, and you might be thinking, why, why is this here? And Flame of Honor is one of the answers that you, it it really wants you to have a wizard in in place. So you can choose two modes. Well, Blood Moon looks like it resolved. We do have a couple of basics. So we've got a basic island and a basic forest. Ideally, we wanted that basic planes, though. That's the one that we could use to, uh, you know, play something like LA Lines Binding later on or um, his match ending to get it off the battlefield. So we're going to have to go kind of hope the top of our deck is nice to us and we do draw that basic planes. Only one of in the deck, so it's going to have to be really nice to us. Really six to play. Still cast that one. So we're going to return the fetch to hand. We're going to play that as a mountain. And that was a brutal blood moon. I'm looking at Antonino's end. I think I see two Omnats yeah. and a Solitude, but no White Source. So this pretty much locked Antonino out of playing anything relevant for the, for the time being. So that's going to be four life gains here for Eric. And living off the top of his deck. Oh, wow. Tapped okay. It. Eric is down to no cards. All right. That, that yeah. changes the situation quite a bit. Now, he does have the option of attacking Ren. He does go phase, though. And, yeah, went phase. That's... You know what I mean? You got to play to your outs. And this is it. The fact that Eric attacked so quickly without really giving it too much of a thought means that he already knew that he was going face and perhaps he already did the numbers and everything or that he drew violent outburst and he wanted to put uh antonino to 10 so that the, the attack would be lethal next turn well since Ren six not doing much right Ren six great when the non on the battlefield not so great just getting back him out in every turn exactly yeah like taking the next four turns to kill the planeswalker that isn't really doing anything uh at the moment uh that certainly doesn't sound all that appealing it's a very drawn for turn here's another fetch no targets, ticks up to six. No instants or sorceries in the graveyard. So even a Ren of Six ultimate right now would not be great. I see a gemstone cavern in hand here for Eric on the left of your screen. Starting not to deploy that one just yet. Kind of keeping some... Uh, there, there he comes on the battlefield. Another basic mountain. Looking for planes. One ring. That's Ooh, not a that's bad a one. one. That's a very good one. But it's like a double-edged weapon here. You are literally looking for your one outer... To get back in there. I suppose you can draw solitude to try and survive a little bit. But playing this, if you tap it, you're pitting yourself on a clock. ETB trigger. I'm going to gain protection from you for a turn. Ren's, right. Ren's at seven. Looking, looking for the uh, seventh number on the six-sided dice. Classic. We've all been there. Here comes the ring tapping. We draw another Teferi. Clock is definitely on now. Going to pass the turn back. 
So one thing also you might be thinking is, wow, what if your opponent has a lightning bolt here? You know, with Renan six, with Renan six being at seven counters, that threatening a very powerful ultimate. But this this being a game after sideboard, I probably wouldn't expect my Omnath opponent to to have a card like Lightning Bolt still in their deck for game three. This is huge. Nissa drawn. Nissa ETB can make a, tr a treasure token that can open up the source of mana we need. We've got the green source to play, but do we have a land to play afterwards? We're going to tap the ring, draw two in response. That's a Delighted Halfling and a Solitude. Solitude can also uh, deal with something on the battlefield, giving us a little bit more life if we want to target one of our own creatures or not. But I think the play is just going to be this Delighted Halfling. We got punch. We got, we got Mountain. Yes, Delighted Halfling will let us cast on that. But we're going to start off with this Nyssa. Do we, I don't think we've got a land, though, have we? No, we've got no land to follow up to get the trigger. There's no land in the battle, in the uh, graveyard. Maybe there's a chance that we should have uh, should have maybe left the ha uh, land in hand in case we had this sort of top deck. There isn't a screen for you at all. Subtlety discarding Lorien's revealed on the Nissa. Do we want to play at top or bottom? Working out where the ring's at two. You can attack me to two. We know about the solitude. So that's where it's going to come down now. Make sure we can play around um, another subtlety on the other side because there's only one card left in hand for Eric. Tick Ren up to six again. So now we've just got to worry about our own life total from our own w the one ring. Don't have to worry about lightning bolts and things like that from his Cascade decks. Obviously, well, you could you could play lightning bolts in his Cascade decks. Just uh, it's not advised. Yeah, it's just it's just going to destroy <laughs> yeah. your 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 deck basically. You get on Rift Bolt. Oh, hold on. So we've got, obviously, over on the Rhino side, we've got access to, like, Fire and Ice as a little bit of reach here, maybe. I can see one, a one-off Bone Crusher Giant, a Fable the Mirror Breaker. These are some cards we might want to try and find ASAP to try and close this game out. Yeah, also before Omnath starts gaining some life for Antonino. Oh, if Omnath comes down, I think that, 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 that that's almost going to be it. Too much, like, an Omnath with Ring Trigger. Because then we'll be able to generate the mana. We'll be able to try and get the Blood Moon off the battlefield, potentially. Here comes Nissa. Tick up Ren to, no, to seven again. We can't use the ring because we'll die. <laughs> wow, what a close game. It really, really is. What I'm trying to think, like, what's... Do I tap the ring to draw? I can't get the Nissa trigger this turn. So I think we have to pass the turn. Hope it lives. Untap. Tap the ring to get ourselves as much land as we possibly can in our hands. No, because we need a land trigger to get the token. To get the treasure token. I don't... I think yeah. maybe we had to start with the, with the halfling this turn. If we went delighted halfling, we could then go delighted halfling into Omnath, into draw, into get land to, draw, to gain four life. I think not playing halfling might cost the match. There's... Two life, two points of damage it done from the one ring. Land was drawn. There's the land ETB. Trigger Nissa. And it's the battlefield under your control. Add one mana of any color. Yeah, it, it gives you a mana the turn it comes to play, but uh, no treasure, unfortunately. Okay. So one ring. Okay, so now come. No, oh, my word. Wow. Oh, my word. Antonino probably super happy to have drawn that <laughs> fairy to reset the ring. Oh but there my is a word! Of That's GG's. That's game. That's game. Absolute. That's game. Okay, cool. What a roller coaster of of emotions you're but thinking. Wow, that was the one draw that I needed. Yeah, it's an empty handed. Oh wow, but my there is a yeah. My opponent's been empty handed this whole game, and they drew blue card plus subtlety, then blue card plus force negation. Okay, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's a there's a leyline binding. Is, is it, there it, is there white source? It. There's no white source. Is there is there a way? Because we, we used the white source um to play the Teferi. Yeah, no planes. We need a solitude to solitude our own Nissa to survive. Well, solitude plus white card, should I say? Yeah, it looks like Antonio's locked out. I don't yeah. see any. To, yeah, I don't see any plays available. G G's. Eric picks up My his second win. Congratulations. Word. Back and forth matchups, but I believe that is that that is the last game we've got production. Correct? There's no yes. more. There's no more games. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm going to do a little hit refresh on my uh, screen that tells me how many games are still playing out in there. I believe we've still got 
eight games left playing. One of them's got an eight-minute time extension, so that means that uh, yeah. you get to talk with us for a little bit. We can play a nice game called Ask Hall of Famer Martin User Any Questions. Get them in the chat, and I'll throw them to him. And, you know, maybe you want to know how to prepare, maybe what he'd play this weekend. Get him in the chat, and let's go. I used to play this game with, uh, with Matei. I'd be like, what cards would you want to see printed in Pioneer? In Pioneer? Yes, yeah, so well... chat, chat would tell me which cards. And I would play it to you, and you'd say too powerful. You say yes or no. Okay, okay. Too good for too good for Pioneer, or too bad for Pioneer. So okay. maybe we can go that way, chat. Let us know like, what cards do you think could be printed in Pioneer, or do you want to see in Pioneer? And I'll pass it to, to Martin. While you kind of start typing them out, though, I'm going to let you know what is happening this weekend. We are coming to the end of round number three here at the <laughs> Regional Championships of Europe, where we had 929 players battling it out to try and get themselves into day number two with a X and three record. Or better. Nine rounds of modern today for another six tomorrow. Then we're going to cut to that top eight where we're going to be sending 24 players to the Pro Tour here in Amsterdam. In Europe, cannot wait for that one at Magicon. But on top of it, two more players are going to find themselves going to the World Championships in Las Vegas. And then all the way down to 64th place are going to find their share of $100,000 cash prize. Not only do you get to play Halo Magic, you get to get paid for Halo Magic. Absolutely ideal. So let's have a little look. What questions have we got? Is Mr. Martin User? That's actually what I was going to say. Snapcaster was, I think, the most uh, most typed answer. I would like to see Snapcaster and Tarmogoyf in Pioneer because they're currently not being played in Modern. And I thought they were both, you know, they were very fun cards to play with. And the decks that typically played them were, you know, fun to play. So Snapcaster or Tarmogoyf would, would be my answers as what I would like to see printed in Pioneer. Well, or... Tell me if this, if I'll tell you a card, you tell me if it's too powerful or not. Goblin Guide. Isn't that legal? No, nope. it's not. Which, which uh, well, that depends. It depends on like, okay, how many how many good one drops are there? Would red be too powerful if this is this is this is a this is a great job for the for the game designers and the people that are keeping these? You're giving, me too, you're giving me too many answers. I need uh, yes or no's. I need yes or no's. We've got a lot to fly through. Yes I think it no. would be fine. I think it it, it, it would be fine. Yeah. Uh, Olivia Verdun. Verdun. I can't pronounce it. Bold Aaron. Yeah, yep. that, that'd be fine as well. Four mana. That that that's a lot. Uh, Dark Confidant. Uh, that is legal in standard, I think. Mr. Frank Carson wants to know gifts ungiven. Gifts ungiven? Uh, fine. Expensive. Amulet of Vigor. Uh, too powerful, probably. Follow up Primary Titan. Although I'm not sure if Bounce Lines are, are there. What, what, what was the next one? Uh, Primary Titan. Primeval Titan? Uh, yeah, depends on if, depends if Bounce Lands are in the format. They I are think, not. I think it would, it might lead to, uh, I guess, it would be a way to get Lotus Fields. I think people would find ways uh, to, yeah. to make Lotus Field even better. I, I would say, let's keep Primeval Titan off, off of uh, Pioneer for now. Lightning Bolt? Lightning Bolt, I think, would be okay. Restoration Angel? Okay. Faithless Looting? Uh, no. Bad things happen when Faithless Looting is legal <laughs> in any format. So. Uh, Aether Vile? Uh, I think Vile would be fine, and I would enjoy having that in the format. I think it would maybe... Uh, let us see more creature decks. Kiki Jiki. Expensive. Fine. Uh, Goblin Matron. Uh, also fine. Three mana. Yeah, that's fine. Goblin Grave Troll. Gugari Grave Troll. Gugari, yeah, I would rather not. <laughs> Counter spell. Come on, chat. Come Counter spell. On. Even though it, you see, there's a new promo got released yesterday that for the Magicon uh, in Amsterdam. If you, I think if I you turn up or play, or no, there's a there's a fill up counter spell. Okay. Like it looks, it looks really nice. I like the art of it. I saw that. I saw yesterday that they released that. There's a source, source of plow shares mm -hmm. for all the people at the Magic On. If you, I think, if you uh, purchase something at the store, yeah. you're gonna get that that source of plow shares. It's like so what Relentless Rats was for the last season. Okay. So this season, I think it's. it's and the counter spell budget. is just like, uh, if you just come through the door, uh, you yeah, get. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's, that's what cool. it is. I mean, you'll that's get, really get cool. one in your yeah. bag. I hope uh, it's the one with the, with the old art. No, 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 no. no. It's completely new art. Completely okay. New art. Uh, Eternal Witness. Uh, fine. Uh, I think that. Counterspell would be too powerful for, for what it's worth. Chase the Mind Sculptor. Uh, well, these days, we have the One Ring. <laughs> so in Modern, I don't think we're going to see too many Jaces because the One Ring is just better. Uh, but in Pioneer, I think I, we could maybe give it a try. I think it might be too powerful, but I would like to see it. I think it's cool. Treetop Village. Throwback. Perfectly fine. Perfectly. Yeah, Treetop Village. You can have all of them. I feel like we're getting trolled now. Hodak? Which card? Holdak. Oh, Holdak? Yeah. yeah, let's rather Yeah, not. let's just skip that one. We don't want that one. No. Uh, Path to Exile. Uh, yeah, fine. Ephemerate. 
Uh, ephemerate's fine because I don't think there are. Well, I guess yeah. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass on that answer because I'm <laughs> I'm not sure what you know what are the enter the battlefields crazy cards. If you have like Mold Drifter, that's fine. If there is something like Grief, yeah, then people are not gonna want to play against that. So yeah. Okay, this the the age old question. Splinter Twin. No, no. <laughs> I think Splinter Twin would be fine for modern, but I know that people hate playing against it. Even though I think there is a lot of counterplay to it. We have Force of Negation now. We have all these. I mean, Force of Vigor is a thing. Yeah, yeah. There's a but million different ways to to protect yourself from the combo. But for some reason, I think too many people would still hate losing against Twin. So, uh, Hunt Master of the Fell, definitely fine. I like that card a lot. Yeah. That's, uh, back to the photos. Uh, Price of Progress. I would enjoy having Price of Progress both in modern and in pioneer let's just punish the people with these greedy mana bases <laughs> you, you, you want to start on a shock land triumph fetch land you know do all that to, and be a 10 life yeah let me just price of progress you out of the game uh Arcbound ravenger uh probably fine i'm not saying guys cradle uh, we all know the answer <laughs> yeah. to that one um bar seek fine do you like the idea of basically turning Pioneer into the old 2014 extended. modern? Yeah, or yeah, yeah. I think that's kind of where it's heading anyway, right? Who knows what's 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 gonna what's gonna be printed in Modern Horizon Three? Uh, certainly, there there's been a lot of power creep in Modern in the yes. last couple of years. Uh, I think I think it's for it's it's there are some good things about it too, uh, like having cards like Force of Negation. I think is is a good thing for the format. You get to protect from all these, you get to protect yourself from all these shenanigans. Like previously, you play against Tron. They had turn three car and, and you're like, well, there's nothing I can do. I'm yeah. not playing Thoughtseize. You know, what am I going to do? Now you can at least run all these cards like Force of Negation. So uh, I like when there is good answers in the format. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the power of, of everything has been going up, both answers and the threats. So do you know what I want to see in Modern Horizons 3? Uh, something with Infect. <laughs> Come on. Oh, yes. Yes. That is what I want. Give me some. For me. I would love to see Legolas's. Um... Reflexes or whatever it's in legacy. Anyway, um, I was what I was going to say is to really like you know for a span in the works, two colored evoke elementals. How about can I select to you maybe a you black mean, blue yeah. one like this, you know not only oh, do you grief your opponent but okay. you could also solitude at the same time. Maybe, yeah, uh, imagine maybe, how powerful they would be. Maybe not. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Have like a dual colored uh, elementals. I imagine it's probably on the radar. They've probably tested it. If we see it or not, we don't know. But that's one good thing about the this Pro Tour that we qualify everybody for this weekend. Because it will be Pro Tour Amsterdam. That's the Pro Tour where Modern Horizons 3 is going to be legal. That will be the draft format in that. And then we'll get to see a whole, maybe array of decks. We know how much damage. Nope, damage is the wrong word. How much changed happened for Modern Horizons 2? So, you know, maybe yeah, it completely changed the whole modern format. Decks, decks that were tier one completely aren't decks anymore. They've dropped down to tier three. We've got now new, more innovative decks using more of these new powerful cards. If, if Modern Horizons 3 has a split card Grief Mall Drifter, then, uh, yeah, I think, I think uh, <laughs> that probably wouldn't be a good card for the format. Let's have a little check how many are left in the round. It looks like there are still three matches playing, so it's fine. We can uh, keep going. What's chat saying on it? Uh, <laughs> damage, what's the right word? Um, oh, do you know what? Just, 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 uh, this has got nothing to do with modern, but I just want to talk about it. Lightning Helix is now in Pioneer. I'm quite happy about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think it's going to change anything, but I just really like think that that's a good card to be in, in, in Pioneer. I'm sure a lot of people still remember that, that iconic moment, Lightning Helix off the top for, for Craig Jones. Fellow Englishman, fellow Englishman, you know what I mean? He's, uh, it is iconic. Did you ever have any of the big iconic moments in your past? You uh, must have had some I, like, big My iconic camera. moment was realizing that when I was building my zoo deck for the for one of the Pro Tours, I was thinking, what am I going to put my sideboard uh, against these graveyard decks? Should it be Jailer? Should it be Tormod Script? Should it be uh, Revenous Trap? I'm just going to play one of each. And my iconic moment is sitting in the top eight uh, of the quarterfinals uh, being two and two against a dredge deck and drawing a revenous trap when I have get deck in play and not being able to play it and losing the game because of that. So that is my, my iconic mo mo moment. Deck building 101. Deck, deck building 101. <laughs> yeah. That also tells you how much, how much different magic is these days. Like today, nobody shows up with a bad deck or like, you know, with something that doesn't really make sense. Like back in the days, we we're just like, Hey, I like these cards. I like zoo. You know, it's a cool deck. I'm going to play Gaia Smite and a bunch of one drops. I'm gonna, you know, try to aggro people out, and I'm gonna put these cards in my sideboard. They look cool. It's really interesting that how just magic in general has evolved along with the internet, right? And that, that's why back in your day, I say back in your day, like back in your day, old timer, yeah. uh, you used to actually, you, you, it was you and your testing team, and you're kind of working out 
hoping you've you've solved the matter. Now with streamers and sites, you know, the matter so gets solved data, almost instantly. Yeah. All it's these just articles and so much content and yeah, people streaming Magic Online, Magic Arena. So many games are being played. You know, if if a new set comes out in the first three days, there's a there's a million games be, being played. So. Yeah, it's it's a different world now. Lots of information, super easily available, and also like easier ways to practice, get uh, digest content, and and get some data and everything. How so. did that affect uh, your game? Because obviously you were playing before the like online clients, and then you know, they came along as you started playing. How did you feel that your game plan changed, or your 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 game in fact changed? I've been able to play you know, test against your mates' kitchen table to playing online. And you know, evolving from that, obviously, it went well because you got I a whole of fame. But... There was something to both eras. Like I, I enjoy playing on Magic Online. I, I enjoyed the, you know, how easy it is to fire off an arena open at, yeah. at home. I don't have to leave my house. I can still hang out, you know, with my family. But also, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm gonna leave for an hour or two to play on my computer. But then I'll just come back uh, without having to travel something away for the weekend. So I, I enjoyed the, the time now where it's a lot more, you know, accessible to play the game online, a lot more data and, and everything. Uh, but back in the days, I also enjoyed the, you know, the traveling part of the, of yeah. the, of the Pro Tour, for example. That's the, I don't ever want to get away from is the gathering part, right? Like I, I love coming to these big events, I get to meet so many people, plus someone want friends turn up. It's just an awesome weekend. You get to go afterwards. You can hear either the good, the bad beat stories or the, the congratulation stories, depending on, you know, how it's going to go and what days they're going. It's just, it's just what I love about magic, high level magic, plus meeting everybody at these events. Also my audio books. It's like now I'm getting older. I've got into audio books. So when we're traveling, I listen to a lot of audio books now, but uh, here we are. I believe that is going to be the it for the end of round number three. We'll be back shortly with round number four for more modern action. We're going to get Philip and Philippa back in the booth, so make sure you don't go away, and we'll see you soon.
Welcome back to the Legacy European Tour. We are here at the Regional Championship in Ghent and we are very excited to start round four. Nine rounds today, we are already at three completed, two thirds of the way to go and uh, six and three and better make it into the day two. Tomorrow there are six rounds and then a cut to top eight. Top 24 qualifies for the Pro Tour and first and second place gets an invitation to the World Championship, the biggest event of the year. Can we take a look at the most played cards here Ooh. this weekend? We've got such spicy stats. And we there do. we go. Ooh, <laughs> at number one, we have Orkish Bowmasters. What do you think of Bowmasters being the most played card here in the regional championship. Yeah, I'm not really surprised. This card is just so good because it both punishes the lower to the ground decks, for example, by killing their creatures, Ragavan, you know, Dragon Race Channeler, but also punishes the bigger decks who play, for example, the one ring, right? Because you go one ring, Bowmasters, and shoot you to death. So I am really not surprised by Orkish Bowmasters at number one. And <laughs> Misty Rainforest, number two. Well, <laughs> that's not, not much info there. And then we've got Ragavan, Boseju, Forest, a lot of lands, and Subtlety, right? Subtlety and Chalice are the next ones in the line. So it's not, these are not the commonly played um, main deck cards that you would think would be in the top. But yeah, Subtlety and Chalice uh, to combat Titan and to combat Cascade. Interesting. A lot of cards here. Uh, we see Tishana's Tidebinder uh, still make it into our top of the most played cards. This card is very new from Lost Caverns of Ixalan, and it has entered to counter a lot of abilities. Uh, it works well in a lot of decks. We also have something like um, Shardless Agent, Violent Outburst, for those Cascade decks here, making it into the most popular, which makes sense because I think Rhinos was the first or the second most played deck here this yeah, weekend. Yeah, probably first, yeah. Uh, we also see, for example, Busejo being played more than Forest. Yeah, that's true. That is true. Uh, that's a very interesting stat as well. Um, I think this could be a very informative piece of data when you want to construct your deck or even choose the deck because you, you can literally say, I know I will be playing against Bowmasters, Ragavan, Boseju, Subtlety Chalice, right? Yeah. Um, and we see cards like Engineering Explosives, and that's because this data is based on the cards included in all mainboard and also sideboard. So it's the... Uh, both of them together here, the most played cards. So we see some sideboard inclusions and we have our match ready to start. And it's a very nice one. I know you're a fan of Breach. So we are bringing Jeskai Breach here. Uh, 2 0 and 1. We have Jari playing this deck versus Lesna Iliad. So two combo decks. How do you think this matchup works? Yeah, not a common matchup. Uh, even if you play Heliot or even if you play Breach, you probably have not played them against each other. Uh, they are two pretty niche decks, and they are both, as, as you said, 2 0 and 1 right now. Mm, I could not resist the urge of putting bri uh, Grinding Station Breach on camera. Um, I do think Breach is favored here for a lot of reasons, and, but the main, main reason is that Heliot's combo does not beat Breach's combo. Uh, if Breach combos first, they win. If Heliot combos first, then Breach can still win after that. And how can Breach uh, win versus an infinite life gain combo? Yeah, exactly. Celestia Heliot gains infinite life. We have to choose an arbitrary large number. It's not literally infinite. So let's say it's, uh, no, 5 million, right? We choose 5 million. But then Breach untaps and plays, their, plays out their combo, which I will explain the moment it's relevant. Uh, finish it up with Thassa's Oracle, and it doesn't care about the opposing life total, board state protections. You just win straight up. So we have here uh, Jerry already with a bubble, already preordained. And what is this card? Manuel is playing. Yeah, Manuel is playing a creature that gains you a lot of life, or your champion, uh, which was much, much more popular in the past. Now, not so much. It's a really good choice if you expect um, Ragdos Grief. Protection from black and red. Ragdos literally cannot get rid of it. Yeah, so now we're bobbling. And just drawing cards. So Yari has got much more card selection. So he can adjust what he draws. Manuel is at the mercy of how the cards fall. Uh, 
Oh. And oh, yeah. Fetching, considering that. I see Teferi in hand. Yeah, Teferi, uh, Mishra's research desk, which is a an uncommon choice within that uncommon deck. I've played this deck for like a, I don't know, a year and a half, and yeah, it's not very popular. The main reason why people don't play Mishra's research desk is because of this inherent risk of the fact that if you crack it and you exile Thassa's Oracle, you basically have to play it, otherwise you don't have a win con anymore. I mean, this win con anymore. So there is a bit of a um, well, risk. Okay. And then if you play it, you can always the fairy bounce it back to your hand, and then you have your win con back. Yeah. So this is what, like, from the manuals perspective, it's so unfortunate because out of all the decks you could possibly play against, this is probably the only one that doesn't care about infinite life. Like, like every every other deck would, but this doesn't. But this is modern, right? You 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 will play against these, you know, tier three pet decks that people have mastered. And I talked to Yari actually, and he said he's been playing this deck yeah for for well over a year, and this is his comfort zone. We are attacking there, starting to do some damage. I uh, can see people in chat listing decks that can beat infinite life. Yeah, you're right. A lot of a lot of infect possibilities uh, within there. Yeah, yes, for example, scales. And we see there Trilla Sara Moon Dancer entering the <laughs> battlefield. Whenever yeah. you gain life, you're going to put a plus one plus one on it and scry one. So a lot of counters can start entering the battlefield. End step, uh, end step crack Mishra's research desk, and we see Underworld Breach Island. Uh, that's actually, that's actually not great because if you want to play Teferi, you need to play a land from hand. Uh, this is not a breach situation unless you want to just draw one with Mishra's bubble. That's a pretty bad hit. That's a pretty bad hit. And we see here Jari considering. And we have that <laughs> island there. Okay, they're, they're probably talking about some um, mannerisms of how to indicate that something is happening. As long as both players agree on what indicates what, uh, it's all good. Uh, and we begin with double preordain, I see. So a lot of card selection for, for Breach. Um, for the Breach fans, I can say that this is a non, non Ragavan list, zero Ragavans in the uh, in the shell, which is interesting, but makes sense when you know you will run into Orcish Bowmasters a lot, and we know you will. Um, and have, what yeah. does this deck bring in replacement for the Ragavans? Yeah, I, I think the cantrips are are the, are the big ones. So you, you have space to play cards like. Then you have space to add maybe prismatic ending and have more interaction. You have space to go up to four Teferi. There's also a classic dilemma of how many grinding stations to play, and I have seen any number from between uh, one, two, and three. And here you have space to actually genuinely play uh, three. Prismatic ending. Oh, so we're not playing the island. Yeah, so as I said, that hit of, of Mishra's research desk uh, was pretty lackluster. And we are drawing here. The Moon Dancer is out of the battlefield. That card can be really strong, getting a lot of counters soon, especially when there's the Ariok on the battlefield as well. Yeah, or Ariok Champion, unfortunately for for Manuel, doesn't uh, doesn't provide much of a clock. Now it attacks for two, which isn't a, which isn't much, but, and that's still when you tap your land. Uh, we're fetching Flooded Strand, so a white fetch. Shock this one in. Manuel doesn't have to be really concerned about his own life total here. Can easily fetch shock as many times he prefers. Three mana. Spike a feeder. So we're slowly, slowly mm, assembling the combo. What other cards does Manuel need here to combo? Yeah, so spike feeder can gain you life whenever it removes a counter and it does it for free. Uh, when you combo it with Heliod, which grants counters for life, 
you can basically gain as much life as you need. Why is there an island exiled? Excellent question. It was shown with Mishra's research desk and wasn't played. And so he stayed in exile. Same with Breach that's underneath. And we see Emery, Mishra's bubble in Jari's hand, two mocks, Mbar. We have a lot of options here. This deck is not easy to play, and you know it better than anyone because you are a breach expert. Does this deck encounter a lot of lines, um, especially against these other more combo decks as well? Oh, th this is one of the most interesting decks I've ever played. And I don't want to say, no, it's hard and just to brag about the difficulty, but it's really complicated, especially when you've got non-deterministic lines. Mm, a lot of a lot of sequences, a lot of game actions per turn, especially in this lower to the ground build where you don't even play the one ring, more card trips, more card selection. So, um, yeah, it, it takes a lot to master. So I'm not surprised that Yari plays this after a year of practice, especially that it has become his his comfort zone. Not a deck I would suggest ever picking up and playing. And we see here the fairy being played. We also have um, the Mox Amber and Emery Lurker of the Lodge. What is the Emery's role here in this deck? Oh, oh don't get me started. Emery, oh, Emery does so much. So first of all, provides card advantage by looping Mishra's bubbles. Second, it can ramp you when you go up, when you can play Mox Amber off of it. Two, three, it provides mana off of Mox Amber because it's a legend. Four, it mills cards so it fuels Breach. On top of that, you can manually win by looping Emrys and Mox Ambers, and then win with Thassa's Oracle when you don't have Grinding Station. Also, when you start comboing off, you can you can uh, recast a couple of Emrys to get into the deck, and potentially find Station, because crucially, it mills four, but just requires three to escape. And I could just continue. You can loop it with the One Ring or Aether Spellbomb. The list literally doesn't stop. And that the fairy is now... Uh, off the board, it did some work. It minus returned the Oriok champion into end, drew a card, uh, but now it is gone. We have Agatha Soul Cauldron. This card has been really interesting, uh, plays in a lot of decks, uh, plays in Arden Scale, as well as Yadmoth decks. Okay, fetch. fetch. Nice. And it is back on the battlefield, the Oriok champion. That was bounced by the fairy. And looks like Jari is going to end up here having uh, Mox Amber, Emery. There's another Mox Amber in end alongside other cards. There's another um, Emery. There's a Breach. There's an Oli Eat as well. Yeah, so. This is an interesting spot because we might see some win action, but that depends how it all it's all sequenced. Because Agatha, Agatha Souls Cauldron isn't really a disruption piece because it's like a mass graveyard deck, so any one card doesn't really matter. However, in this particular spot, it can exile Grinding Station, so Breach doesn't win. Also, it can exile Thassa's Oracle in the right spot, which literally makes uh, Yari unable to win. So you have to be really careful. Agatha Souls Cauldron a card that incidentally made the deck a bit worse. And I think it requires an addition of Teferi and or Prismatic Ending. I saw one comment that these are two decks that just go past each other. They don't even interact. But actually, we have not seen it, but the Jeskai list has got four Teferi as interaction, uh, one Pyrite Spellbomb, has two endings, four Unholy Heats, and double Spellbeers. That's like 15 interaction. So we haven't seen it, but there's a ton of it. And we see there the breach being played by Jari. Uh, and Underworld Breach is one of the cards that yep. uh, makes this deck and allows you to combo. We see here Manuel using the Agatha Soul Cauldron to start exiling some key pieces as well. Yeah, it exiled Station. So in theory, that's not a win. So I think y Yari can go a couple of routes. Route number one. He can play another Emery and then the, the first Emery and then the, the second Emery and just do it, let's say, a couple of times to try to find Station, mill into it. Or 
he can play a value bridge uh, by playing, you know, Mishra's Bubble five times, but he does opt for the, the Emery line, and he did hit Grinding Station. That's a classic sequence. Mill into Station with Emery's, play Station, and then win from that position, I think. And now, how do we win. win? Yes, yes. So, so while players are shuffling up and sideboarding, let me explain what happened here in detail. So, the way I like to explain this combo is to work backwards from the end point. So, the end point is Thassa's Oracle with an empty deck. That's a win. That's clear. In order to accomplish an empty deck, you have to mill yourself. Grinding Station, when you sacrifice an artifact, mills you for three. Okay, so if you keep can keep casting artifacts, you can keep using Grinding Station and mill yourself out. How to accomplish it? Well, Gr Underworld Breach is a card that allows you to escape any card by paying its cost in the top right and exiling three cards. So if you play a zero, right? and exile three cards, you can keep doing this. Conveniently, Grinding Station mills you for three, and Breach requires three to be exiled, right? And so, in short, with a zero, you can keep replaying the same zero, milling yourself, end up with an empty deck, and then win with Oracle. Now, there are a lot of caveats, there are a lot of spots where something is enough, something, something isn't, but uh, that's roughly how it works. I hope I, ex I have explained it well enough. You did explain it great indeed. Um, and now I have a question for you. How Manuel can disrupt this strong combo? Is there any graveyard removal that can be played from uh, this side? Yeah, so let's take a look at Manuel Ferraro decklist, uh, who's, I think, on the back foot in this matchup, because again, his decklist, his deck can't do its thing and win. But we have Agatha Soul Cauldron, as I said, it can exile a key piece like maybe an Oracle out of nowhere, or maybe this grinding station. I can see the One Ring, which is, by the way, very interesting inclusion in the strategy, but it doesn't accomplish anything. Um, we've got, let me look, Walking Ballista to kill Emery, but a skilled station player will be able to win through a removal, and that's maybe a popular misconception. You need a Legend to win, but... Again, killing that Legend mid combo won't accomplish much. In the sideboard, though, we see Dranith Magistrate. And boy, is that annoying. Your opponents cannot cast spells from anywhere other than their hands. This just single handedly shut off, shuts off bridge. all the bridge combo. But it also actually shuts, shuts off iteration. And it also shuts off Emery. So it's, it's three cards that it shuts off. It's really annoying to deal, deal with. Force of Vigor is good, Endurance is good, Skyglaive Apparition is good, uh, Dumping Sphere is decent. Um, we can bet if Manuel sides in 15 or not. <laughs> I mean, or something like 13. Like Maybe EE can stay in the board, but I could really see 13 cards sided in here. And on the other side, how do you think the Jeskai Breach player is going to approach this game too? Is there any sideboard cards that are relevant that can enter in this game? Yeah, so now, both players know the deck lists. So Yari, as the Jeskai player, knows that Manuel can side in 13 cards, right? And he will be highly disrupted compared to this game. Um, so what he can do is approach it from a more control angle, right? Because if you want to bring in 13, you have to cut 13. So probably Manuel is going to be watering down his main plan. He will have less life because he won't have so much life gain in the combo. So maybe you can actually win with, you know, Saga token attacks, Teferi as disruption, uh, because Teferi is going to, to, to shine. Uh, when it comes to the sideboard, Prismatic Ending looks good. Um, Wete uh, Agat against Agatha Soul Cauldron and Dumping Sphere. That's a good one. Mm, Lightning Bolt drawn against Granith Magistrate. Uh, Pithing Needle, maybe. So there are options. I think the sideboarded games are going to be very interesting because both decks will be playing just, just differently because of the amount of interaction. I'm very curious here to see what our players decide to do and how they decide to sideboard and if indeed we are going to see 15 or 13 cards entering from the sideboard here um, on our on our Iliad combo player side. Let's take a look here at our players that should be getting started to play here game two. And it looks like they're already shuffling in. Yeah, they're already shuffling in.
Uh, there is a possibility that Yari cuts, cuts the combo or trims the combo. There is a popular play pattern when you cut uh, four breaches uh, down to three, three stations down to one, and keep one Oracle, uh, and trim Mox Ambers down to one, and you just keep the package minimal. So, yeah, that, that, that's another way to do it. We will see here now Manuel on the plate. Yeah. Starting here this game two. And let's take a look here at the opening ends. I see a couple of lands. I see Breach in Jari's hand. But I think it was mainly lands and Breach. I couldn't see much more than that. So not good enough. And taking a Mulligan here. How aggressive do you need to be with the Mulligan in playing the Jeskai Breach? That's a good question. So this deck can very easily dominate games off of a like a CV mulligan when you have for let's say double bobble emery land keep four and you can go this deck recoups cards very easily but if it's disrupted early after such mulligans then it can really have problems um now i can see this hand it's like saga oh, for, oh that's a great example actually saga land spells if you miss on the third land you've lost, essentially. If you hit the third land, it's a really good hand. So... And this is already a mole. Yeah, it's already a mole, yeah. It looks like Jerry here is considering to keep it, and he's going to keep it. And Manuel plays land go. We see here Jerry playing Mishra's bubble. Yep. Land. Bubbling himself to know if he wants to fetch or not yeah that's a classic uh, bubble trick we call it bubble basically acting like a zero mana opt here taking the decision and there is a land of to on the top so yeah we keep that We see here Damping Sphere, one of those sideboard cards we talked about. How can Damping Sphere here uh, ruin Jerry's <laughs> plan? So, uh, I have a problem with this. Um, with this, a problem with the sequence. Damping Sphere is very good against shutting down the combo because you can't keep looping spells. It's really average against Yari not comboing off, because he will play one spell a turn anyways. Um, so, currently, it does nothing. Or it doesn't do anything. But it can pay off a bit later. So Manuel is spending his first turn, with, where, when there is no pressure, on deploying it. And then he'll probably bug this up with pressure. But his hand could be you know, purely reactive with maybe, you know, dumping spheres, Skycliffe Apparition, Endurance at which point it wouldn't do much. Now we see Grinding Station. Next turn we might see Constructs. Maybe Teferi bounce the Sphere. A single Sphere can be very easily dealt with. We also see Teferi on Jerry's side. That's a way to bounce back the Dumping Sphere yeah. later on the game. Yeah, we also don't see any Ledger Shredder in the Breach list, which was the standard back in the day. Then it stopped being relevant. But it's also a great way to filter out, for example, these uh, dead, for example, breaches or, or, or stations. Uh, now we see Ranger of Eos, which is another disgusting <laughs> disruption piece. Because, oh my god. Ugh. Your Ooh. opponents, you can sacrifice oh. it and your opponents can cast non-creature spells this turn. That was vicious. So the sequence was Ranger, find a green card, then pitch that to false, destroy your land, destroy grinding station, which was sacrifice and melt free. You still have the Ranger. The Ranger can pop in response to breach at any point. Oh, this is a very good spot for Manuel. And three mana here. Iliad is on the battlefield. Oh la la. Land and go. Land of the top. 
isn't. No land. There's uh, unholy heat, though. Uh, unholy heat is the delirium artifact land instant enchantment. Saga is so good against um, at turning on delirium. And we see here Jari taking a look at that Iliad. And just say go. Manuel is going to draw. Yeah, very tough spot for Yari. Game one, I think, was is, yeah, firmly favored for Jessica Bridge, but game two and three, uphill battle. Attacking here for three damage. And we have that an Olid in response. Manuel deciding and just letting that resolve. And go. We have only two mana uh, there. Mistra's research desk is one way to try to hit your land drops. Well, Manuel doesn't have pressure, so... Yeah, three breaches in end. In Emery and Teferi. Well, with no pressure on Manuel's side, I mean, we, we, we're okay. We can keep playing this game. Manuel's hand could be like purely reactive, as I as I said earlier. Could be no more force of Vega. Could be more endurance. And a very popular criticism against just Skybridge is a statement that every type of effect is good at it, good against it. Creature removal, graveyard hate, enchantment hate, artifact hate, uh, multiple spells played hate. Uh, so just, just so, so much. But the truth is, having played the deck a lot, is yes, everything is kind of good against you, but it's not always good against you. And so in this spot, if there is like Skyclave, you know, Force of Vigor in hand, Yari doesn't really care. And Teferi is a great way to protect you from anything. I'm, I'm really not surprised a lot of people now play, you know, quadruple Teferi. Okay. And Solitude in response, probably probably bounced. Um, yeah, bouncing that Solitude, and drawing a card. Uh, I'm really tempted to say I like Yeri's position. Mox Ember. Uh, you pay one more because of Dumping Sphere, so he remembers everything. That's good. I really like Yeri's position now. Manuel Actually. here and tapping, drawing. Huh. Curious game because a couple of turns ago we would think Yari didn't really have, have a good way. chance here, yeah. And now kind of turning tables, but <sighs> ballista. Yeah. So <laughs> speaking of turning the tables, so I thought Yari was in a pretty disposition, but what happened? What happened? Let me explain what happened. Walking ballista. Uh, has counters on it, right? And you can shoot. Okay, that's step one. Heliot can grant lifelink to any creature. And, as explained earlier, if a creature gains life, you can put a counter on any creature. And when you combine all of that, you put a ballista, you give it lifelink, it shoots, it deals lifelink damage, so it gets another counter from Heliot. So, in short, you've got infinite damage out of nowhere, which did li literally just happened. Infinite well, damage out of nowhere. And if Yari does have some ways to combat infinite lifelink, um, he has no ways to combat infinite damage. Yeah. That was game two. Both players have one win here. How are we going to approach this game three with Yari now on the play? Yeah, there is a there is a classic approach of being more offensive on the play, more defensive on the draw. But I'm not sure Yari has the tools to kind of switch it up or try to switch it up. I think he'll remain as he is and... Oh, but maybe not? Well, let's see. Oh, oh well, I, that was preordained. Maybe spell piece? I think I saw a blue card pulled there. EE? -E. Cut Emery. Interesting. Oh, where are and tear not sided in? Very curious to see here the 
sideboard choices of our players. Don't forget, this is the regional championship. We are in Ghent. The format is modern. There are nine rounds today on day one. Players that have uh, six wins or more advance into day two. Uh, this is currently the round number four. These players are 2-0-1. Oh, and one. and uh, in a very important round here, both of the players really want to win. Definitely do not want to lose or draw because one draw is uh, already not great, but the second draw would be crucial. Although they still have 23 ma minutes left for the game. Yeah, plenty, plenty and plenty of time for, for, for a single game. So I'm not worried that, that they will finish in time, especially as this is the strength of decks with some kind of combo baked in. You can always finish it out of nowhere. So there is uh, less of a chance that uh, you will need to go to time. And it is the case here. And we see here players shuffling in and getting ready. Let's see the opening seven cards, if they are good enough or not. Um, iteration, Teferi, Bobbles. Oh, I think I think that's going to be a keep for Yari. Yeah. Like he got lands, cantrips, a bit of late game stuff. I think also unholy hit there. On manual side, we cannot see, but Yari does have a solid hand. Manuel deciding here to mulligan. Yeah, so in the meantime, I will show you the card Underworld Breach, which we showcased yesterday in a similar combo shell, but also in a fair shell by uh, Brent Madsen. Let me open Underworld Breach. So one and a red enchantment. Each non-land card in your graveyard has escape, and that escape cost is equal to the, the card's mana cost, so normal cost. Plus, you need to exile three other cards from the graveyard. Now, when you do escape, let's say Misha's Bubble, it goes back to the graveyard. It doesn't exile like Flashback would. And so, uh, you can just recast a ton of spells. It's basically Yogmoth's will. Now, in this particular deck, you can also play Breach as value Breach. Let's say um, buy back no, four bubbles or five bubbles, and then bounce it back with the Fairy so you have not used that Breach forever. And you have it for later. And we saw there Yari with the bubble. And go. Ah, drawn upkeep. Uh, Mox Amber is okay. Uh, noble High Rock. <laughs> Immediately eating a removal spell. No ramp for you. Yeah, Bolt the Bird, classic. And all eat the. Noble. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. <laughs> Doesn't roll off the tongue as well, but yeah. Second land, shocking here, Sacred Foundry. Going Ooh. down to 15 and playing. Oh, I know this play. Iteration, but not able to play a land this turn, but there are some cards that can be played, for example, like the Bubble. Yeah, this deck is really good at having zeros. I mean, it has a lot of zeros, so iteration uh, on turn two is probably the best in this deck. But what's going on here is that it is not a card advantage matchup, so you just play it anticipate uh, to fix your draw a little bit. Now, there was an argument to maybe play pre a day and try, try to set up your draw that way. Draw, we need a land here. Oh, there's a land to be able to have... Cards like the fairy available, Emery uh, as well. A Mox Amber also gives you mana with the fairy, so you can maybe like play Preordain. You can bounce, bounce a Cauldron now. You can wait. So or, first we start by getting that Preordain before yeah. taking a decision on whether to tick up or down the fairy. Very good point. Very good point indeed. And let's see what Unholy Heat Saga. Oh, we might just keep both. Sometimes there are these spots with counter uh, with 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 cantrips that you can keep both. You can keep neither. You can keep them in some, you know, specific sequence. And we do keep heat. <gasps> Not taking up the fairy. Oh, oh, wait, wait. Oh, uh, I. Oh I no. think Yari forgot to use the fairy. Oh no. 
Uh, uh, yeah, he, he just shrugs. He's like, ah, yeah. Oof. It does happen. These turned at a lot of things to be done, a lot of uh, cards to yeah. look at, and the fairy was the first thing to be uh, played after the Mox Amber, so... Yeah, that's really unfortunate, because either Cauldron would not be in play, or the fairy would be on five. Mm. So it might not matter that much, because when it minuses, it stays alive, so it can minus it on the next turn. Um, yeah, Ooh, but, oh, Ballista it, here. Ah, yeah, that's a problem, because... Now, if you down tick, the fairy dies. Where, had you plussed, it wouldn't. So, that is becoming relevant. And that uh, noble yard is exile or in the graveyard? It is the graveyard. Yeah, it's like a sideways graveyard. Uh, I think Manuel is an old school player. Um, you know, like like a era before arena. Uh, people did like play the the graveyard alongside the edge of the library. Two mana. Good to know because that way the Agatha Soul Quadrant can exile it. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it can. Yeah. We have your expressive iteration looking at the top three cards. And among them, I see Mishra's Bubble. So that's a free take. I think there's also a land, and I cannot see the last card. So Bubble being played immediately. I think the land went on the bottom. You can, for example, try to kill Ballista first and then see what happens if Manuel... Because what can happen is that Agatha Soul Cauldron can exile a creature to put a count on Ballista to make it bigger. I so that's something to be mindful of. Emery here first. So this is a spot where Agatha is kind of graveyard, hey, but not really. Because Breach can just replay Bobo like four times. Okay, maybe maybe like three-ish. There's also an only eight in hand, so that can be used as well. And looks like we're taking up the Teferi. I got the Soul Cauldron targeting the uh, Yark here and trying to put a counter on the Ballista. Let's see if Yari wants to respond to that. And yeah, choosing this moment to crack the fetch there and using Unholy Eat on Ballista. Yeah, that's good. Good timing, good timing. You're not, you know, 201 without a reason. Shuffle it up still. Uh, Ballista giving their one damage to the fairy, down to four now. Oh, I mean, Yari's position is very good here. Very good. Like, we've got the. The Emery going. Also, that's also another classic thing. You bait out the graveyard hate with something pretty inconsequential. Like, for example, Emery activate on Mishra's bubble. Then the player says, okay, exile your bubble. Okay, breach win. That's, that's a pretty common play pattern. If you want to play breach, mm, since it's still a, a fairish combo deck or a, a combo deck with a fair plan, you need to be able to play through hate, play around hate, maneuver through hate. Um, the important fact is that that Ballista is now on the graveyard, so it can be exiled uh, yeah. with the Cauldron, and uh, if there's a creature, that creature can gain the ability of the Ballista. Yes, yeah, that's, a, the, again, very good catch. So, Manuel here playing land. We have four lands now. Let's see if we have a creature that we can play here. And we have, again, the Ranger Captain mm -hmm. of EO. Okay. Huffling. Getting a one mana, which is the Affling, playing the Affling. It is a 3-3 three, three that we can sacrifice, uh, and your opponents cannot cast non-creature spe spells this turn. Yeah, very good against... Uh, very good against Breach, specifically. Now, in this position, if he plays Breach, and then there's a pop in response. You can always buy back the breach with the fairy. So that's why the fairy is so good. Very multifunctional. Uh, but okay, Manuel doesn't use cauldron on his main phase. Uh, so now he's potentially walking into a removal spell. I saw prismatic ending as the pickup. So what we could do, very interesting play. You can tick up the fairy, allow your sorceries to become instants, hold up 
the prismatic ending and then use it whenever cauldron is tapped. So yeah, that, that's a sequence that could take place now. You'd really like to exile cauldron itself rather than the, the, the target. Um, but yeah, plays are possible. You can start by, by using Mishra's desk. Two mana. Okay, she just leads on it. You could just lead on ending, see what happens. That's also... Okay. Taking some time here to make the decision, but it looks like ending up going for that ending on the cauldron. Let's see what Manuel does in response to that. Can activate the cauldron, but what is getting exiled? Ballista? Bubble. So so we were going... Um, so you could do it, but there is another bubble, so you're not actually cutting upon and off of anything. So that is an interesting decision. Leaving uh, Ballista now in the graveyard in case there's another Agatha Soul Cauldron. Yeah, possibly, yeah. So now we've got the bubble going. We've got Mishra's research desk to be potentially activated. We've got Teferi. So there are a lot of options for Yari. I like his position. And remember, Yari is a deck that can just go, boop, win. And we'll see whether we experience exactly that. And Jerry looking there at the desk in the graveyard. We see there the Emery and the Mox Ember. There's already one Emery in the battlefield. And our player here taking some time to decide what is the best approach. And looks like uh, going with Emery. I like that because, you know, another Emery, so it d digs you deeper. So you don't need actually to, to dig deeper. You've got the only flashback card in, in Mishra's research desk in the graveyard already. But uh, you actually have a blocker for Halfling. Yeah, it is legendary. To. So we do have to sacrifice the other Emery due to the legendary rule. But I think first Yari seeing if it does resolve or not. He could even buy back his own Emery for later. He could uh, float mana with Amber, replay Amber. Uh, yeah, just so many choices in this deck. I, that's why I really, really like it. Uh, but that's also a personal preference to even like decks with, with so many decisions. Ooh, okay. Ooh. Hoo, hoo, hoo. Looking at the Teferi, exiling the Teferi there. I'm not sure I know what's happening. I think these cards are available until the next turn. Yes, so they're from the desk. So you pass back, you draw double land in hand, unfortunately for Yari. Manuel will kill off the fairy, fortunately for him. And he can redeploy, I think, Trelasar I saw. And Halfling. Yeah. Very interesting game. It's not it's not as linear as the previous previous ones. Like it. It's actually a bit happening. Both players have to think through a lot of options. Uh, green white deck. You wouldn't you wouldn't expect it to be too interactive, but there you go. Um, How many cards Ranger. does Manuel have in hand, though? Uh, three ish, two ish. Okay, so we see first there one very important card. Huh. Ha ha ha. So he did not deploy the halfling. Which screams to me that you want to have a green card for Force of Vigor? Well. So now, we target Mishra's Bubble with Emery. We might see Hardcast Endurance. Yeah, Hardcast Endurance is another option, and it is Hardcast Endurance. And this could be one of the spots I talked about, which is baiting out 
hate. Because you do this, you've baited out endurance, and now you go, okay then, Emery from the graveyard. Fill this up back again. And that's manual tur turn now, having uh, Trulasara and Endurance in the battlefield, as well as the Ranger Captain of Eos, and tapped out. Yeah, play another Emery. Interesting situation, genuinely. So we have the Emery there being played. The other Emery gets sacrificed due to the legendary rule, and uh, we are putting the cards in the graveyard from Emery. Bubble. And now choosing whether or not fetching, depending on that bubble. Okay, triple cost, sacrificing the response. And passing Yari drawing from from the bubble there, and it's Manuel's turn. What can Manuel do in this situation here? Yeah, that's I mean I think I said that Yari is advantage, then he wasn't, and then he kind of is, but isn't again. Uh, so it's really difficult to say. I think Yari has a breach right now, but Manuel has been pl playing in such a manner that I expect another endurance or force of Vega. Oh, unless not. Okay, the one <gasps> ring. Okay, so we have protection now, drawing a card from the oh. one ring. The other two cards on the battlefield are the endurance and uh, the. Trelasa. Trelasa Moon Dancer. Oh, he passes back. So I'm curious if he drew, actually drew Force of Vigor Endurance now. Because otherwise, this could be Yari's spot to win with the Breach in hand. So, as I said, Breach requires you to have Grinding Station. And there is no Grinding Station. But the more experience you get, you'll see the lines of, for example, replaying Emery. And there are two Emerys. To dig into your deck to try to find a station. And six minutes left on the clock. Just noticed that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Draw. Pithing Needle. Okay, you can turn off uh, the One Ring if, if it doesn't work out. Now, when you play, play Breach, you have to ask yourself, what is your bottleneck? Is it the mana or is it the cards in the graveyard? Right? In, now, cards in uh, Lance mana is not a bottleneck. Now, it's only cards in the graveyard. So, with so many in the graveyard, you might even say there is no bottleneck. Uh, but in these types of spots, Teferi would be great. Or maybe there's like a Boseju? Because Trellasar is legendary, so... Uh, let me see how many Bosejus uh, are played. Uh, a single copy. So first, we are using Emery to get the bubble back, using getting the bubble, Breach... Oh, let's see if Manuel drew something from the bubble, from the ring. It doesn't seem like it. And another we... Emery. Yeah, uh, this is the line I talked about. I think we're going to try to manually mill into grinding station, which is a, again a very, very important like sideline to to learn. Can Yari do it? Can Skura? Can you explain to us what bottleneck means in in magic terms? Yes, I can very much. So, a bottleneck is a situation. Basically, a bottleneck is your limitation, right? What limits you in trying to win the game, right? When you have, for example, 11 bolts in hand and two lands, your bottleneck is your mana, right? It doesn't matter you have 11 bolts. You can't win because you don't have mana to play them, right? So the bottleneck is the mana, right? Uh, so, yeah, I think that, that that's the way I would describe it. It's a limitation. Again, let's see. <laughs> And Yari just pointing Ooh. out, I'm going to do it again. There is a station. There is a station. Okay, so now... Ayo, yo, yo, yo. So now with the station... We so, found it. Yeah, the classic line. Emery, Emery, mill into station. There's protection on the other side. Um, th there is a good suggestion in chat to play Needle on Boseju, and I think that's a very heads-up suggestion. 
Very, very heads up suggestion. And looks like that's happening. PlayStation. Station is on the battlefield and now. What's in, in Manuel's hand? Trigger station. Station untaps itself. You can hold priority, use it, and then untap. Hold priority. <sighs> Heavy breathing, fast as Oracle. Wouldn't they both save you the breach? Depends. Different players time it differently, but I guess the the correct, uh, the most correct line may have been play needle at the very beginning and then play breach. And. The emotions are I. Okay, let's go. Let's, uh, so this is the thing, which <laughs> I know this feeling. Yari would like to just say, I will keep doing this and win. But Manuel says, nah, do it. So now Yari's thinking, okay, maybe Manuel has something. So now I have to play as carefully as I possibly can, trying to play around the things that might be there, uh, which I don't know what they are. Okay, so it also depends how cheeky Manuel is. There is a world in which Manuel has both Seiju in hand, waits until Yari mills out enough, heals the breach when Yari cannot play Oracle, is left with like one card in the library and loses to decking. Loses to decking. This could be a scenario that happens. Let's see. It might just not have Boseju at all. Yeah. What is it? I would. Uh, yeah. The needle on Boseju, I think, is still relevant. Is still relevant. Um, there is also another play, which is the opponent goes for Oracle and you endurance them so that their deck is bigger and they can't win on the spot. Uh, but if you play around this, uh, which is a semi common uh, play around pattern, you just over exile. So, for example, you play more zeros than you need to just to keep the graveyard small. Uh, no creature to play cheaper bow sage. There is Trellasar, the card at the bottom. Let, let me show you Trellasar. Or Trellasar. It is a legendary creature. It is a legendary creature, yeah. Okay, he, he keeps floating mana. There is no white. He may have mistapped at the beginning of the chain. He overtapped the white. Because if he played Teferi right now, into needle then he would i think have a a locked up win two cards left two cards left in the library this is a, a do or die what happens happens <laughs> what a game okay no more okay. cards left, and now let's get that pass. Yari has priority, and that's that GG. Game. Manuel what? just reveals <laughs> two offlings, and that's the win here for Yari, winning two on one versus Manuel, and advancing now at 3 0 and 1. 3 0 and 1, undefeated. Jess, Kai, and Breach, and Station. Winning there with Tassus Oracle. Good game. Uh, that was a great match overall. I really enjoyed, but it looks like we are going straight into a backup here. We have uh, Arieta on mono white control versus Krievlo on four color Omnat. How do you feel about this matchup of mono white versus four color Omnat? Yeah, so mono white here is actually Martyr. <laughs> which is a deck that's not very common, but some people know it exists. And this matchup, well, I just say it doesn't exist. We'll just see what happens. Um, but the question is, because they are both control midrange decks, which can go over which? And let me just take a look at the deck list to try to inform myself. Uh, Mono White does play Emiria the Sky Ruin, and this single handedly win, wins grindy games. So I'm tempted to say that I am Team Marte. 
Well, I just noticed that if our graph is correct, there's um, so the mono white player is one and O, oh, and there's four minutes left on the <laughs> clock. Well, that's that's entirely possible. And so if that's the case, then mono white just wants to assume a very controlled plan. So it is relevant because if you're one and O, oh, there are four minutes on the clock. You have to play at a reasonable pace. You cannot stall. You cannot take longer to make an action just to let the clock run out. But gameplay-wise, you can, for example, sideboard differently and focus less on the threats and more on the interaction. So you just stay alive. Which, uh, yeah, might be the case here. And bo both these decks are not the quickest to win, so... Uh, this is going to be very difficult to finish a game in four minutes. Yeah, I mean, wh whatever the decks were, like we've watched so many games, and you know, well, even if it's Amulet with like a turn three win, even if it's Hammer, three minutes is not a lot of minutes. Now, there are additional turns, and those additional turns might be the, the, the savior, but four color Omnath, there literally isn't a world in which it finishes in that allotted time. And what exactly is this deck? It might be, be mislabeled Mono White Control. We're so, going to take a look at the list. No, 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 I actually think this is this is control, but maybe the, the, the difference is that it's more martyr oriented, which is a reference to Martyr of Sands that used to be played pretty heavily, but yeah, used to is an important word. Now it, it is played in this list as well. But it has a very controlly vibe with uh, a Wrath of God, Quadruple Reprieve, Winds of Abandon, but at the end of the day, it does play 24 creatures. And we see here some options, three mana available, tapping one mana there. We're going to fetch in response. And we see Endurance. Um, Anto Antonino is showcasing that uh, he's, a, he's a proud member of the stereotypical group of four color players whose deck has to be full foil. Because you know it, if there are any decks full foil, it's Merfolk, Jund, and four color. That's, that's the trifecta of, of full foilness. That's the rule? That's the rule. I didn't make this up. That's the rule. And we see there Antonio just passing. So now we, we know the hand perfectly, thanks to Marta. Abiding Grace, <laughs> which is a three mana recursion effect for Marta. Yeah, and that happens. Solitude end step, exile martyr. So Antonino really wants to get into the red zone with a cane at 32 life. Historically, 32 is a lot. Block. Six comes through. I mean, six down. Tef. 27 to go. <laughs> and there's three rings on Antonio's side. Yeah. Getting a land there. And pass the turn. A single Thraben Inspector versus the world. Who's going to emerge victorious? I think we will see another maybe Thraben Inspector, yep, into Skycliff Apparition, Exile Endurance. Well, oh, there's... we just draw. We've missed a land, okay. There's 15 seconds left. Solitude, we are going to pitch. I can see winds of abandon. Ab I would probably just do. Uh, okay, giant it's killer is the pitch. Giant killer there, pitched and solitude. Yeah, so we exile endurance because we can double block solitude. I think is the reasoning. Charmo was the draw, wasn't it? Double block, empty battlefield. I mean, Akain is very happy to take these trades. He even is left with a Thraven Inspector. Um, 
And it seems that the time is called. Yeah, so we probably will enter <laughs> soon the extra turns. And I think Arieta is uh, pointing that out. So, feature matches always have extra time, but we show on the screen their time, not the round time. So, because it ran out on the screen, it means their personal clock has run out. But yes, every time you come to a feature match area, you've got extra time because you have to set up, you have to wait, the judge has to explain how it works, etc. You have to take the picture that you see there. Yeah, you have to take a picture, yeah. Also, the backups start a bit later, so they, they do have a different clock. The ferry goes on three and pass there. Yeah, extra turns. Um, wasn't the ferry plus already? And the judge is looking at that right now, and it looks like, yes, it was, so the ferry is going back to two. Oh, I think they're discussing the, the, the draw, like who would win, maybe? Or no? No? Is the classic angle of, let's talk this through instead of play, where if we played, it will be faster than talking? Or, or I love the situations when somebody shortcuts, but the shortcut is unknown to the opponent, so they have to explain the shortcut. It takes longer than if they had just done it normally. So a classic situation is when you have double ether vial, and you just move the counter. Um, okay, I'm going to now explain that shortcut because yeah, it takes a long time. It looks like they will just play it out here. And... Abiding grace, yeah. That Bye -bye. resolves. We see solitude. Oof. Getting yeah, rid no. <laughs> that makes it even more difficult for the game to end in the five turns. And we might see Mono White Martyr at four and. Oh! I think they just uh, realized they could not finish the game and Ekane here winning 2 0. Just advancing in that way yeah antonio might have just conceded yeah there was no way he would actually win actually kill the opponent um and yeah so that was the last match that we had i think yeah so. that was quite a lot of intensive games here we started with that a bridge deck that was really cool against the Iliad combo. Two combo decks showcasing. We saw both decks win and uh, bridge ending vi victorious. And now we saw a bit of this game. Uh, and 4 0 is a great score to be at. Don't forget, this tournament has nine rounds. This is date one of the regional championship. Players with six or more wins advance into day two. On day two, we are going to have, which is tomorrow, six rounds and then a cut to top eight. These players really want to get that top 24 to get the qualification for the Pro Tour, but it is not easy because 950 players around that number came here and qualified for this event. Yes, a lot of numbers. A lot of numbers. But you have got it all memorized by heart, <laughs> yeah. which, uh, which is pretty impressive. <laughs> in the art of the cards and in the, this case the art of the tournaments i am actually really happy to be here um i don't i don't know how to transmit this for the crowd for the public watching in the twitch chat but it's filled of people playing magic in the morning when we enter the venue we saw many people entering as well many magic the players um yeah over a thousand people overall in the venue yeah. and uh people playing side events it is really nice to see this uh in and events are getting bigger each time and more yeah. people returning to magic uh so that makes me really happy it does yeah it does it, it makes everyone happy because when you see there are a lot of people you want to come and when you come there are even more people and it's like a great spiral, which also works the other way around when few people come and the fewer, fewer, fewer come. But fortunately, we are in this up cycle and we should celebrate that. And you should come to this tournament next time as well. If you don't, no worries. 
we've got us we've got you covered literally with coverage of the event uh but there is prague there is bologna there is naples uh this year so we a highly encourage you to see it. yeah a lot of exciting events to be in and um this was a great round we are going to have round five soon that will be casted by the wheel all and also martin Musa. let us know tweet chat who are you rooting from at home? If you have any friend that you're rooting for, uh, any player like uh, those content creators or pro players that you are used to and that you know that are playing here, or just let us know what deck do you want to win. Um, there's a lot of variety here. We saw the meta breakdown early on, a lot of different archetypes. It's a great place to be when it comes to modern. We are going to close the round here and we will be back for round five.
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the European Championships, the regional championships of Europe, where we've got 929 players battling out in 15 rounds of modern to try and get themselves to Pro Tour Amsterdam. My name, I'm Will Hall, better known on the internet as the Will Hall EXP. This man to my right, that is Hall of Famer Martin User, and we have got some exciting decks in the feature match this round. They're kind of ready to go, so we're going to go straight down to it and talk over it, but our first matchup is going to be Hammer Time versus Rhinos. We haven't seen Hammer Time yet on camera, especially me and you haven't seen it. Uh, how does this normally play out? Uh, yeah, we also, I think Hammer Time was also doing well yesterday. I think I saw at least two players near the top table, so it, it's a deck that I think was very popular uh, about a year ago before the Lord of the Rings set came out. Mm -hmm. Wage Broad, the One Ring, Wage Broad, you know, Orcish Bowmasters. These are cards that typically these aggro combo decks that don't really interact, don't wanna, want to see all that much because you don't really have anything to do about the One Ring. Uh, that just sort of buys the opponent time for free. Bowmasters is also, if you're playing these cards like Memnite or, you know, whatever excellent creatures you have, then that's not, that's not, not, not great for you. Uh, but here against Rhinos, it just depends on how much interaction the opponent has, right? We know that Fire Ice is typically yeah. a card that these decks play. Some decks are playing Dead Gone, some decks are playing Dismember. I'm actually pulling the list yeah, man, uh, no, look. right now. There, there, is, there is actually, wow, there's, that's so much removal. Uh, they, like our, one that they've got, they recently got that lines up pretty well is Flame of an Ore, right? Not only does it kill something, it can also sh have a shatter effect to it. Yeah, our Rhinos player is playing four, four Fire Eyes main. That's pretty standard. Three Flame of an Ore, two Dead Gone main, two Dismember main. So this list is very well tuned against creatures. There's also two Subtlety, there's three Tishanas, Tidebinder. So yeah, this list is as tuned against creatures as it, as it possibly can. Uh, and then we have Hammer. Yeah, I mean, I guess it depends sort of on, you know, also who's on the play, who, who's on the draw. Uh, but with this many removal spells, I think I would give the upper hand uh, to our teamer player. Yeah, it looks pretty, pretty hard to fight through all this. Also, we've got things like tie binder, so we can sort of stifle some of these triggers at, and, and the ETBs. We actually spoke about the, the subtleties that can stop the creatures coming down, as well as our full removal suite, force negations. And stop potentially a um what's the one that equips it or what it could be like even a hammer coming down it could be a surge kind of uh, you stop your things or even a cigar aid so it's really going to play and depend on the hands i'm currently losing my voice chat if you think i'm sounding a little bit weird right now i don't know why i'm uh, decided to lose my voice today but here's starting off it's gonna be an esper sentinel really good one drop modern horizons one i believe this was the first time we saw this uh so any non-creature spells cast will have a tax effect of one yeah, and that, that's the thing. Esper Sentinel, really good card. I also enjoy playing with it when I'm playing white or green creature decks or, you know, white green creature decks. But yeah, again, it is not great against or Orcish Bowmasters because it has one toughness. So ever since that, that card got printed, uh, some of these uh, white creature decks are kind of uh, going off the radar a little bit. So uh, we saw that Dead Gone taking care of the Esper Sentinel, not able to pay the one. So it was basically drawing a card. Uh, oh my word, what is that card? Is that a hammer? <laughs> I think that's a colossal hammer. I think, oh, that's the, um, is that the shovel promo one? I think it's the shovel promo one from some, from, uh, Dead Gone or something like that. Like one of the, um, uh, the, the secret layers that came out recently. I'm sure chat will tell me, uh, momentarily. Hope you're all having a great day wherever you are. Obviously you're tuning in here at round number five. We've got four more rounds after this today. We're going to see an upkeep ice that's going to tap down the only planes on the other side of the battlefield and draw a card for its trouble. Yeah, fire ice is so good in the rhinos deck. Um, not only can you use the fire side to deal with the small creatures, uh, ice is also a really good way to slow the opponent down. But also, what we saw yesterday, sometimes your opponent keeps that one mana up for their mystic dispute or for fluster storm, spell or something along those lines. You can just tap it at the end of their turn, untap, play your cascade card, and resolve your uh, crashing footfalls. Let's besiege you for the turn. One in the main. Obviously, that's not really a card you want to be playing. Because, um, obviously, it can be very good against these Hammer Time decks. Things have, You've got a lot of targets on the other side. But being forced to play it so we can play our Charlotte's Agent and Cascade into a Crushing Fills. That's going to bring along two 4-4 four, four Rhinos with Trample. Yeah, that's another thing. Not only does <coughs> our Rhinos player have so many removal spells, there is also usually one or two copies of Besiege you just hiding in the in the mana base, that's another answer to the 
to the hammer time combo. Evil Dead. That's the uh, the one I was thinking of. Thank you very much, chat. Old boarded uh, shot clan coming in to play taps there. I was wondering how many of these we would be seeing this weekend. We've seen quite a few, to be fair. Yeah, I like that. I, I... But modern is a is a format where players typically like to really you know take good care of their oh. decks and, and have all the all the art that they like to play with. And yeah, right. I think that's great. I'm that guy. That's me. Uh, I like all the the fancy arts for the cards I can get. Now, how do we advance our board here? I think the saga triggers on the stack, right? I think it went up to two last turn, so this turn we're going up to three. So we're going to make one. Yeah, we're just short a little bit. That's going to go. We're going to go search. We're going to go find an artifact. We're going to convert it mana cost one or zero. Can't be XX. Uh, what's the, what we got? What targets we got? Let's have a little look. Normally, obviously, hammer is quite the obvious one. We've yeah. got a ginger brew, pitting needle, ginger brew, ornithopter, memnite type of cards. Uh, Springleaf drum. We're gonna go for a, uh, a shadow spear here. Shadow spear, yeah. <clears throat> I've just uh, upgraded my shadow spears actually in paper to the uh, the ones from the Lord of the Rings set. Quite like them. Let's have a little look. See. How, but then, like, we're not really doing much on a board set. We've got a free free now. We need to ideally like have land into another one drop so we can at least get a four four that you can trade with one of these rhinos. But look at that hand. We've got a tie binder. We've got a, a um, force of negation. We've got a Lorien's revealed. Yeah, that's the thing with the hammer deck. Like when you don't have the combo going, your board kind of just looks like a bunch of you know very medium creatures. You have all these memnites and ornithopters just kind of watching the opponent do their thing. And if your if your hammer doesn't stick to the creature that you're trying to equip, or you know if your opponent has a has a Besaju, if if they have too much removal, then you're kind of stuck with a bunch of subpar creatures. I would say that this is basically like the hammer deck in, uh, is is the infect deck in modern now. Right? Yeah. It's it's very like it needs to have both its pieces going together. It can win through chip damage, but ideally you want to try and get that one big shot and then finish your opponent off that way. And of course it can win through infect. It does uh, play. Income of Nexus in the in the main. I wonder how many copies we're going to do. Sometimes I see three, sometimes I see four. We're going for just three copies here in Alex's deck. We're still looking for this Lawrence Revealed. What land we're going to get? Is it going to be a Triumph? We're going to get a Shock. Basic. And this is another, a lot of people love these uh, cycle cards, right? Not only can I late game, I can draw three cards, but in the early turns, I can go find myself a uh, land drop or if I can go in underneath Blood Moon, I can go find myself a basic or something. So, mm. again, so many. Uh, and on top of all that, of course, you can ditch it for your Force of Negations. It's, it's really cool how a, how a cycle of, you know, commons or uncommons can completely change uh, a format. I mean, it hasn't really changed the format, but, yeah, what you're saying. Like, yeah, you can have a Blood Moon in play and you have all these land cyclers. You can pitch them to Force of Negation. Uh, you can also just hard cast it. Five mana, draw three cards. That's not terrible. Sometimes the game comes long. Okay, coming across to 10 points damage here. Uh, surely we've got to be smelling something here. Why would I attack? Why would the 2 2 attack into a 3 3? So, you know, going through Axe's head right now, what, what do I need to play around? Is it essentially another dead gone? A fire ice? Could even just be something like another violent outburst to give all our creatures plus 1 plus 0, as well as adding another 8 power to the battlefield. But decides not to block, takes it all. We're going to upkeep, fetch, thin the deck a little bit. Yeah, I think having like a fire ice in hand, I think I, li I like the attack. Uh, if you let the opponent play one more turn, maybe add a few more artifacts to play, then suddenly the construct can can start blocking the rhinos profitably, and I would like to, uh, you know, stop that from happening. Also, if you keep your opponent, uh, your opponent's board down to just a few creatures, or maybe even nothing other than the equipment, that would be ideal for you. Well, this is where it gets really com tough to play against, right? Rhinos has established their board. They've now got three mana up. You've got to play around. Force negation, fire yeah. and ice, dead, dead gone, gone yeah. high bind, another uh, uh, cascade, Seiju, yeah. flame of a gnaw, like three yeah. is the sweet yeah. spot for this deck. Can Alex fight back? Can he equip that uh, construct with both of these equipments on the battlefield? Oh my word, Alex, come on, now you're testing me. I think that's a Stoneforge Mystic. Could be a Paladin. Could be anything. Let's be honest, chat. You're going to tell me which one it is any second now. It's going to be one of the two drops, so it's going to be either Stoneforge Mystic or it's going to be a Pure Steel Paladin. Chat saying it's a Paladin, so I'm going to go with Paladin like you are, chat. I can't say I've ever seen that one up before in my life. It's going to be a secret layer of some description. Yeah, and Alex decided to just take the damage in the previous turn and, and you know, is going to try to go for 
not really a kill, but at least a way to maybe make a really big creature with Shadow Spear, try to attack, and you're you're gonna be able to start racing. Uh, but yeah, we know that Paul has a lot of tricks up his sleeve. So that's gonna stop the first equip, I believe. Yeah, I think that was a zero mana equip from the hammer, thanks to the paladin on the stack. Deshana Stidebinder, let me put that on the screen, is one of the coolest new cards. I say every time I see it played, there's something new happens with that card that it either works fully, doesn't work fully, it works to the turn, or is it? It's got a lot, a lot of text, but really cool. But at the end, of this, it is basically a stifle effect coming yeah. down here. Yeah, but not not only is it a stifle effect, you also kind of like delete the text of the card in a way. So yeah, yeah. I, I'm I'm gonna stop you from equipping the creature because you just activated the ability of it, and now the type miner also just makes it lose all all the all the other abilities. So it's just gonna stay in play, but it doesn't really do anything anymore. Okay, that's another Paladin and it's the Battlefield. See, I knew that one, chat. Come at me. How are we going to respond? We've got lots of ways to kill things on the other side. This looks like a Ice is going to tap down the one that can gain life. It's got Life Link right now. Then we're going to Dead Gun this blocker. You've got wow. no blockers. I've got Leaf on the Battlefield. I'm going to turn them sideways. I'm going to take down game number one. Real quick. Just how kind of Free this up. This is going to be a quick matchup one way or another, but we got access to the cyborgs. So let's see if we can get them on the screen for everybody at home to see. Because this is an open deck list tournament. Two, uh, 929 players turned up, but everybody has access to each other's deck list. Before the game, you get three minutes to review your opponent's deck, and then you shuffle up, you play your game, and you get the same uh, during cyborged. You pass the deck list across. Your opponent can have a refresher of what's in your 75X or whatever, how many you brought. And then uh, if we go to a game three, exactly the same will happen. So. This is Alex's full 75 and his sideboard. What do you like in this, Mr. The User? I think Search of Salvation is a card that you typically want to bring in against against players with a lot of re removal. Like you said, they know each other's deck list. So you, now Alex is able to look at the list saying, okay, you only you not only have Fire Eyes, you have Dead Gone, you have all these cards. It's going to be really hard for me to combo through that. So I think Sur Surge of Salvation is a card that can certainly come in uh sanctifier and vet could could also could also technically come in if you think you know the opponent has a lot of re red removal spells maybe mm -hmm. they don't have other ways to deal with it uh lavinia obviously the way to stop the the cascade cards or the the crashing footfalls uh plus yeah i'm not sure if like meddling mage is 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 that good sure it can it can also name crashing footfalls or outburst uh, but then again, the opponent has so many shock effects, like yeah. then I'm not sure if it really makes sense to bring it in. I mean, it might just be better than some other creatures. Uh, maybe it just makes more sense for you to have this than an, orn than an Ornithopter, for example. Um, well, yeah. Let's have a look at the Rhinos list, and let's get that up on the screen for you all here. Slightly bigger, but uh, looking at that sideboard there, this I <laughs> a lot that really is really bad in this matchup. Yeah, this, this deck <laughs> just looks like it's, it's, it's pre-sideboarded. It just has all the removal in combined with the with the extremely big swing, you know, when you play the the shardless agent and you get 10, 10, worth, 10 power worth of creatures on the battlefield, in addition to all these burn spells, that, that's exactly where you want to be in a matchup like that. Force of Vigor is certainly a card that, that can come in. Uh, Brotherhood's End to deal with some of the smaller creatures, maybe in a, another Tidebinder. Cool. And the second the second Busage, obviously, because, yeah, that's that's free. That's a free way to... <laughs> to combat these uh, enchantment or artifact-based uh, combo decks. Sweet. Well, we'll head back down to the match now. It looks like they're just finishing shuffling up. Uh, oh, no, just, just finishing sideboarding right now. But now we will see Alex on the play, which, of course, is huge in this matchup, being able to get a kind of under a fire and ice turn off your turn two plays. Uh, it'll more turn off your turn three plays, but, you know, two mana is kind of the sweet spot here for this t uh, hammer deck. Let me refresh you all on what uh, what's on the stakes this weekend. Well, if it players manage to get an invite back to tomorrow, because that's the first goal, they need to get an X and free record. If they're able to achieve that, we like say, hey, do you want to come back and play on Sunday? Then tomorrow they're going to be battling out to try and get into the top 64 players. If they manage to do that, that is their share of $100,000 prize pool. But the, of course, the main thing in everybody's mind this weekend is they want to get into the top 24 players, because then they earn themselves an invite to the Pro Tour, which will be modern, which will be in Amsterdam. That's right, that is the European Pro Tour this year. Then two lucky individuals in this room are going to be walking away with world 
slot. They're going to be in the invites to the World Championships in Las Vegas, end of the year. They also get to, you know, take home, well, if you win, you get two trophies. If you come second, you only get one trophy. Only only one trophy. <laughs> Imagine only having one. <laughs> it's just, I don't know why we've got two, but we give them two. When they, if you win, if you come second, you only get you only get one. They are really nice as well. I haven't seen them this. I don't know if they've changed since the last RC season. The last one was the um, like the blue teardrop. Oh yeah, uh, teardrop, icon. Yeah. So that looked really nice. I don't know if they're going to change it up. Maybe this one's like a skull for you know the swamps, and the next one's going to be a, the fire symbol for. That'd uh, be cool. Yeah, like, I'm down for it. I'm I like change when it's uh, made in nice glass sculptures. Do you see the trophy for the cosplay at Magicon? Mm -hmm. My they made Sword of Fire and Ice. Oh yeah, yeah, it yeah, was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that it was cool. mind blowing how cool that looked. That won the cosplay, uh, the cosplay competition in uh, Vegas, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that looked really nice. Yeah, it was. I was like, oh my word, that is beautiful. Was, yes, some of these things that that the cosplayers come up with are are super cool. I'm not sure if there's any cosplayers in attendance this weekend here. I haven't really had a chance to go walk around, but I'm sure there's somebody here mm. probably in cosplay. We've definitely got we've got magic artists here. RK Post is over in the corner doing all his signings and paintings. But everybody turned up in appearance. Some people like to get their cards signed, and you know, RK Post has done a lot of cards, so there's a good a lot chance. Of cool somebody, cards, yeah. Some Mor the... Morphling, I think. Uh, yeah. Some of the avatars, like Avatar of Bo, I think is from RK Post. But Mor Morphling is certainly one of the most iconic cards. If you've played the old extended format, you know the what 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 modern used to be uh, that used to be one of the, one of the best creatures in Magic. He has a lot of tokens over there as well, which obviously a lot of fa kind of a fan favorite for a lot of. Uh, People, so we're off to the races. Alex is going to start off with that Sagada's aid that kind of turns on his whole deck on all the equipments now can be played at flash speed and equipped for zero. Didn't do the the uh, awkward turn one as a saga into something crazy and get blown out twice. So he's just the land go. Draws to the turn. Does he have the second land drop? It does. That's the planes. And oh, here, there's Lavinia. Yeah. Now. Let's see if we can get that one up on the screen for everybody so they can have a little look. See, that basically means you you can't cast spells for zero, I believe. Like, yeah, that, spells that, that basically the opponent used no mana to cast yeah. that, that they're getting countered. Basically turns into no more crashing foothills for you. No funny business, no shenanigans. Obviously, only got two toughness. So it does uh, eat things like uh, Dead Gone, Fire and Ice. Uh, worst case scenario, we need to use a Flame of a Gnaw on it. Do still have a Bone Crusher Giant if that's been uh, kept in the deck? I imagine it has, as well as bringing in extra things like Brotherhood's End and maybe some more ex the extra Tie Binder. And then we've got the Force of Vigors just floating around there. There's so much else has got to be thinking of. And there's the first Dead Gone. Only two in the main, though. Both players have access to each other's deck lists. I do see a Flame of Manor in hand. I think there's. I see a green card. It looked like Endurance, but I don't think this is the matchup for Endurance. It could be Force of Vigor. Yeah. They... We'll find out shortly enough as we pass the turn back to Alex. Surge was drawn for the turn. I'm not sure if you can have a deck better set up to beat Hammer Time than this Rhino's list. With all this removal, all these Force of Negations, all these Force of Vigors, like, you have basically every angle covered uh, yeah. with all the cheap removal while Alex has to kind of rely on his Hate Bears to try to stop that, his Meddling Mage or Lavinia. That's not a great place to be when you're up against, you know, eight shock effects. Like, maybe it's a meta game cool because, you know, on online, quite a lot of people were talking about Merc Tide being one of the, the better decks at the minute. And Hammer, obviously, famously very good against the Merc Tide lists. Anyone that needs to do kind of combat damage, you know, like straight up kill effects. Because if you can give your creature plus 10 plus 10, normally a Lightning Bolt doesn't do too much to it. But um, in a meta full of Rhinos, which of course is our most played deck this weekend. Hammer not going to do super well, and Alex just has to pass the turn yeah. back. Could have played the um, the Mystic there. Did draw a Stone Forge for the turn, but I think he's trying to hold up Spell Pierce, trying to get max value out of that. Can't just tap out and then let his opponent uh, cascade into some Crushing Fields because he basically won't be able to catch her back up from there. So yeah, that's Alex, what he's Alex's hand is extremely slow and reactive. Surge is great, but you need something to protect. As you as you mentioned, that you can't even play the Stoneforge Mystic because you have only two lands. And if you want to use that Surge of Salvation or that you know Spell Pierce or so, or something to help protect it, you still need a third land. So being kind of stuck on two lands, not not really wanting to play his only threat, 
uh, to really activate the other card. It's not not a great position. Meanwhile, Paul is just making land drops, you know, doing some things, uh, getting ready for that uh, for that cascade spell. Uh, There's the vault, which is uh, basically says wizard on it for one mana, flame Renor in hand. There's the third land drop Axe has been digging for, hoping for. Now, how is he going to advance to the board? He's going to start with this Stoneforge Mystic. Kind of a classic. Remember when this was banned in modern? <laughs> yes. Wild <laughs> Nakatl was banned in modern. Yeah, that, that's the one I always come over like. Think Ooh. about that. Wild Nakatl, that crazy little one mana free free. Woo. Crazy times in Magic, ladies and gentlemen. But here comes Stoneforge Mystic. Is it going to resolve? Is the ETB going to resolve? Do we get to go search our deck for a equipment? Looks like it, we do. I imagine. It could be Hammer, but I kind of see him pulling forward that uh, Nettle net list to the hand. Or where are we going? What are we doing? Shadow Spear? Question mark? Yeah, Shadow Spear is what we're going to go find. Put that in hand. We've got the ability to play that now at instant speed, remember, because of the Sigala's aid sitting at the bottom of your screen. That also kind of just signals that Alex perhaps already has a Hammer in hand. Oh, yeah, that, that, that's what I would smell from this. Shadow Spear is typically not a very relevant card against rhinos in the early game. Maybe yeah, if the game gets into a point where there's a bunch of creatures staring at, staring each other and you want to have your 12-12 also give, you know, trample and, and lifelink, then sure, that, that makes sense. But in the early game, you typically uh, go for the hammer. I think Alex has got hammer, shadow spear, double surge, spell pierce. And we're going to see dead gun end of turn. Here comes surge in response. Surge is like a nicely worded card uh, for these match uh, for these games. You and permanents you control gain hexproof into end of turn. Prevent all damage um, from black or red sources that would be able to creatures you control this turn. So again, lines up pretty well. Yeah, it's like yeah. a protection spell with a little bit of an upgrade against yeah. red and black decks. But now it's fully tapped out at the mercy of potentially a lot of rhinos hitting the battlefield. Is that a dismember I see in hand? There are, yeah, yeah, there's one, there's one. There oh, are two copies in, in the deck. Yeah, this Rhinos <laughs> list Jeez. is, yeah. I'm not expecting to see that one, but here we go. So I think we've got a Force of Vigor, a Flame of a Gnaw, Lorien's Revealed, and potentially double dismember. Here comes the Flame of a Gnaw with the Mutavolt activated. Of course, all creature types, so it is a wizard. So it's going to be... Destroy a uh, five damage type creature and draw two cards. That's a lot of cards. That's a, that's a pretty good deal. It's like an evoked mall drifter, plus I also get to kill your best card. <laughs> not, not the worst. That's the saga drawn for turn. Okay, now this is where we might see this uh, Force of Vigor start to get fired, fired off. Because you can do it with this trigger on the stack, so you can't even generate mana from it. Which I think might is what might be going through the head here. Taking out the Scarlet Aid and the um, Urza Saga is not a bad line. I suppose you do get blown out for by another Surge or something like that. So that's what's going through the mind. Just passing the turn back. Okay, I explain this really uh, patiently, really slow. That's a violent outburst drawn for the turn, though. So that's an instant speed way of pitting Rhinos on the battlefield. There's also a Lorien Revealed, which is exactly the type of card you want to have when you have a lot of cheap removal. Sometimes the game just goes long. You spend a lot of cheap removal on your opponent's creatures. Well, and then you just reload with Lorien Revealed um, before you find your Cascade cards. It just seems that like every single card that's drawn is really bad against this. Uh, if you're the Hammer player, it's like, oh, if you've got Move Spell, you've got, you got Shatter Effects, <laughs> yeah. you've got things that hit power on the battlefield. Yeah. Like, like It's all going wrong for me right now. But playing it patient, trying to get, you know, worm that one opportunity where you can win the fight, kind of untap potentially and get uh, the one big hit in. As the side goes up to two, I think he just passes the turn back. Here comes the Violent Outburst. That Spell Pierce not looking too good in the face of six mana. We're going to Cascade. Just four cards down, not revealing too much. They're going to get shuffled, put to the bottom. Now we're going to have this Chris Fittles on the stack. Do we have double spell pierce? No. That was easy. I would like to untap. I think of the words coming out of his mouth. Nope. I was wrong. I'm going to fetch. Do 
Well, both these players four and O. Oh, the sweet spot for this weekend against day number two is X and three. If you can uh, get yourself six wins, we'll be giving you that invite back tomorrow to battle it out against Europe's best players so you can give yourself a shot at winning not only your share of $100,000, but also get yourself on to the Pro Tour. Draw step. Another tie binder. As a Saga can make a 1-1, one, one. not great in the face of Tramplers. And here comes a crashing. I kind of like getting in with the Mute Vault, but I'm greedy. <laughs> I've, yeah, I've, just just yeah, just get every damage you 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 can through. I like that as well. I I like attacking with with mutable vaults. I once played game. a mirror back when um, you know it was like mono blue devotion, mono black devotion. I think it was the Pharos, uh born of the gods kind of type era, and Esper control was really good back then. And I'm not a control player in the slightest. And but I used to play mutable vault as one of its like you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I played a mirror in in a PTQ, like round two. And I just went, turn one mute bolt, turn two attack, and then a mute bolt. <laughs> and he just like went, uh, Azorius Charm, and put it on top of my deck. And I was like, yep, mm. that's why I don't play control decks. Yeah. All right, classic float one mana from the Where's a Saga. Think about what I'm going to get. I'm interested, like, we're really holding on to this uh, Force of Vigor. It, it might just be something else. But I think it is Force of Vigor. I think the last card is Force yeah, of Vigor. Yeah, yeah, that last one's definitely... I think there might be there Double might be, Force. Oh my god, yeah, there might be Double Force. And we're in the stage where we can actually oh. hard cast it through uh, Spell Pierces here. Oh, man. What do we go find? It's going to be a Hammer. Hammer is going to hit the battlefield. This might be the point where we fire off on the, fir uh, the first Force of Vigor here. Unless we even do it through combat. Oh, my. Imagine, like, animate Mutavolt, block... Force of Vigor, destroy the equipment, block the yeah. Um, Looks like we're going to... What are we doing? What are we doing? Dismember it in response. We're going to take four Wait, life. But response to what I exactly? Think the equip trigger. Okay, okay, okay. I thought we were still finishing searching. No, no, players like to shortcut these days. We ain't got no time for that in modern. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> So, in response, the Mana Floating is going to cast another Hammer. Does that enter the battlefield? And this is that stack. This is what Alex has been playing towards. He wants to try and get this one turn where he can fight and everything resolved. So, yeah, we're going to start laying them out first. Thank you very much, chat. Uh, player, sorry. So, Hammer, Trigger, on the stack. Dismember, in response. Hammer, in response to the Dismember. Yeah, I think Alex is going to be disappointed to fight. <laughs> well, he, he, if the, if one of these force of vigors gets hard cast, he's got. Um, in fact, no, he's not. Cause he's got a surge in hand and spell pierce. So he, he's if it gets hard cast, or even if it gets. Um, yeah, there's a, also a, a yeah. tower. Alex might come out from this. There's also. A, I'm not sure if it's a tide binder or a force of negation. I, I no, keep... it's tide binder. That's okay. the the random crazy art tide binder. Another dismember is going to come down <laughs> here. Oh, okay, okay, we got a stack. Your move, Alex. One white. Surge? Question mark. I kind of like spell pierce, making them pay the extra two. But we're gonna go surge. Yeah, I, I think Alex is hoping to try to bait the opponent into playing the force, where where he he would be able to use the spell pierce. Yeah, I think it'd that... be a big hedge. Are we ditching? Are we paying the mana? We're ditching. Wow, but Paul playing around that spell pierce, saying yeah, that would. That would possibly lose to a situation where I could just completely lose to that. He's got double spell pierce. And his four mana up. <laughs> That's so backbreaking. Wow. He needs another surge. I think if he did it the other way round of spell piercing and then f had his last card be a surge, he would get himself out of this. Heads up play by Paul there, though. Like yeah. that, that that takes some, you know, some uh minerals. Yeah, so like some uh self-restriction to to Pitch the second force into the first one, saying, "Yeah, I'm I'm fine sacrificing a couple more resources uh, to play around some of your cards, which could which could just be the game on the spot." So, I think there's a lot of people that would just you know tap four and say, "Hey, force you know force of vigor." I'm gonna keep another one in my hand, not realizing that maybe they they wouldn't even get an next turn. Alex, deep in the tank, how can I get back from this? So, force is gonna deal with the creature token <laughs> and the Sagada's aid. 
Surge is going to resolve. None of this is going to actually happen. In the end of it, we're just going to have two um, Colossal Hammers on the battlefield. Follow-up play is going to be a Paladin. No third artifact for us to be able to use that ability. Tidebinder is going to come down end of turn. I think I think that's lethal with the mutable. Yeah, but I say with the mutable, it's lethal. Yeah. And fire and ice off the top, just as the kicker. Why not? Animate this. Yep, Alex has had enough. He's going to scoop it up. Unfortunately for him, it was a good stack there. One last, like, you know, kind of, if certain spells were played in a different order there, Alex comes out on top and we go to the game three, but not to be here. He's going to drop himself to four and one, which is still a great record, still in contention of getting into day two. But uh, I think we've got back our feature match still, so we're going to move yeah. straight across that. And this is, we only caught a little bit of this last round. I watched the whole match, <laughs> which, let me tell you, took a while Talk me through this uh, mono white martyr deck. It's it's <laughs> something else. Yeah. Well, uh, first thing I that came to my mind when looking at this mono white deck, and let me just put up the list real quick. I got it was... in front of me. So my indication of this is it gains a lot of life, and yes. on the other side against the main zoo, it wants to do a lot of damage. And it looks like in game one we were able to gain more life than we were damage. But, uh, and I kind of, I stay quite up to date on the modern fo uh, format and meta, right? I play a lot of modern. I watch a lot of modern. I own a lot of modern. I don't think I've ever seen this deck, <laughs> especially not this iteration of like yeah. all the shenanigans going on in it. And I was just watching it last round in awe. Just, I think it was against the four color Omnath deck. And they were just both like gaining so much life that eventually he won game one through his opponent. Drawing every card in this deck. Yeah, 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 I was yeah, like, yeah. oh my word, what's going on? How many people in the chat do we have here that still remember that Gabriel Nassif deck from Worlds in Paris in 2006 playing his, uh, I don't know if it was mono white or blue white Tron Proclamation of Rebirth in combination with the Martyrs, basically just gaining, you know, 60 life a turn. Uh, that was a really cool deck. I mean, Gabe Nassif is, is is known for you know being a one of the one of the best best brewers, and that was a really cool deck back back then. Here's another question to make you feel really old: Who wasn't alive in 2006? Yeah, well, yeah. Who was not born 18 years yeah. ago? We're gonna we're off to the races though. We've got the uh, as we spoke about, it was banned at one point while Nicole entering the battlefield. Currently a one one. It does need a plains and a mountain to uh, give it its plus one plus one abilities. Which we might be finding here. So what uh, Arietta wants to get going here is he wants to find a martyr. He wants to have a lot of white cards in hand, and then he wants to sacrifice it. You know, re revealing a bunch of white cards, getting a lot of life. Then he wants to get a biting grace, uh, which is a three mana enchantment that says that at the beginning of your end step, you can return the martyr from the graveyard to the battlefield. And imagine doing this every turn and gaining, you know, 18 life. Then the Domain Zoo deck is gonna have to overcommit, at which point you might play some, something like a sweeper, or you might just be trying this, uh, trying to do this to buy yourself more, more time while working on your, you know, mid-range side of the, of the game plan with cards like Solitude and Skyclave Apparition uh, dealing with, the, with their creatures. So we're gonna see a march uh, it's going to deal with the Ragaman, get that off the battlefield. We're going to take a, I believe that's a full eight points of damage. That is a big hit. Third land drop. We're going to, oh, lock, temporary lockdown. That's okay. huge. That's coming out the sideboard, I imagine. Yep, two in the sideboard. That's going to clean the battlefield up nicely, but we are at nine life. And there's a lot of reach in these domain zoo decks. We've got tribal flames, lightning bolts. Bone Crusher Giants. There's been a lot more Bone Crusher Giants this weekend than I thought I was going to be uh, talking about. Yeah, I mean, the the line that says damage can be prevented uh, basically gets around the one rings protection, so uh, certainly makes sense to uh, use the Bone Crusher if you're, if you're interested in that. Just to try him, and it, of course that comes into play tap three mana, but we've decided not to pit Giganta in hand, which smells to me that there is a stomach denial floating around, but... Uh, just a tie binder. So I think we did that kind of the one, wrong, the one, I can't speak, the wrong way around. We should have done tie binder in response to the tap trigger, which means they still get a card because they're able to tap it in response well, to I, coming down. I think what happened is the, the protection trigger was countered because uh, that's, oh, that's the trigger as well. When, it comes okay. to, when, when the ring comes in, into play, there's a protection trigger. So Sam was interested more in just, just keeping the pressure up Sure, you, you can draw your card, you can take a damage in your upkeep. Yeah. I'll just deal three three more with the Tidebinder, 
get you down to six. Now we're getting into a territory where maybe tribal flames is, is going to be lethal. Okay. I like it. I like it. I'm buying what you're cooking. But we're in a tank. It looks like we're deep in it. This game obviously uh, going a lot quicker than their game one did. Currently six points of damage on the other side of the battlefield. Two unknown in hand. Although, wait. You should be at five life, correct. I, I'm, I don't think you'd take damage, though, if the Time Binder was used on the... But then if you can draw cards... Yeah, because it's in your upkeep, right? So you take the one. But they doesn't have a build... Yeah, well, that's if they... Because they attacked for free, so it would have been the protection trigger that was stopped, like you said. Right, right, but if, if the Time Binder is used on the ring, does it still have abilities? Uh, I, that is it. <laughs> Apparently, ring loses all the abilities. So I guess it doesn't take you don't take the one damage. But then how how do you draw the card? Well, either way, there's a there's a leyline binding dealing with wow, that's yeah, this is not the most reliable sweeper effect because of binding and other ways to destroy enchantments, uh like Baseju. So Sam using that at the end of turn to free up his two creatures, and now he's gonna be able to potentially put together a lethal attack. Yeah, it's gonna have to be something immaculate here. We got what two chump blockers. One of them's got trample. So do we just trade chump, take five? Completely turns off our fetch land. But then what do we have to draw to get back into this? So that's gonna block there, yes. Yeah? So we're gonna go trade chump, take five, drop to one, get ourselves a one one illusion token for our troubles. I see red card in hand. Lightning bolt, two face. That wow. is going to scoop one, up. One. Go straight into game number three. Yeah, great draw from Sam, both with that uh, with that quick curve, also backed up by the tide binder there, and also the uh, the ley line to sort of counter the sweeper. I wonder if this is a real, like you know, draw dependent game. Who's, okay, who's so, on the play? So what what happened is we kind of just didn't realize what the timing of everything was because we're not you know we're not there we don't we don't see what the players talk about but the the one ring gets played, and it has an enter the battlefield trigger. trigger. The trigger is that you get the protection. Uh, Tidebinder was used to counter the protection, but uh, Arietta used the ring in response to the Tidebinder. So yeah, it has no more abilities. That's why you don't take any damage. But you can also just not draw any more cards. But if that is used to uh, draw the card in response to the Tidebinder, which is responding to the trigger, then the ring still does have the draw ability. So let's see. Can we get the uh, the Mono White Marta deck on screen? Have we got that deck list? Let's have a little look while everyone's sideways. So you see that they're passing phones across and they're looking at each other's deck list because this is an open deck list tournament. They get to do this in between each game uh, uh, and before the match to get an extra three minutes in the round. So let's have, well, let's have a look at the most played cards so far this weekend while they're doing a little bit of sideboarding. Shout out to Frank Arson for putting these together. Look, Frank's, Frank's a wizard in every <laughs> aspect of the, the way of a wizard. Orcs Bowmaster, yeah. I'm not surprised at all. I, like, think, I think that is the best, uh, that is the best modern card. It's like, I, for, for, for me, the top five is like Bowmasters, the One Ring, and then like uh, Ren N6, you know, maybe Raghavan. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's a format where, where power creep is real, and in the last couple of years, we added some really, really powerful cards to the format, Orkish Bowmasters, uh, possibly being the, the best one. So not not surprised uh, to see it being the most played card. And of course, that keeps Ragavan in check, the third most registered card this weekend. Subtlety is the third most registered creature. That That's one, crazy, That yeah. one I wouldn't have thought about. That's a uh, shout out to Basic Forest. 991 in the room. Yeah. Uh, Chalice to the Void. So like, it's almost like some cyborg cards are the most played cards. Everyone's really coming prepared to fight these rhinos lists. Yeah. At the last Pro Tour, uh, the one in Barcelona last summer, Chalice of the Void was actually the most played card in the format, like out of everything. And that is a cyborg card, like you mentioned. And now it's even more popular because Cascade decks are doing so well. Uh, but yeah, Boremasters is even more popular and Rain Rainforest also just shows up in so many decks. I mean, rhinos is 15% of the field, but you use it in all all of the other green and blue decks that are interested in fetching. So, yeah, Lightning Bolt, Island, Engineered Explosives, that's another sideboard card. 
Uh, the, the fourth most one is Grief for Creatures. All the way down there at yep. 768. Yep. Then next one after that, Shadowless Agent. Back to back with the Violent Outburst. The One Ring or the Saga. Perhaps I would expect, the f uh, or at least when the ring came out, I would expect the One Ring to be a little bit higher. Uh, but there's a lot of cards, a lot of decks that just don't use the card. But you can uh, only play one of it, remember? So that was my bad joke. Uh, <laughs> this, I think that would be cool. What if it's, what if it was the only limited to one restricted card in modern? You can only use one. That'd uh, be cool. That'd I, be I like the flavor. flavor of it, yeah. yeah, I like the flavor. I'm not sure a lot of the, the control majors would agree that they're only, only allowed to play one. Chat picking up on the fact that there is. Uh, Four more shardless agents in the field than violent outbursts. I was so. going to say that. I'm like, I don't understand why or what deck could be playing shardless agent over well, but violent outburst. I, aren't you? Isn't living in maybe not sometimes playing shardless no. agent? Maybe they're playing like the old black red version. With they it, it could be playing the with, uh, without blue dread dread uh, de demonic dread. Like may, maybe you still have like a John version of uh, maybe of living end. There's, there's a chance. Let's just let's just say yes. Let's just go over it and nod our heads. But yeah, yeah, sure. That's exactly what's happening. Looks like the game is starting. So let's move back down to it. Game number three here again uh, with Domain Zoo versus Mono White Miria Marta. Sorry, I don't. Again, I didn't think I'd ever be saying that this weekend. And as we are, uh, looks like we started off with a um, remind me that a favor inspector. Favor inspector. Yeah, there's 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 a very similar card being printed instead. Of, maybe it's a reprint. Uh, it might be it might be a different name, but I know Frank Carson was very excited to try to build uh, Boros uh, Convoke in Standard. Yeah, he loves his Convoke deck. Last time I saw him play Magic, he was adding a Ember Cleave to a bunny. He had a bunny wielding a huge sword and was able to take the game down, which is uh, pretty good, pretty interesting. I think I also saw something on Twitter about clue tokens being able to do poison damage. That got me excited. And the turn we're going to use this March, we're going to deal with the Wild Nakal, get that off the battlefield. Because our favorite inspector does line up pretty well against this Ragavan, so... Uh, but don't worry about that, we're just going to prismatic ending that one off the battlefield. So, two threats, two answers. Just how we lined it up, we want to try and get to that mid to late game. So we feel like we can uh, kind of win with the things like the, uh, the One Ring and Solitudes, kind of pull ourselves a little bit ahead, gaining some life while also dealing with creatures. You had a chance to take a look at the Martyr deck last round. Uh, what was the green for in Arietta's deck? Was it just for the hay, Haywire Might? For the Haywire Might? Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, what well, we got two green sources and three ways to go find it. I suppose we, yeah, only three ways to go find it. There's no basic forest in this list. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I guess that makes sense if you have, you know, if you have cards in your deck that help you bring one drops back from the graveyard into play, then having a one drop the decks as a, as a naturalized certainly makes sense. So, while Kavu in the battlefield we're going to see a ley line binding with the etb trigger here for the I've got the name of it already temporary lockdown so the creatures will stay around this is not what we want to be seeing a big five five on the other side which of course has an attack trigger of a loot effect or we can exile something from the graveyard we're going to prismac ending the favor inspector Probably dash Ragavan. Looks like that's how we're going to go. Seven damage comes across. Attack trigger. Do you, we want to discard and draw or just exile a card from the grave? It looks like exile. Okay. Tear Asunder in hand for Sam Rose. That's a solitude. Okay. Well, I think Arietta would have been happy to draw that one. I see, I see the one ring, though, for our martyr player. Yeah, one ring plus land drop. Especially while they're tapped out. So, uh, this is a stubborn denial check. Looks like it resolves, but just a load of land in hand. Draw. Sure. I love that flavor. Like whoever in R&D invented the, 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 how this card works, I love it. I the love that you, you draw cards and it tempts you, but it yeah, yeah, costs yeah. you life to do it. Yeah, it's like, how long do you want to keep these counters That's going good, yeah. for? I really love that. I think, yeah, I think they did a, good, did a really good job. Uh, of designing the card. I think they did an incredible job of designing the one, uh, one, the one of one, one card. That that was that was a really good way to hype the set too. What uh, what other sort of crossovers could we have where we could get kind of one of one hypes like that? I don't, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but I'm sure chat will be able to come up with a few. 
Kami's going to attack. That's just for the uh, the attack trigger, not for the damage, because obviously we've still got protection for the turn. Basic forest is going to be our land drop. And Here then, is Thunder. Yeah. Exile your artifact. So nice indestructibility, but I'm not going to... I'm not going to have to worry about that. Just goes to the exile. I think I can see two more rings in hand, though. So, you know, we'll take that. We'll take that. Okay. Here comes a uh, sign, sign of Draco on the battlefield. Big 4-4. Four, four. It gives a, a lot of different abilities to uh, creatures, depending on the card, the, the card type. <laughs> no, it, color in their card, in their mana base, sorry. It's funny how uh, okay. whatever a white deck you know, taps for mana, the opponents are like already reaching for, for the creatures, throwing them into the graveyard. <laughs> so I'm expecting a sweeper there. Uh, but it's, it's just it's just the one ring. There is in this deck, though, we've got a Wrath of God and we've got Winds of Abandon, which, like, I was obviously watching the game uh, last round before we managed to get it on camera, and the Winds of Abandon took out about six creatures and uh, the opponent drew it, obviously go, went and got a load of basics, and then that's what ended up milling them out. <laughs> it was, it was crazy. That's nice. Yeah, nice, yeah. And then, look, one in hand. So for six mana, we've got a one-sided sweeper. Just got to be worried about things like stubborn denial. That's just a basic of the top. We're going to try and draw two more. Think Sam said no. Yeah, he, he's thinking. He's like, I'd like to, I'd like to tap this. He's trying to. Yeah, that's a tie say binder. Say that he had a that happens. No cards are going to be drawn. I kind of like just playing another ring. But saying that, if there's no cards in hand, yeah, I think I do this because I know there's no stun denial. I take the shot while I can so we can go get free basics. Put them into play. Wow. Do so we have free basics? Sort That's... of like a settle the wreckage here without the opponent needing to attack. Everything just turns into lands. One of my favorite plays of all time, LSV, settle wreckage. That was sold, sealed, delivered. The way he was like, I'll get you a token. Yeah, this much time to so settle. That's, Boom. That's also like the most common bluff on Arena, right? If your opponent ever starts spamming good game, the good game <laughs> emote, when you have a lot of creatures out and they don't have anything on, on board, but they have at least four mana on tap, there's about a 99% chance they're yeah, holding Settle the Wreckage. And uh, Leyline's Binding, that's going to take care of this ring. So again, we know if the... the uh, Coast is clear to play any other spell in our hand. I think we've still got another ring if we need to. This is seven mana. Yeah, there is a Maria, I think, hiding in the in the land somewhere. So no creature to return just yet, but uh, that could that could quickly change. A Maria, the Sky Ruin, I think. Yep, correct. And yep. battlefield tapped, cast, uh, tap one white mana, and if you control seven or more planes, return target car, creature card from the graveyard to the battlefield. It's from from the Zendikar cycle, right? So we pretty much everybody knows Valakud. Uh, I don't actually remember what the other lands were. Well, you're you're gonna find them. There was like but... an Oren Oren Reef. Hey, you know this Domain Zudak only plays uh, a couple of basics, and we made them just go get all their basics. Uh, that kind of turns on all our Field of Ruins into Wastelands. And in a deck where they need to have multiple color sources of mana to be able to cast all their spells. Mm. Currently, we've only got green and white on the other side, so we can't even play things like our uh, Leyland Bindings if we draw them. That's the land off the top, though. We do have a treasure token. So if we've got another fetch we can go get, we could play as Gigant on the battlefield, and that's a big 5-5. Five -five. Can't help but feel that we're kind of turning the corner here. Slightly on this Marta side. Just having an unchecked one ring. Our life total is not super healthy, but we do have a Solitude Plus in hand. And here's Giganta. The big 5-5 five -five companion. One of the few left that is playable and still sees play. Draw step. Temporary lockdown. One ring. Tap. Draw two. Oh, we do need to find some action, though. Well, that was a, um, was it the... a Ranger Captain of Eos, so that okay. can go find a one oh, drop, which wow. can go find the Martyr. There is a Martyr already. I think there's also a Solitude. <laughs> yeah. I would like to gain wow. nine, nine life. life. With the Emeria in play, that's going to get returned into play every turn. Let's see. The, the Captain can also find more creatures. Nah, we're still raining. 
get that out of here. I'm going to find myself basic, put it into play. You're just going to shuffle. I'm going to solitude. I'm going to get rid of your 5-5. Five five. You can gain 5 life. I love how we keep seeing something new every modern tournament. And this, like, this mono-white martyr deck, I'm pretty sure no, nobody expected I'm... to see that at 5-0 and zero after the first I didn't. 5 rounds. That's a really cool deck. Like, it, it just looks really nice. Well, it's, it's either... It's either really nice or it's lining up really nice uh, against the, its opponents that's playing it. Now we get to return it back from the graveyard. Now we're going to start generating so much line. I guess the only real battle is trying not to get draws with this deck. And so far, 4-0, and and it's looking good for 5-0. and Attacks come across, 4 damage, gain 3. Now this one, this, this is the other advantage, right? If you've got one ring, you don't mind how many uh, temptation counters are on it because you're gaining so much life every turn. That's fine. I'm just going to keep restocking my hand. Here comes a Haywire Might. That's going to hit the battlefield. Yeah, I don't think there is any way for Sam to get out of this. Chat saying the Master doesn't have haste or can't attack. Let's just pass it down. I don't think it's much of a difference, but uh, I will let our table spotter know. We want to keep things nice and clean here. It's been passed down to the table. They're going to, I imagine, the judge is going to be told. It's only one point of damage, to be fair. Not really game breaking right now. Solitude, of course, has life link. So, again, every time we connect with that, we're going to be getting three more points, which can, we can turn into three more cards. Still, we've got a grip. We've got solitude in hand. Still, the temporary lockdown. I think that's an, a land and a uh, prismatic ending. Gonna fetch, go get ourselves another triumph. Try and turn our, our uh, domain on a little bit more. Let's be nine. End, of, yeah, end of turn. Game yeah, number nine. And yep, I got a Draco. I'm offering the handshake. That is going to be it. Advancing to five and zero. Oh. I feel like this is probably the the deck so far this weekend. No one expected it, and yeah. it's currently undefeated. And it looked it looked great. It literally looked great. I can't say there's anything wrong with it. I suppose it kind of stumbled a little bit in game two, and the Zoo deck was able to go under it, being uh, pretty fast. Do you have any other backup feature matches? I'm getting the nod that we do. We're going to be able to bring you some more magic. So let's just go straight across to it. Looks like we've got Team Rhino's Mirror. Uh, are we mid sideboard or is it over? I'm just gonna. They're looking at. Oh, apparently this is over. Okay, they, they literally just come to the conclusion of it, and uh, it looks like. They're, well, they're the, yeah, I think they're just de-sideboarding. Just finished game three. That happens. Let's have a little look. See, so the end of the round has happened, and we've got a lot of games still left. So. We get to talk a little bit more, man. You know, we could go to a break, but we can talk a little bit more. Welcome back to the booth. You just tune in. This is round number five, of course, of nine rounds of modern action that we're bringing you today. I'm Will Hall. That's Martin Yuzo. We've got the other two casters that will be jumping on uh, after us and when we finish here in a moment. I want to remind you that we've got 929 players turning up, trying to get themselves into day number two, where they need a record of X in three or better. Six wins will lock them into day number two. They get to come back, ballot out against the best players in Europe, try and get themselves into the top 64. If they manage to do that, they'll win a nice chunk of $100,000 prize pool that we've got this weekend. But if they manage to get in the top 24, well, they're going to earn themselves a PT invite to Pro Tour Amsterdam and for two extremely good players this weekend they're going to get themselves locked for the world championships in las vegas at the end of the year as a man that's played at very high level stakes how much is what how prestigious is playing at worlds i mean it's the, it's the pinnacle of magic right there, there's no there's no bigger tournament than world so uh if you're serious about magic uh in the sense that you were a very competitive player then worlds is the the biggest tournament you can play it is. have you ever played in any worlds i imagine you have yeah, a few times, and I think sometimes maybe, perhaps in my mindset, maybe I took it for granted. Like back in the days, you know, if you if you if you could grind enough pro points, and then you would just lock up worlds. Uh, maybe you know, with half the season to come, and uh, I remember a lot of situations where maybe I just didn't even really test all that much, just thinking, oh, I'm just gonna play this one deck. Is it gonna be fine? I don't, I don't need any, I don't need any pro points. 
worst case, I'll just play <laughs> at, at, at other worlds the the year, the year after, which I regret a, a, a little bit because In maybe you don't really you know now that there is no no pro no pro system, maybe you know maybe I'm not gonna have an opportunity to do that again, and and uh, it is it is certainly a super prestigious tournament. Also, I can tell you from experience that Watsi always took very good care of us. They 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 always. You know, we always felt very appreciated and, yeah. you know, I don't want to say like rock stars, but like it was just like, you know, you know, you're, you're, you're always staying in the super cool, cool hotel that, that, that Watsi books for you. And, and, you know, they, they give you a bunch of gifts and, and maybe sometimes if it's in Seattle, you could take a tour through the, through the Watsi headquarters and, and, and whatnot. So but it was always now, a very fun, fun and prestigious. Even if you just get to a pro tour now, even a pro tour, they still have a player's, um, dinner almost like you know uh like a big buffet spread they put on with drinks and food and you get to meet and chill out with all the all the competitors there you know some people that can manage to spike their way in you get to go walk around and you just like sloping shoulders with uh you know seth uh Gabriel c for seth manfield these big name players that you've you know grown up watching over the years yeah plus a lot of the times there's also a lot of these watsy people right so yeah you, yeah you know you get to talk to mark rosewater or aaron Forsyth or you know some of the some of the play designers uh, or, and, and game designers just like watching, you know, what's happening and talking to you, just trying to get some feedback on how you feel about the recent sets, how you feel about, you know, some of the card interactions and some of the cards. So it's it's always a very, very cool experience. In Worlds, obviously Worlds has changed in size over the years. Yes. It was big and then it went small to like, was I think it was 24 players only? And then now we're back at the bigger ones. I love the original Worlds where from every Nationals, in every country, the top four, uh, would qualify for Worlds. The top three would make the national team that competed in the national team mm -hmm. team, team competition. The fourth player uh, was just qualified on, on their own. But still, you know, you're still a, a part of your country's team. You travel together, you test yeah, yeah. together. There is this sense of like, you know, everybody in your country is, is rooting for you. I know that always in the Czech Republic when I was on the national team, uh, maybe we're a smaller country, but everybody was was always, you know, invested into how we're doing, oh, sending us way. messages, and and yeah, that was always great. And I really miss that uh, part of magic, like the nationals, you know, all this, uh, the whole country. The world, is, is the world magic yeah, cup. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. That's one thing I always say. I, would, I wish I would bring the the world magic cup back and the hall of fame back. That's like the two things yeah. I think that I'd I'd love to see come back into magic. But I don't make the rules. I just talk about it and, and, and do the coverage. We've got six more games left in the room, so we're going to still have a, a you know a little bit of a chit chat with all you at home. So if you've got any questions, make sure you post them in the chat, and I'll try and you know either answer them myself or pass them on to the big man himself, and we'll get you some answers here. Team Worlds was gas, yes, it was indeed. I, I used to enjoy watching that so much. You know, you know uh, I don't think England did well very often. But Maybe, it's but not about it's, it's, it's just the it, atmosphere. Yeah, right? it's not about you know doing well there. It's just I think. Nationals was already the one tournament where you already feel like, wow, I really want to do well here because that's going to help me qualify for Worlds or World Magic Cup. Yep. And maybe if I do well there, maybe, you know, I can play another pro tour and maybe you know, I'll make some friends. I'll have a bigger team to, to test with. And uh, I certainly do wish they would bring back Nationals and, and you know, the World Magic Cup and these tournaments where... Uh, you know, it's 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 also just something nice for the communities, and and yeah, I really miss I, that. I miss them. I, I that was the one thing that like I always said I'd rather I'd rather qualify to represent my country than yes. myself at a pro tour. It was uh, controversial. Some people said no, no, no. I always want to do pro tour, but no, I'd, I'd love to go like represent my country. Uh, chat saying I need a monocle or a bower hat. I actually have both. I just sat over there, chat, and uh, I'll, maybe I'll wear one in between, or I'll post it on Twitter or something like that. Uh, it's not Eurovision. <laughs> For all, the, for all the Americans watching that don't know what Eurovision is, go to YouTube, type in Eurovision. You're welcome. It is some absolute weird shenanigans that we have, hold in Europe. Uh, I think we can get Australia involved now, but um, here we are. A couple of last tables just putting their results in. Why not? Why wouldn't I wear the hat on stream? Um, legal reasons. I don't know where I'm going with that. I clearly don't have a hat, chat. If anyone wants to buy me one, feel free. I'll wear a hat. I'm not scared. Uh, da, 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 da. it's more fun now. I've now got chat talk about Eurovision too much. I'm sorry, chat. <laughs> I actually see a lot of countries just organizing their own nationals. I think I, I saw it recently on Twitter. Maybe it was in Denmark. Maybe, maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they do, yeah, yeah. Just like you know, a lot of the players just saying, Hey, for the old time sakes, let's just gather together, you know, with the new players, with the old school players. That's also what I always loved about nationals is that. You always met those people that you used to play with, you know, 20 years ago. Maybe now they have families. Maybe, you know, they have a different life. 
but always for, for nationals, everybody would always show up and they would hang out even they, even if they're not playing. You know, let's have dinner later today, and and you know, it's hey, the gathering, the gathering part yeah, of magic. Yeah, hey, you. you know, what's new in your life, and and yeah, I, I I I really do miss those days. All right, last question before we end the round. If you were playing this weekend, what would you be playing? What modern deck? I would be playing Ragdos uh, Grief. I think I think it's just the most solid deck, and I think you can play you know thirty different decks and uh, do well with them if you if you practice a lot, but. Um, I mean, Ragdos just seems like the overall most, most solid deck to Mod me. Modern day John, The modern day John. Yeah, kind of. See, well, on that one, that is giving the end of round number five. We're going to pass it off to the other casters to bring you round number six. So don't go anywhere. We'll see you shortly.
Welcome back to the Legacy European Tour. We are here at the Regional Championship in Ghent, going on to the sixth round of the tournament. This is day two, uh, six and three advances to day two, which is what these, op these players are hoping to do. Let's take a look here at our meta breakdown for the day. A lot of different decks. Uh, we talked a bit about this before, but anything that surprised you? Um, yeah, a couple of things. So we know the top five, and I, I you know I know the top five. The top five is pretty pretty strong. But when you go beyond the top five, Scales is the sixth most popular deck. That that's something that that surprised me. Also, Domain Zoo fell off a bit compared to yesterday, compared mm -hmm. to the previous tournament. It was actually firmly in the top six, seven, eight range, but now it's what six, seven, eight, nine, tenths. Also, Mono Green Tron fell off significantly. I remember LMS Bologna, where it was like this, the first or second deck. Now it's like 12th. Uh, so it, it fell off si yeah, significantly. Also, I'm surprised is decks like Is It Wizards or Dimir Shadow are above decks like uh, Jeskai Reach, sadly. Um, but, but, but there we are. And we've got seven players on Is It Wizards. Seven players are on Shadow. Six on Heliod Ballista. And normally these decks are like you know singular copies or zero copies, but here we've got seven. So a lot of players seem to have brought their pet decks, and we even got no two copycat combo, two dredge, uh, two you know escape shift, three escape shift, and twenty one aren't even listed. There is not enough space, even though we've got so many deck names. So splendid meta game. Yeah, we even have five players on Demir Meal. Such a fun deck, and I know there's one that is doing particularly well, but that's not where we are going to show you this round. This round, we are showing you a player that is 5-0, oh, that didn't lose a single match this day, and it's Arne. Arne playing Merktide. Uh, very surprising score, very great score for Arne, a great player. Let's take a look here at our players, uh, and what is Arne playing against? Arne is playing as Golgari Yogmoth, and um, as as you said, he, he he hasn't lost today. But again, to to reiterate the point, he hasn't lost any match, and he hasn't lost any game. He's actually five o ten o right now. He also said that he played the deck. I mean, previously, of course, he was testing it. And he said that it's well positioned. He doesn't have any terrible matchups. He loves the play style, which is unsurprising to people who know Arna. And he's 9-0 and against Rhinos in testing. And he mentioned a specific card that is really good against Golgar, Golgari Yagmod. And what card is that? Stern Scalding. Stern Scalding, and I do think this is a, an absolute game changer for blue decks. It is. It, it just is. As you can see, blue... Lists playing even four in the main, in, in the 75, no, 2-2 two, two split, 1-3, one, 3-1, three, three, one. Uh, different approaches. And Arne is just such a good player and, and is such a good blue player that uh, yeah, I'm really not surprised to see him here. We see Arne over and over again in our feature match area. Uh, tournament after tournament, yeah. make it into top eights, making it into day twos. Uh, so obviously a great player and... I'm excited to see here how he pilots this Is It Merktide deck, which we see a lot of. It was one of the most played decks here for the weekend. The tournament is open deck list, so both players have access to each other's lists. And for all those interested in the nitty gritty of, of his deck list, there are three ledger shredders. Double Subtlety main deck, and he plays double Stern Scalding, double Spell Pierce main, 18 lands, that was pretty classic. And uh, the sideboard is a bunch of one-offs, triple EE. He is ready for Rhinos, that, that's for sure, triple channeler, not a full playset. And we start here with Young Wolf on Alex side. Yeah, and Arne is looking at Dragon Rage's channeler and not Ragavan. Thankfully, because Ragavan hates wolves. They do have undying. So monkeys and wolves do not get along together. They do not. No, they do not. Usually does not end well for the monkey. And we have here Arne uh, playing land. Alex attacking here for one. 
Yeah, just a bit of damage. Now, I'm not even surprised to see a 5-0 Yogmos. That's one of the to top five decks. I would even say top top three, top two decks right now. Uh, interestingly, no DRC was deployed on turn one. And so the reason, so you might not see the reason immediately, but if you are on the draw and you play your one drop on turn one and pass, the opponent can just Bowmaster it. So he played, uh, played around Bowmaster by just not deploying the creature until it's safe. And Alex did have Bowmaster and he did not play it. So we've got a lot of unseen, unspoken kind of, you know, thinking and playing around stuff. Uh, at this very early stage of the game. Cracking the fetch here, getting a steam vent stopped. Shuffling up. As you said, Alex does have access to pull masters. The most played card of the weekend. Yeah, Orkish Bomb says, you, you really have to know how to play around it, how to um, navigate. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult card to play around, but it is possible, and you can gain a lot of percentage points by uh, yeah by being pr pretty experienced. And we see a lot of draw go action, so we expected maybe one drop into one drop creature creature removal, but we actually see you know Golgari Delva with the young wolf getting getting into the red zone every single turn. And we saw here Arne playing an island and passing, not playing iteration. Yeah, just making land drops. Just being very careful there. Keeping mana up. Land attacking with Young Wolf <laughs> yeah. for one. I mean, you know, if it's not broken. Yeah, and actually, yeah, pass back. And then Arne will probably go like Ottawa pass back. I see stands called in counter spell, I think. Bobble. Oh, he actually hasn't been playing the bubble even. Keeping it for like a maybe DLC turn, which he hasn't decided it is yet. Otoara played as a land there. Will he pass back again? Okay, that's Ledger Shredder. Trigger. So we have the Mishra's bubble and then we have the trigger from the Shredder. We're going to connive. Curious if you were going to see double uh, double bowmasters, like bowmaster, counter spell, bowmaster, bowmaster, counter spell. <laughs> okay, so that that first part was there. So we do have the knife trigger here. We are drawing from the shredder, and now we have to discard a card. If it is a non-land, which it's definitely not going to be a land because there's none in Arnis, and I think um, that shredder gets a plus one plus one counter. Looks like Bubble goes into the bin and that Shredder gets a plus one plus one counter. Arne is cracking the Bubble, looking at opponent's top card and passing. Okay, we draw that card immediately. Drawing there, not forgetting the trigger. I, that, that's kind of a desperation move. You've got four mana, you're really well developed, you can multi-spell, especially as Arne is tapped out, but you actually opt to, um, you know, self-stone rain to get extra card, but you're not capitalizing, I think, that well on, on, on Arne's tap out. Alex that's, plays an offling here and passes. Yeah, that's a, that's a fetchland, I think, Vernon Catacombs. And let's see what's played. Expressive iteration, often dubbed one-off, if not the best card draw spell that we can play in modern. Uh, and uncommon, mind you. Very good card uh, alongside Ledger Shredder, as it naturally triggers it, right? Because iteration is the first thing, and then you probably find another spell to play uh, to connive it. Working very well as well with Bubble, because even if you don't have anything, uh, anim anime mana available, you can always Bubble. Yeah. So it looks like we got a Bolt there. And I I really like the, the era of alternative art in Magic, because in chat someone asks, what is that black card? And the answer is, there is no black card. <laughs> so, yeah. So it's the Offling that is getting Bolted.
Let's see if Alex has any response to that. There's also the connive trigger from Ledger Shredder. So the connive trigger is resolving first hmm. here. Another bubble. Drawing, discarding Ragavan, putting a counter on the Shredder. And we bolt the Athling. Yeah, Arne is pretty patient. He's he's also he also doesn't play too defensively, which I, which I like because being patient is not the same as being passive. And I think he's picked his spot. He knows there is nothing that Alex can do to like properly punish him. If he just slams Yogmov, uh, Yogmov can't accomplish that much. And passes. Uh, he passes without playing preordain. Does he have Stern Scout? I don't think he does. It might just be a bluff. I, I think it might. I think it might. That's a, that's a very good reason. Uh, that's, a, that's a very good catch uh, of you. Yeah. Cracking the catacombs there. Oh, I like this bluff. Because Arne know that Alex knows the decklist. Right? And so Arne might be holding up stern scolding. Now. It's not like Alex can play around Stern Scolding because his entire deck is countered by it. But it will mess with his head a little bit. I like that bluff uh, of Arne's. Mm, cheeky, cheeky. And things like these are probably why Arne is 5-0 with his deck. A lot of experience, a lot of these tough spots and... knowing where to bluff where to play the cards. Yeah, exactly. He knows, he knows, because it's not like you should always bluff, but he knows when to bluff and when not to. Okay, so we've got Grist. Now, I think, yeah, so Court for Grist means there is no Spell Pierce, but it doesn't mean there is no Stern Scolding. Let's draw a card. Mer Ooh, Merktide. Oh, Merktide after the Grist take down is pretty decent. Yeah, could also be saving Priority for, for Shredder. So there's a lot happening, and I, th I have to say, I like how Arne is playing. Um... These high velocity decks that can take multiple actions every single turn. I think they are tricky, and this is where you will see the most variety between players, how they play, what decisions they take. One interaction that I really like in the Yagmod deck is that if you do have the um, Agatha Soul Cauldron and you exile a Grist from the grave. Your creature that got the plus one plus one also becomes a mini Grist. Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. Which is very difficult to contain. This is also where we see Brotherhood's End to be able to destroy the cauldron or just sweep the board. The Chandler is on the board. I'm sure there's Delirium already. Okay, checking. Draw. Subtlety is the pickup. Here, getting the land and playing that Mark Tide. And he just taps out. Hoping for no more Grist on Alex's side. So let's hear Arne carefully choosing what cards to exile. Yeah, that's important. Because sometimes you want to maximize the, the size, but sometimes you don't because of a potential subsequent Murktite. And the top deck is a land, I believe. Flip. Young Wolf got a single token. Well, if Arne can just smash in for 10... I 
I have talked to the Yogmoth master, Zerk, um, who is the, the current reigning Polish national official champion, and he said that is it Merktight has to really apply pressure, preferably evasively, uh, to be favored in the matchup, and we see that exactly that Alex passes back to Arne. We have there an insect from Wrist. So that Merktide is a 7-7 seven, seven flyer. Yeah. The Chandler also has flying. Alex is at 13. And right now, we've got a lot of options. Arne is doing the traditional gesture of putting your hands on top of your head, <laughs> indicating deep thought. Four mana available. DRC subtlety. We could, we could cast both. First, we go to attack, or we don't, or we do. Switch them around. The Chandler for sure does need to attack. This is potentially 10 damage. If there's a bolt... I think the DLC is going at Grist and Mercury is going at the face. Now, it does make perfect sense because this is a turn to clock regardless. If you attacked Alex, he would go down to 3, which still means he's dead to the to the board, so he might as well s s uh, split the difference. And it looks like that's exactly what Alex went for. We okay. have another Chandler and Pass, leaving four men up. We know about an Olid. There's a subtlety. Oh, but there's a Code of Calling, and Code of Calling, historically, is not a creature spell. So Bosager is deployed. Three mana. And there will be some tuppage. Court of Calling. X equals four. Now, crucially, you might, if you want to, you might, you can, search for something that's not a four. You could still search for Grist, for example. Um, this could be relevant if you want to make the opponent think it's Yogmoth. Um, they might think, okay, I don't care about Yogmoth. And then you find something else. It might be a niche scenario, but it's worth knowing and taking advantage of when the opportunity presents itself. And Arne thinking here. If the spell resolves it, it puts the creature right into the battlefield. And that resolves. So we get Yagmot there. Yeah, so it, it is indeed Yagmot. It didn't have to be, but it is. But you've got just six life, so every activation is actually a proper, proper meaningful cost. Um, and there are a lot of flyers in our yeah. side. We could see a holy heat on Yogmoth. We can also allow Alex to lose life, activate Yogmoth, and just flash in subtle the end step. Um, that's yeah, interesting things are happening. Um, if Alex draws a bunch of cards, so, so like maybe his best line is to like sacrifice your geist, draw a card, and hope this is endurance. Like literally, just 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 hope the first draw is endurance, and then not go any further. But looking at the list, yeah, there is a single Endurance main. Alex down to four life. And 
Oh, yeah, getting lower. Ane, looking at the bolt count, I think he has three. This Th card gains some life, though, if it resolves. Uh, yeah, you don't have a target, so you would have to just sacrifice it to Yogmoth, which is basically gain one life. Well, at least it's gain one life and not lose one life, so kind of like a free draw with an upside. Going back to four here. Two mana left. What does Alex need to be able to survive this? Oh, it was past the turn. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and GG. That was game. Arne up a game here. Yeah, that was, that was pretty clean. Arne, 11 and 0 in the tournament as of this moment. And what a game. We saw here a lot of patience from both players in the beginning of the game. Uh, they definitely approach these uh, more carefully. How, how do you think they will sideboard for this matchup? Yeah, let's... let's start to see Alex sideboard if possible uh, and see what the Yagmod player is in the sideboard against Arne. So we see uh, Shalifs of the Void, Fulminator Mage, Totsis, Push, Force of Vigor, Go for the Throat, Legion's End, Reclamation Sage, Solus Jar, and Endurance. What might be coming in Alex sideboard? So it depends what kind of role Alex wants to take, because he could go with the double push, go for the throat, for example, uh, to combat the early pressure, go for the throat, you know, against Ledger Shred, against Murktide. Fatal push against these small creatures. Now, we know almost certainly that Ragavan is sided out because that, that's how you play the matchup. So he can assume so. Now, assuming so, maybe Fatal push has a bit too few targets. Uh, Thoughtseize, also a possibility, but that might get the deck to a bit of a too controlly of a position. Uh, Endurance, also just generically pretty strong, so we could see uh, that... Yeah, we could see that come in. Uh, but I'm also interested in the Arne's uh, deck. We see here three Engineer Explosives, two Brotherhood's Hand, two Flutterstorm, one Blood Moon, one Magus of the Moon, one Cast into Fire, one Force of Negation, one Stern Scolding, one Dispute, one Brazen Borer, and one Tishana's Tidebinder. A lot of one-offs. Uh, what do you think here of this sideboard? Yeah, a lot of one-offs, as you said. I really like going from the down of the list. Uh, the Shunastein Binder could be good. There is a lot of a a activi a abilities to be counted, um, or, but the, it's difficult to convert the body. Petty Theft could come in handy, but again, it's kind of like a 50-50 card. Stern Scolding is like a 100-0 card. Like Stern Scolding is something I do want every single time. Uh, I'm surprised we don't see even a full four copies in the deck. There's just three. Uh, cast into the fire, you know, kill early dogs, you know, 1-1. One, one. Brotherhood's End what, is really good. What happens if you uh, Tishana's Time Binder... Uh, never mind. Yogmoth's ability? Yeah. So what could happen is, yeah, Yogmoth activates, the draw is on the stack, you play Tishana to counter it, and then Yogmoth can re reactivate as many times as they want in response. Uh, but then when it does resolve, uh, Yogmoth loses all the abilities for the rest of the game indeed. Brotherhood's End is a relatively new addition to Merktide, but it has two uses against Yogmoth specifically. One, destroy artifacts, which is basically an overpriced way to kill Agatha Soul Cauldron, or a mass removal spell, because Yogmoth very often goes wide with Bowmaster, Army Token, Mana Dogs, Grist Tokens. It also kills off Grist. So this is the main use. But you can also get rid of Agatha, which is pretty problematic. Let's take a look here at our players as they are getting ready to start this game too. Uh, now with Alex on the play. And Arne really does show us a lesson on how to play this deck. Uh, it's, it's a great, great showcasing of amazing players. Alex as well doing 
amazing this tournament both 5 and 0 oh. it's not easy to be 5 and 0 oh in a tournament like this this is a regional championship players already qualified to be here and they are actually just one win away from a day 2 from locking day 2 oh that's true yeah you can look at it this way as well very close so this is not a win and in it is a win and in to day two. Yeah, literally, yeah. Wolf turn one and dying wolf here. Arne with three bubbles or at least two bubbles. Well, this hand could be anything. One bubble, two bubble, three bubble. Great. Land and almost the full play set. Cracking two of the bubbles. In the third one as well. We already know the cards. Draw three, literal ancestral. And this is also why you side out Ragavans, so you don't you don't you don't have this liability uh, against these types of draws. Halfling, and we see whether it resolves, and then we play a land because we might want the opponent to think, might want them to think that we land screwed. Still, scalding drawn right after Halfling. That's not the the order you want to do it in, because now the the legendary creatures are uncountable because of Halfling. That is true. And now, Arne, with a lot of options, we start with Preordain. Unholy Heat, yeah, we'll probably take Heat, kill. Um, and keeping kill both cards. Halfling, yeah. So we do have uh, removal there and Holy Heat on the Offlink. I see that Arne does have a couple of uh, iterations. Mm. The worst thing for Arne would be to see Grist. Uh, but we don't, but we don't. So he, I think he's pretty happy. So here we see a wall of roots. And blood artist as well, I think. Yeah, that is blood artist, yeah. So, Philippa, when you play Magic, do you prefer this kind of more patient game, games, or do you like action? Well, I, if I played as well as Arne does, <laughs> trust me, I would enjoy these kind of oh. uh, games. But oh, oh. Ooh, Arne playing! Wow, we so cast into the fire. Target two creatures. Alex says, "Let me tap out fully for Code of Calling and eat a spell piece." No wonder Arne is literally undefeated. He timed it perfectly. Now we see a land of the top past the turn, uh, and Arne full grip iteration on the stack. What wow. a game! And I, I see some people t talking about Spellpius in this matchup. So in the past, Spellpius was the fastest side out. But in nowadays, because of cards like Court of Calling, which is very key, and now, and crucially, Agatha Soul Cauldron, Spellpius gains, uh, gains a lot more value. Like Agatha is so problematic that, you know, Spellpiercing it on turn two, for example, on the draw is very valuable. And Alex has two cards left. Arne uh, with at least five cards. So we, we start with iteration here. We're going to look at the top three cards. We see a bolt. A counter spell and something in the middle. Maybe shre uh, Shredder as well, Leisure Shredder. Oh, might be. But I can see Arne is playing it very safe. He doesn't play Leisure Shredder. He just wants to hit his land drops, just prolong the game. He knows he's safe as long as he's got counter magic. I I really like the way he plays. But I think he missed on the land drop in this iteration. Oh, it's Mark Tide. 
Okay, exile counter spell, pass the turn. Attack. Two mana left. No, attack here for two, down to 12. Full grip for Arne. So Arne is playing it safe, but he doesn't capitalize on the opponent stumbling a little bit. Fetchland played. Loot a delta there. Arne now has access to more mana, so and let's mark tight. Yeah, dragon, dragon, dragon. And now he's holding up three mana, which is Stern Scolding plus Counterspell, if I'm not mistaken, which makes it pretty safe. It's not a two-turn clock, it's three turns. Oh, maybe it might not even be. It would have to be an 8-8 and 7-7. Seven, seven. It's, it's a 5-5. Five, five, five. Five. So it's a five-turn clock. It's going to take a bit of time. We have seen that Arne is not in rush. Very precise, very clean, uh, and here playing very optimal. Okay, so now... And some people pointing out there might be a second Merktide in end. Yeah, there might, yeah. That might be the reason that this first one... Is a bit smaller, yeah. It's a bit smaller. Conveniently, four spells in the graveyard. You follow up with a fetch to make it five cards. Starting here by fetching. And then the first Merktide grows because the trigger is is a global. So whenever, whenever a card leaves, Merktide grows. So basically... The second Merc Tide will enter uh, plus four counters because you have four spells, and the first Merc Tide also gets the same buff. Uh, and so now it's plus four, it's a nine nine. Uh, so it's a two turn clock, including the other Merc Tide. Uh, I have to say, I love the way Arna is playing. And we're attacking here for nine. <laughs> Can Arne go literally in 12 and 0? Oh? I'm tapping here. Alex, let's see what we can do against these two big Merc types. There is, yeah, Legend double Stern Scolding. So a Grit would be countered. Your both would be countered. There might be a like Cord of Calling. And we're having a master class on yeah. Merktide. This match should be replayed. Yes. For people to so maybe maybe someone can get Arne to cast over your his own match, you know, like on YouTube. That would be always splendid. Grist immediate stands calling, and we've got that set six and no, twelve and no for Arne. And so clean as well. That was clean. Great game. <laughs> Arnie making it officially in today too. At oh. six wins, we are for sure seeing more of Arnie in this tournament. Uh, Alex just needs one more win to make it. Five and one is still a great score and um, great games here. Very, very nice. Yeah, that was... Arnie also a very good content creator. Uh, so for sure, you can all check out uh, his content and you can learn a lot from it. Yeah, so let's switch. Uh, actually, yeah, we can see the sideboard here very quickly. Uh, creature sided out, just Merktide Ledger in, Ragavan DRC out. Pretty clean, pretty, you know, kind of a classic approach. Uh, congratulations to Arne going 6 0, 12 0 right now. All the Blue Mages unite and pass the turn together with Arne. But let's switch to the other match because that's not over. We won't keep you waiting. Uh, Simon David on Team Rhinos 5 0. Atienza Rocapau, Team Rhinos 5 0 as well. So Rhinos Mirror. Well, I think one of the one Rhinos player will for sure win here and advance at 6 0. Uh, the other one will go 5 1. Although there can be a draw. Yeah. So let's see what's going on. We've got double suspended rhinos. 
uh, we see Lorien reveal, and it seems like David is 1 and 0 oh currently, so the first game must have taken quite some time, hasn't it? Looks like it probably did. And how do you approach this matchup, Rhinos versus Rhinos, the mirror? What a question that is. I mean, so this is where you both play the same deck. With your own the play, you can do the same thing faster than the opponent. And that's true every single time. If you're a you know, Ragavan deck, the opponent can Ragavan you faster than you can. And so if you're playing the mirror match and you're on the draw, you should assume a more defensive role because if you keep doing the same thing, the player on the left will win because they do the same thing faster. You can just imagine a situation if, you know, everyone is playing 20 bolts and 20 mountains. And so you want to block a bit more, have a bit more defensive spells and try not to enact the same game plan. Now, that said, <laughs> I can fully imagine just Okay, Rhinos pass. Okay, Rhinos pass. Hope I can block. Okay, you block. Okay, Rhinos pass. <laughs> this is also something that's entirely possible. We start taking some of those suspend counters. Land here for David. And just pass. And we see that uh, Atienza is Force of Negation, Tichetta's Tidebinder, Fire and Ice. Looks like Atienza fetching here. And we see Atienza looking what land to get, ends up choosing an island there. Yeah, just a basic island. No need to take needless damage. And yeah, the grip is pretty full, but it's full for both players because there is a restriction on the on the CMC of the cards you've got. Uh, you we, we will not see like triple one drop played. And I see some people playing about Arne's Twitter. Uh, well, let me just copy it into the chat. No worries, I got you. I do got you. And we saw Tidebinder being one of the cards, the most played cards here this weekend uh, in our top cards list. Why do you think so many people decided to bring this new card from Lost Caverns of Excellent to this tournament here? W which card? Tishana's Tidebinder. Oh, Tishana's Tidebinder. Yeah. So the card is very very multi-purpose th th this is the thing you would be surprised how many abilities there are which maybe we don't recognize as we play because again typically you don't count abilities unless you play stifle in all the format or trig bind if you're crazy um and so it turns out that you can counter and shut off you know shieldred yogmoth potentially um, you can counter Fetchlands, you can counter, you know, just, just, just so many other things, you know, Undying. It's unreal. And so when people caught up to what's happening, it will be like, okay, okay, this card is useful. And in Rhino specifically, there are two uses. You, you cascade, you cascade into Rhinos, it triggers the opposing Chalice, and you go, whoop, Tishana, counter that the Chalice trigger, resolve my Rhinos. That's one. Two, you've got Rhinos, the opponent pops the EE, and you go, okay, whoop, Tishana, counter the EE's ability, keep my Rhinos. And so it's very relevant against the relevant cards in the matchup. A lot of people ended up choosing bringing this deck here for this tournament. 
And really paying off for both players here with a great score. Yes, I, th I think there might be some timing confusion. We've got double double footfalls on one counter. And there's ice on the stack, it seems. Uh, I th okay, I think I think they're double checking some timing, targeting potentially. So the judge is there just to see what happened. Somebody is asking, what do you think, Skura, of playing violent outbursts in opponents and step? So is that is that a general general question or is that a question to this particular game? That that's important because you know. Overall, that's one of the best things you could do, although sometimes it's better to do it on the opposing upkeep. So that will depend. Um, yeah, unless you're talking about this particular situation. Well, right now, I, did, I didn't really um, catch up with, with what's going on in each player's hands. I'm kind of lost. <laughs> In what's going on right now? Looks like uh, the player missed the draw. Yeah, we'll. So it looks like they are just going to go back a bit. The player is going to draw a card and get a warning. Okay, okay. So backing it up a little bit, yeah. So the player on the left has. Uh. Let me try to make out... Okay, I think it's Gemstone. Uh, gemstone, Mutavolt, Flame, and something with no red mana available. And as the judge is taking their decision and going back, I would like to remind you that this is the regional championship in Ghent. We are currently in day one. The format is modern. There are nine rounds, and all players with six wins or more advance to day two. This is currently round six. So if one of these players ends up winning here... the the, the game uh, for sure will advance to day two. Tomorrow we have six rounds and a cut to top eight. Top 24 qualifies for the Pro Tour and the first and second places to the biggest event of the year, the World Championship. Oh, the World Championship, yeah, absolutely. And it looks like they are... Uh, Resolving, so going back there, that crashing footfalls is going to potentially make here the two rhinos. But we see force of negation hard cast. Now it can be counted back because we see false island, Tishana, Lorien revealed fire eyes, and I wouldn't be surprised. If our hard cast counter of Lorien Revealed went up to Glorious 1. Atienza asking how many cards David has in end. Ooh. Just letting Ooh. the counter. That's interesting. He doesn't force back. He says, okay, that's, that's okay, it's okay. And looks like uh, Atienza here draws a second Tishana's Tidebinder. So, so, yeah, so now I think he wants to force off negation the opposing Rhinos, potentially, or gets to some Tishana action. And this card has been so good all over the weekend. Yeah, with Tishaning, the trigger, still holding up uh, Fire Eyes and still holding up Force of Negation. Uh, even though we let we let our own footfalls to be countered, so a very, may I say, passive, maybe reactionary approach. Maybe that's a better phrase. 
and you're trying to use ice. Okay, so we're icing probably the Trium. Yes, we will we will let our spotter know uh, about the footfalls, no worries. And we have violent outburst here. For sure eating crashing footfalls. Yeah, and we'll force of negation it immediately, I can imagine. A lot of full art cards in this deck. Okay, the judge seems to be already there talking about what's happening. And we seem to have a fix right now. So it's fixed here. And what is Atienza doing here? Force of negation. Pitching Lorien's reveal and countering the crashing footfalls. Does ice resolve? Does ice resolve? Okay, we, we had a proper stack there. So again, it looks like there's some confusion on the timing, yeah. The timing. Yeah, when everything happens all the time, it's it's difficult to determine the timing sometimes. Yeah, but it looks like uh, as you said, Atienza tried to ice the Trium, and in response, David used the Violent Art Burst. Ooh, Murktide is the pickup. Now the classic, let me check my graveyard totally for no reason. Uh, this is, was a classic with Snapcaster Mage, where you just didn't care about the graveyard. You draw Snap, and you suddenly, oh, you're interested in the cantrips, in the removal. And there's, there's an attack here, three damage. That's the very good part about the Tidebinder. Not only does it counter abilities, which is very relevant, it's also a very good body. Yeah, no, nowadays in Magic overall, there is a, I think, big push towards effects on bodies. You've got Kree, like, no, Bowmaster is a premium example, you know, Endurance, Tishana's Tidebinder, Shieldred. Uh, which makes the game more combat-centric, which I think, personally, is a good change. Magic has an excellent uh, combat system. And here, Atienza exiling everything. And that Merc type enters with four counters, so it's a 7-7 seven, seven flyer. Atienza threatening 10 damage next turn. Yeah, and I would like to uh, remind everybody that we're playing regional championship, a thousand people today, and this is the biggest modern invite-only tournament ever, actually, ever. So, yeah, that's a, that's a cool, cool fun fact about well, what we're witnessing. A lot of people here in the venue, a lot of well-known faces to the public. Yeah. Some of them featured here before. We have land here for the the vid and a very complicated situation. Yeah, it's tough, it's tough. A seven seven Merc tight closes games very, very fast. And Atienza is the one down a game. So if he wins this, he equalizes and then they will have dare I, I say like five ish minutes on the clock. I would not be surprised if we saw a draw here. Yeah. Which is not terrible, but it's not ideal either. It's not ideal. So some people say a draw is as good as a loss. Because that's not it. Because like until you've got six wins, it doesn't matter. If you go five oh three, I guess that, that that that's a wash. But yeah, you don't want you don't want to draw unintentionally like this. Ooh, that's 
that's threatening exactly 12. So we have the Multa Vault there for two, Tidebinder for three, and then the Merc Tide for seven. We are activating the Multa Vault on the Vite side to block. Uh, activate Otawara, yeah. So we've got a block on Tishana, and then that is followed up by Bone Crusher on the other Muta Vault. Now, it doesn't really matter, I would like to say, because it's 7 damage coming across in the air. Merc Tide 12 down to 5 for David. And then the following turn, another attack, and that should be GG. So it seems like just the time is passing on the game uh, with the outcome uh, almost predetermined. Well, David really needs to find an answer for that Merc Tide, or this is going to be over very soon. We yeah. see here Atienza fetching, getting Mountain into play. And let's see what's the top deck. It looks like a fire and an ice. Yeah, this might unfortunately end in a draw for them. Because I said that, you know, when they finish five minutes, it's going to be on the clock, but uh, when they begin the next game, but I'm not sure even if that's going to be the case. And the just saying, you go. Your land is the pickup. Go to attack. There's probably going to be some ice action, or maybe yes. hopefully petty theft action. But no, there is ice, uh, which is going to buy him one more turn. And one more turn means one more turn of time passing in the clock round. Uh, much to their disappointment, I'd say. There's a mystical dispute and a tight binder in Atienza's end. Pass back. Flame of f flame of Anor, and this is going to eat the fastest mystical dispute I've ever seen. You only have to pay one because it is blue. Bang. And let's see what's the top deck. I think it's a tight binder. I think that was force of negation. Oh, okay. Unfortunately. Yeah, tough spot for David, and I think they will finish finish with five minutes on the clock, and they will begin with, like, four. They still need to sideboard. They still yeah. need to shuffle. A draw three. Draw three. What is <laughs> David hoping to get here with these um, Lorian's reveal? Yeah, uh, probably a concession. Most likely. Pass the turn back. Just make them have it. By which I mean, make them turn it sideways. Okay, let's attack. And this sideways is game. has been had 5.30 on the clock. And we still need to shuffle up, present, God forbid, any mulligans. And that is going to take some time off that precious clock. Yeah, this is going to be most likely ending in a draw. But let's see. Let's take a look at our sideboard here for the players. Let's take a look at David sideboard and deck to see what exactly can we have against this mirror match. So for Mystical Dispute, we have uh, a lot of resources. What do you think might enter here for the mirror? For the mirror, that, that sounds tricky. So. I think it will depend on the approach. We already saw, saw Flame of Anno, so I think this is a way to catch up on cards and or potentially pull ahead on cards and play a bit more controlly. Uh, but you can side out cards like Bone Crusher Giant, which don't really kill much. Subtlety, well, that would be a card specifically against opposing Tishana or Murktide region, so you could keep that in for these reasons. Uh, Dead Gone, 
again. The dead part, not really relevant. Uh, the gone, a bit more so, but overall, I don't think there is much you can do, you know, disputes are sided in, and time of Anno, like five-ish cards for removal, and uh, yeah, call it call it a day. And let's take a look here at our other Rhinos players, decklist, uh, Tienza. Uh, any particular differences here? A very similar sideboard. Yeah, very, very similar. The, the main difference is like, Atienza has got double dismember main, which is, you know, split a bit with dead gone, uh, th triple flame of Anor in the main deck, but overall very similar, similar composition. I wouldn't be surprised if they submitted their post sideboard, you know, 90% of the cards matching, if not, you know, higher. And let's hear if our players are ready to start this game three, and if there's going to be enough time to finish it, we have uh, the bit here oh, on the play. They, they haven't started yet. They haven't started, and there's three minutes left. So let's see if this end is good enough. With three minutes left on the clock, do you mulligan differently? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, you don't want any hand that's reactive too much. Like, if you have Flame of Annoy, you know, Double Force of Negation, Lance, and, and Mystical Dispute, I think you would mulligan that because you need to put yourself in the best chance possible of actually winning. You do not want a draw here. And Atienza, Gemstone Covens, that is one way of speeding things up, isn't it? We definitely have a good start there for Atienza. Yeah, very good start. And looks like David deciding on playing uh, Steam Vent Stopped and go. There's two Tishana's Tide Binders and one Mystical Dispute and one Shardless Agent in Atienza's hand. Crashing footfalls there, let's suspend it. So there are some questions about added time because of the feature match. And fundamentally, that is true. Players in the feature match get more time because they need to set up, take the pictures you see on the screen, etc. However, the clock we show you on the screen is already updated with that information in mind. So the clock for all the players has run out already and they've got two minutes of their own very specific feature time. So, yeah. I mean, after the two minutes pass, at least you can take your time to play the turns. And there's a judge nearby the players as yeah. well to make sure that the pace doesn't get too slow and yeah one minute left uh searching out and we will see probably like breeding pool or stomping ground here looks like forest okay basic forest okay not taking too much uh life if not if not needed there's also a uh, blood moon on the opponent's deck yeah icing draw Now we fetch. We will fetch. have two mana available. We can't do much in this deck with two mana unless we want to like, stomp main phase. Unless this is this is like a preemptive fetching into ice on the opposing upkeep. Okay, we got an island there. Yeah, we're cutting the opposing deck. Island, yes, yeah, as you said, a Boseju is there. And Whoa. we're just going for the Vitz turn. Zero, zero, zero on the clock. So a judge there should start counting turns really soon. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I saw the hand, the hand gesture, right? Indicating, okay, you, me, you, me, you, me, you. Well, and now the players can take how much time they need uh because it's re irrelevant yeah that, that's yeah that's the that's the classic but remember that there is still an overarching rule which says 
you you have to take game actions in a reasonable time at a reasonable pace so you know Okay, Mute Mute vault. vault here. Nice. And Shardless Agent. Let's try to cascade. And the cascade will resolve actually. And that's all thanks to the ice because Tishana was there. Uh, we will probably see Shardless back on Rocker's side. And let's make two rhinos. That's a great start here for Simon David. Yeah, that, that's a classic, you know, turn two ice, turn three rhinos. Okay, so now we deploy both Seiju, three mana is tapped shardless. So that's a classic force of negation check. And let's take a look here at shardless agent. It's always important to actually pay attention to the cards flip because remember that they end up in the bottom. So if you hypothetically say C4, oh yeah, like here, we saw three force of negation off of this flip. You know, three forces are in the bottom you know, half of the library. So without any fetch, this is actual relevant information. So, okay, and that, that's what David does, yeah? He just goes through and sees, okay, triple force, or even maybe, maybe quadruple force, uh, that many of this, that many of that. And we are shuffling here. We have now the same board on both sides, yeah. almost. Yeah, but the bat, David is the one untapping, uh, which is the position you want to be in. And we are on extra turn two. It's going to be very difficult to close this game. And top, take a counter of the Crashing Footfalls and drawing for the turn another Crashing Footfalls I think is the card on the top of the library there for Atienza. With what I think now there's two Tishana's Tidebinder, one Crashing Footfalls, and one Otawara in Atienza's hand. Oh, we're going into the red zone. Like, this is the type of game because of the turns restrictions that you don't really want to play a game of trading resources because if you both trade off, nobody wins. So you kind of want to lead the game into the position where resources are not traded and they can be converted into a win or a loss. And this is the third extra turn. We will see an attack here. A block here from the... So, two rhinos blocking two rhinos. Makes sense. Yeah, that, that's exactly what I was talking about. We're trading resources, but that just leads to a draw uh, in, in a chess-like fashion. And looks like uh, Atienza here just bouncing one rhino back to hand. Yeah, and because of Trample, all the damage goes through. And four extra turn. Yeah, so this is, a, this is a draw already, and we can see it, because it's turn four, no player can deal 15 damage with the board as is. So they will, they will probably play it out, but... Uh, I think everyone can agree that this is impossible to convert.
And this is the last turn, the fourth turn. One more after this one. There's a violent outburst in end for Simone David. Land and just go. So does Atienza have any way to win here on the last turn? I don't think so with Simon David at 15 life. Yeah. So what's worth mentioning is that if a creature comes off suspend, it gains haste. But it wasn't a if a creature is cast off suspend, but this wasn't a creature cast off suspend. It was a sorcery cast off suspend that happens to create creatures. So they do not gain haste. And this is an attack for four, yeah, for six. And we shake the hands and we finish this one up. Uh, a draw 5-0-1 for these players. And that will conclude round six. This round six was insane. We started with Arne showing us a master class on how to play Merktide. Then we had this Temuriner's Mirror that just ended up in a draw. Uh, what did you think here of the matchups that we saw? Yeah, Arne uh, putting on a clinic. I mean, we came in with pretty high expectations, right? He was 5 0 10 0. So he thought, okay, he better show us something good. And show, he did. Because he ended up 12 0, 6 0. Already locked up day two. Uh, I can only assume he's going to win a bunch more. Uh, trying to get that PT qualification, world qualification, or the European champion trophy uh, with Merktide. And uh, yeah, he's showing us how it is done. Mm, excited to see what other matches we've got, but uh, they, oh, the next one, will be covered not by us, but by Martin and Will. Yeah, and the winner of this championship will go away not only with this trophy, but also an invitation for the World Championship. This is a regional championship and the top 24 qualifies for the Pro Tour. First and second place also get an invitation for the World Championship and a 100k prize pool, $100,000 in cash pool here for this tournament. So a lot of reasons to want to do well in this tournament. And... Um, it must be a really good feeling. They qualified to be here. Almost a thousand players. Yeah, almost a thousand players. We had an LCQ, last chance qualifier yesterday. 400 people wanted to battle it out to get the qualification to play this prestigious tournament. And uh, some of them did top 16, uh, did to be precise. And yeah, it culminated in a thousand person uh, tournament. The biggest modern invite only tournament ever. And with that, we will conclude round six. As Chris said, Martin Yuza and Will will be your casting duo for next round. Stay tuned and we'll see you soon.
Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the Legacy European Tour. We are here in Europe at the Regional Championships, where we've got 929 of the best players in Europe all battling out. My name, I'm Will Hall, better known as Will Hall Experience, and I am losing my voice, so I apologize. And this man next to me, that's Hall of Famer, Martin User. And we're going to bring you round number seven of Modern Action. We've had six rounds leading up to this, two more after this round, before we get to that cut off point where with anybody with an X and free record. So let's get that slide up. Let's see what everybody's main goal today is. Of course, is to get to day number two and how they achieve that. Well, they have to get six wins or at least 18, 18 points to get in today number two. If they're able to achieve that, they can then battle out tomorrow in six more rounds of modern action before potentially, and hopefully for them, get themselves either into the top 24 slots, whether it get themselves a pro tour invite or even better, into that top eight to give them the shot at getting into the final two so they can get themselves a world championship invite in Las Vegas at the end of the year. On that one, we have got some uh, spicy decks oh, yeah. still doing well in the tournament. And luckily for us, they've been paired together. So let's move down to our feature match table where we have got Calibrated Blast versus Dredge. I'll say it one more time. <laughs> Calibrated Blast versus old school dredge ladies and gentlemen we've still got a few uh you know champions out there in the field battling out and we're off to the races calibrated brass on the play going to start with a retro boarded blood crypt love to see it <clears throat> my voice if i if i stop talking chat it's because i'm getting sips of water in between i'm trying to look after my voice because we've got a whole day of casting tomorrow to come as well Okay, let me introduce you the two decks here. So Calibrated Blast, you're probably thinking, I don't even know what this card does. So <laughs> let me put that card on the stream. Calibrated Blast, real quick. This is a mix of a zoo deck, sort of mixed with some reanimator package and a bunch of mid-range stuff. Uh, there's <laughs> Fable of the Mirror Breaker, which is like the, the ultimate mid-range card. There is a Leyline Binding, which is one of the best removal spells. Lightning Bolt, obviously. There's also Persist in, combi <laughs> in combination uh, with cards like Shadow of Mortality, which is a 15 mana card in combination with Calibrated Blast. There is a Scion of Draco, which is a 12 mana card. Uh, there is a Territorial Kavu, which is, a, which is just a big creature to have uh, early on in the game. There is a Trumpeting... Carnosaur, a six mana seven six uh, that has discover five. There's a troll of Casa Doom, and a shield dread the apocalypse. On the other side, we have, as you mentioned, the old school dredge deck: Golgari Thuk, Narcomiba, Stingweed Imp, Ox of Agonas, uh, and the, the usual suspects like uh, Price Amalgam, Cathartic uh, Reunion, Creeping Chill. There's even Tom Scour, Mill Yourself for Five, Dark Blast, Conflagrade otherworldly gaze so this looks like dredge from 10 years ago uh that doesn't have faithless looting but yeah. hey these players mm. are i believe five and one right now you know sodak has been pretty good at getting the uh, dredge in mo multiple formats in multiple uh years this is probably one of his more recent iterations of the deck and uh doing well paying a five and one record so far but it, it this can be super explosive right turn two we can get something crazy like 18 power plus on the battlefield mm. And something you mentioned earlier is that we're playing with open deck lists. So a combo deck like Dredge knows exactly how to sideboard for games two and three because you get to see your opponent's sideboard. So you don't have to blindly put in cards that deal with your opponent's possible ley line of the void, Tormod script, you know, whatever they may have. You get to actually see their sideboard and, and sideboard yourself based on that. So that's a pretty big advantage for the, uh, for the combo players here. I think that's what we're going to see, just back and forth, combo after combo. <clears throat> and here it comes. That's a lot of Narcomibas, by the way. One, two, three Narcomibas coming in. You don't normally want them all in one go. You kind of want them in like drips and drabs to get a lot more triggers so you can mm. get these Prowls Amalgams back from the graveyard. But it's not a bad turn, right? How much power is that? One, two, three, five, six. It's like, what, nine, ten power on the battlefield? Turn two, you take that. <clears throat> I wonder if Dredge is really, like, good in the meta now. Now, like, like we got the Rack 
uh, red, black, and vote decks kind of falling off. Ley lines at probably one of the lowest points it's been in a while. Maybe this is just uh, the time for it to turn up, especially if people are bringing things like Merc Tide, bringing thing, uh, Amulet Titan, mm. Yarg Moth, all these sort of decks. Yeah, I think right now <clears throat> most people play Team Rhinos when it comes to the Cascade decks. There's not that many living uh, living end decks, so mostly the the way to you know try to hate on those decks is with Chalice of the Void. Uh, and yeah, sideboard is uh, sideboard. Graveyard is not targeted as much at the moment. So you're right that that graveyard decks could could certainly uh, you know be the right time right now to play them. Over on the other side, we're gonna go swamp cycling. Go get yourself a godless shrine. <clears throat> I'm hanging in there, chat. I'm hanging in there. Don't you worry. Take more than this to stop me. I kind of got that, uh, you know, when Phoebe and friends gets like ill and she gets that really sexy voice. In my head, that's what's happening right now. So my voice is just sounding really sexy. Okay, Phoebe. <laughs> more importantly, back to the magic. Goblin Shrine going to come in. Uh, wrong. Yeah, Goblin Shrine is going to come and play Untap. That's going to cost us two life points. So this calibrated blast deck, I think we saw it at, it was LMS Sophia, I think. I think we had a player almost make the top eight with it. It was a slightly different version, but uh, pretty much the same base of the deck. I believe it comes from Aspiring Spike. I'm not exactly sure about that, but uh, it is a deck that I think does a lot better in closed deck lists when the opponent has absolutely no idea what's coming or how to even sideboard against something like that. Uh, they may be thinking, yeah, this is like a zoo deck with some awkward cards. Uh, without really knowing what's what's going on now with with open deck lists, uh, it's a little bit different. Uh, we have a Raoul, you know, who's able to just take the first three minutes of the match and study the list, so he knows he knows what's up. Uh, the question is if if he was even able to actually look through all the cards in those in those three minutes, because I wouldn't know what calibrated blast is if if I wasn't uh, on coverage duty uh, last time we had the deck on stream. No, so one, one of my good friends and uh, actually plays this deck quite a lot, but plays the more all-in combo version where you can, like, with Emrakul's and, and you basically just do 15 damage every time. So it's your opponent's going to get themselves down pretty low with shock lands, and then you can kind of one-shot them with Calibrated Blast. But yeah, I say this one is a very much more uh, mid-rangey, reanimate type list. It's got the Calibrated Blast um, uh, kicker in it. We're dredging a little bit more here. Um, I think we're going to have a shuffle. Let's have a little look, see what's going to be going on here. I don't even know, like, how to sign this up. Like, who would be favored in this matchup? It's it's so <laughs> awkward to think. Like, I feel like Dredge can go under the knee, underneath them. But then on the other side, they've got really good cards. Of course, Kavu has got the uh, side effect that he can actually exile cards when it attacks in the graveyard, but... Dredge normally once he puts in and gets the cards it wants out of it pretty quickly. And we're seeing uh, that conflagrate going to the bin. I was just going through all my cards and, you know, I, I kept I kept uh, finding a lot of decks from, you know, back in the days. And one of those decks was Dredge. And <laughs> I actually went through the deck. I'm like, yeah, conflagrate. Nobody plays that anymore. This is not a card that I'm ever going to use again. Well, what did I know? <laughs> it looks like it's back on the menu. Yeah, one time only. Back for this weekend at the regional championships here in Europe. I wonder if, we, if it's worth firing off now. How many cards have we got in hand? Four? Yes, yeah, so can't really do too much with it with a 5-5 cavalry on the other side. But it's, it's not a 5-5 cavalry. We're missing Island, Swamp, Mountain, Plains. Yeah, it's a 4-4. We could actually get that cavalry off the other side of the battlefield with the calibrated black, uh, with the uh, club flag rate. I also miss Infect. That is a deck oh, that I also really, really enjoy Dude, playing. That's uh, you're a man after my own heart. I think everybody knows that's the one deck I want to see uh, brought back. I don't know what would need to be printed for that to happen. Mm. Legolas Resolve in modern would be pretty nice. It'd give us a good, uh, a good shot. I suppose we've got Toxic in standard at the minute. That's the closest we can get to getting our poison counters across. So Raul pretty much all in on his board right now with no cards in hand. He does have a lot of dredge cards in the graveyard, though. 
Yeah, but I say that it, that it means nothing that they got no cards in hand, right? It is a called my graveyard is my hand. This is gonna mm. do the game plan that I'm, I want to achieve. And if you're wondering how does this calibrated blast deck end up, you know, putting this shadow of mortality or sign of Draco on top of on top of their deck because it the, there there isn't anything in in their in their non-line cards. They're actually using Witch's Cottage. Let me put that on the card view real quick. Which is a land that lets you put a card from the a creature card, I believe, from the from your graveyard. Uh, uh, on the top of your deck. So you can use something like Fable of the Mirror Breaker, discard the big card, put it in the graveyard, then bring it back on top, and then use Calibrated Blast. Well, we're just going to play Fable of the Mirror Breaker. And here we go, Dredge in on the other side. Dredge 5. Creeping Chill. That's going to trigger. That's going to do a Lightning Helix effect, gaining free life. Dealing free damage. That is very close to lethal as well. Well, with four flyers coming across, this is going to drop them to one and they have to chum block. All right, so does Dylan have it? Well, you got to think there's going to be enough dredges. We can just go uh, play the ox back from the graveyard, discard our hand, draw three cards, which is basically 15, and all we're looking for is one more creeping chill. Okay. I'm not even sure there's 15 cards left in the deck, so there's a good chance of us hitting that creeping chill. Here it comes. Yeah, I think there's a lot of stinkweed imps in the graveyard, so pretty easy to mill 15. There it is. One, two, three. All right, that's a miss. There, there it go. is, all right. So, that is, wait, that was, the, that was game number one, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that was the, the first game. It's the awkward yeah. game one handshake. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> yes. oh yeah, yeah, GG's. They're getting excited, you know, on camera. Potentially, maybe for the first time, a lot of nerves going to effect, plus a lot on the line this weekend. Let's see if we can get the deck list up on the screen for you all, because it is an open deck list tournament after all. This is the dredge list. Talk me through it. What do you like bringing in at the sideboard here? <laughs> well, yeah, no, nice to put me on the spot like that. I can't talk. In I a matchup talk. that nobody's ever played before. <laughs> so, yeah, let's say let's say you, you just throw me, you know, in in the match with this deck, and I just finished game one. So, what am I thinking? Uh, first of all, I have to go back to look at my opponent's deck because I have to, you know, exactly figure out what they're doing. Are are they a combo deck? Are they a mid range deck? Like, what are they trying to do? They certainly have some aggressive elements with the territorial cover, for example. Uh, so I would be looking at the discard spells. Uh, I want to get their, you know, their combo pieces uh, in the graveyard rather there than uh, wait for them to uh, fifteen me. But at the same time, I'm I'm also thinking. Well, I'm running four creeping chills in my deck, and I'm gonna be milling myself pretty easily. Uh, maybe I can just ignore that part of the combo because if I just gain six life, I'm at 26. I'm not taking that much damage from my lands, so uh, there's a good chance that I just don't care about the the combo. So leyline of sanctity, uh, I would only bring that in if my opponent has a lot of uh, ways to target me and do something you know crazy to my graveyard, which I'm not sure if. Or well, calibrate blast, right? That's probably the only thing. Yeah, yeah, but like maybe I can actually just ignore mm -hmm. that. So. Uh, not Chalice, nor, not Portable Hole, I don't think... You, you can bring in Lightning Axe, you know, seeing the, the Kavu uh, just as an early uh, big creature and the and the Scion, so uh, maybe the Lightning Axe, uh, maybe Wear and Tear, depending on what exactly does the opponent have in the, gra in the sideboard against my graveyard. Well, on that one, let's have a look at what they do have in the sideboard, and you're going to notice there's a lack of graveyard hate, just two wow. Gold Walkers. Yeah, there is no Leyline... No Tormod script or anything like that. No Relic of Progenitus. So, yeah, I would be feeling pretty good about my chances knowing that my opponent has actually no way to stop me from dredging and milling my deck over. So, yeah, I mean, maybe maybe the discard if you really want to. Uh, but looks like this is a matchup where maybe you don't even really have to sideboard. Well, we'll see how, it, how they, it plans out for both of our players. Let's uh, go back down to the match, see how they're getting on with shuffling up. As we move into game number two, looks like they're still halfway through, because remember, they get to look at each other's cyborgs during the matches. I think they get an extra three minutes to do this over the whole uh, uh, round, so rounds are 53 minutes. So they get before each game, so if even it goes to game three, they'll again, they'll get to look at each other's uh, deck list, look at the full 75, to kind of know, you know, 
oh, some of these cards better on the play, better on the draw. How am I going to counter that with my sideboarding? Kind of get into that uh, mindset, that sort of back and forth chess um, of mm. the mind. Because once you shuffle up and you present your deck, you can't change it anymore. One card I was looking at is Dranded Magistrate. Uh, you can't, your opponents can't cast spells from anywhere other than their hands. So you're not going to be able to. Uh, wait, is it actually cast Ox of Agonas? Maybe that's an ability. So this is a card I would be looking at. You know, if it if it lines up well against what they're doing, if if it's the ability of the card, then obviously that that's a little bit of a different story. And I think we also had a Dotty Void Walker uh, in the sideboard. Uh, which is pretty good against someone who's trying to, you know, fill their graveyard with with cards. So at least, at least two cards to to possibly look at. I think Creeping Chill also has an ability. It's not that you play it. So, question: You got these are your only real answers to Dredge. Um, how heavily are you willing to to um, mulligan down to find these? Yeah, I mean, I I guess I guess a lot. If you know, we saw game one that Dylan basically had no chance. Mm -hmm. Uh, Raul was able to just execute his own game plan without any any problems, and if that happens, if both, if both players execute execute their game plan, uh, I think Raul just wins very easily. So yeah, I think I would be I would be willing to mulligan a lot, uh, trying to find the Void Walker. So on Raul's side, he's he's over the moon looking at the cyborgs, going, oh, "Whoa, you don't really have anything against me. This is great." I don't even need to cyborg too much. Maybe you, as I say, bring in a, a little bit of a move in case Adolfi hits the the uh, battlefield. But other than that, Effin's got to be feeling pretty good. As it looks like both players are finishing the cyborging, shuffling up. We're getting into game number two. And we're round number seven here of nine today. We're back tomorrow for another six rounds. And then we cut to the top eight, where we'll have... Oh, this looks like a, a backup feature. Actually. We're just jumping in here on... Uh, <laughs> what are we yeah. jumping in there? Break this down for me. By the way, Arna hasn't lost a game yet. <clears throat> Not a match. He hasn't lost a game. So he is 6 0 12 0 playing uh, Is It Merc Tide, uh, feeling good about his Rhinos matchup, and he is up against our hero uh, with Mono White Martyr, which we also saw in the feature match area a couple times already, but we just keep kind of going back to this deck because it's just, I mean, who expected Martyr to be at the top of the standings in, in 2024? Uh, so this is our backup feature match at the moment. Uh, I believe this is still the first game. Uh, it might it might be going on for a while. For a while, <laughs> uh, especially if there's a martyr coming back from, from the graveyard multiple times a turn. Oh, is a good one. This is a big uh, merc side. Do we, we probably need to leave delirium in? So that's all the instances going to one side. Three. Yeah, we're gonna make it just a, a six six flyer. So one thing that this, uh, this Marta deck does is it gains a lot of life. A lot. And uh, and it just keeps doing that. Yeah, yeah. which is really hard for the, the Merc type side. has got to build that big board, as you said. And then they've got sweepers. They've got solitudes. They've got ways of dealing with the other side. Um, I'll be interested to know how many games have actually gone to time. But the life total is very low. Four life versus two big flyers on the other side. And all I can see in hand is a couple of land. So that's our little look in there. We're going to go back to our main feature match, of course, which is Dredge versus this calibrated Blast Reanimator list. Both players drawing the opening seven. I played a lot of Dredge back in a couple of years ago, and um, Mulliganing is just part of the game plan for this deck. It's It needs the two land. Oh, yeah, yeah. It needs a discard element, and it needs a Dredger. You're looking for very specific cards. Uh, <laughs> your deck... If it has all the cards that it needs, you know, the, the cards like Faithless Looting or whatever you have to put the cards in the graveyard and then the dredge cards to start milling is a 10 out of 10 when 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 all of that, uh, you know, gets put together. If you don't have that going and you, you're, you're missing part of your part of your game plan, then your deck doesn't do anything. You're just sitting there with uncastable cards in hand, uh, nar narcomibas that, yeah, sure, you can cast your two mana 1-1, one, one, uh, but that doesn't really do anything. So you need to, you need to mulligan aggressively to... Uh, find the right to find the right pieces. Maybe we can go back to the uh, second game again before the players finish uh, mulliganing and sideboarding and everything. The game's just ended in that one. I think Arnie managed to oh, take that one down. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, so <laughs> looks like our timing is just a little bit off. And yeah, yeah I think can... yeah, Arna was able to take the first game. I think Ar Arietta was just not able to find uh, the martyr. Maybe or just have anything going because he did have a lot of lands. He did have an Emeria in play. Uh, but I guess that big flyer just just uh, was able to go the distance. Well, <clears throat> while they shuffle up, we'll go back to our main, see if they've uh, finished doing the power shuffling. Nope, we're still still more shuffling. 
Welcome to Modern, ladies and gentlemen. If you've not watched Modern before, this is uh, basically all we do. We just shuffle our decks over and over again. We got rid of Yorin for this reason and uh, still can't get away from it. But I understand Dredge, it's got a lot of key cards. It uses its graveyard a lot, so it does clump together a lot of its like threes and fours in the deck, so it does need a, a good shuffle. <clears throat> Now look, look at our opening hand. I see a couple of lands. I see Discarder. We're just looking for a Dredger now. If we can find a Dredger, I think this will be a key. I think that might have been the Stinkweed as the last card there. Kind of the perfect six if it is. So on which one we want to pick to the bottom, one of the lands. And then Gemstone Cavern, Ditch and Gemstone Cavern. On turn zero, you now may play, take your turn. Yeah, this might be one of the best decks for Gemstone Cavern because you don't really, you don't really mind, you know, getting some of those cards from your hand, like Narcomiba if you draw it in your hand, or Creeping Chill. Uh, you're perfectly fine ditching that uh, to get an extra land into play. We're gonna Underworldly Gaze. Um, of course, instant speed. Look at the top three. Put any of them back on top of your deck or in your graveyard. We decide to put two lands into our graveyard. Keep one card on top. And uh, just pass turn back. And a little look, see what that could mean. If there's any instance that we could play, doesn't look like there is. Besides a few more of these uh, underworldly gazes. Trium fetched up end of turn. More shuffling. And draw step. What did we find? Looks like a land. Shock in this uh, blood crypt. And Dalf, we void walk out the cyborg. That is key to what we're trying to find here. In response, we're going to use the underworldly gaze in the graveyard. So if we do put more cards in our graveyard, they're not going to get exiled underneath Dalfi void walker. I imagine we're probably looking for some sort of removal spell here. And they would only be in the main if they uh if we cyborg them in and I'm looking at what they could be and it doesn't look good. Yeah, I mean there are a couple of lightning axes. I mean you can use uh not, not in the all they've got is uh pool holes. Uh oh I suppose rapid hybridization. Wait, I'm, i I would swear we're looking at lightning axe when we had the deck on the on the stream. Like I'm a million percent I'm not not a million, but I'm a I'm a Maybe they got, we got the very sure that lightning axes were in the. I think there there was an issue with melee though, showing uh, something different in uh, the deck image. Yeah, than... maybe, maybe that was it. What was uh, happened basically? Because the one I've got up here in front of me is uh, rapid hybridization or pull hole, but we'll come across that bridge when we come to it if it works. Looks like Alva on the other side coming down. We've got a um, <clears throat> magistrate here in the battlefield. That's going to stop oxes coming back out the graveyard. So that's like almost step one. Yeah, rapid organizations in the graveyard. So I think the list we've got in front of us is correct, not the uh, the one that we had on the screen. So apologize for that, ladies and gentlemen. Now we're kind of in the tank a little bit, it looks. Am I missing something? How did... The Dalphy Void Walker. Do we sacrifice it? Oh, okay. We rapid hybridizationed the Dalphy to get it off the battlefield, creating the free free, which we now see. I'm pretty sure we don't have free free fo frogs, is it? Yeah, green frog lizard tokens out in our feature match area. <laughs> There's again another card I didn't think I'd be uh, saying out loud this weekend. So Dranid Magistrate is good, but not as good because it doesn't stop like Narcomiba coming into play or Crippling Chill being played or not played because they, it, it's an ability of the card. If the card uh, gets milled, uh, you just put a trigger on the stack that says that you you can uh, exile it and you know Lightning X the light, uh, Lightning Helix the opponent. So it's a good card, but it doesn't stop everything from the from the Dredge deck. So we're now returning the Dalphi from the graveyard. Going to be doing that by using the... Oh, my word, I can't. 
the uh, possess. That's the one. Getting it back from the graveyard with a minus one, minus one counter. Turning it into a 2-1, but more importantly, it is the other ability where everything is exiled. And that's enough for us to be able to just scoop this up, saying I cannot beat that card. Now it's back on the battlefield. I've kind of used my one shot. Let's go to game three. I'm on the play. I feel favored. And we're seeing a little bit of uh, maybe deep sideboarding here. As we're going to be going into game number three. So let's try and remind you. Let's get the, uh, the deck list up on the screen. See if it's the right one or not <clears throat> uh yeah the, see this one does have okay so it's got lightning axes over the, the rapid the, hi, yeah the hyper hybridization which i think is a, a melee bug i know we we encountered that in in some earlier rounds and then they were fixing it uh so i don't think there is anything anything else going we have a we we, we have judges that are, that are going to uh make sure that everything is case correct but i do believe it is a it is a melee uh image yeah. issue same so play draw dependent i don't even think too much really comes in we've seen that the rapid organizations come in as a way of getting off dial for because they know that's the only graveyard interaction other than that i guess some caverns probably come out which we've got boarded in because now we're on the play i wouldn't mix up too much more maybe swap the extra caverns for some hand disruption we'll see how that pans out let's have a little look at the other list remind everybody at home what's going on in this <clears throat> so we, we've got that as Calibrated Blast, because it obviously does have Calibrated Blast in it, but it's not the traditional all-in combo. It definitely does have this sort of um, domain reanimate type uh, feel to it, because obviously we've got two drops like Kavu into a Fable, into a Shield Dread. Seems pretty good to me, as well as having a Calibrated Blast uh, uh, which, is, which is Cottage to try and get back a, potentially what, a big shot, something like if we manage to cycle a troll into the graveyard, we can just uh, put it back on top, throw it to our opponent's face, do six damage that way, nice and easy, end the game. <clears throat> Is there anything to you change play draw dependent in this sideboard? No, no, not really. I think that's that's typically uh, for matchups where one player can, you know, be the be the aggressor when they're they're on the play, but everything changes when they're on the draw. Like for example, if you're playing against a deck with bowmasters and your deck has uh x1 creatures like ragavan in it then you know you may have a different different plan on the play when ragavan is most likely to hit because they don't have a way to interact with it and then on turn two you're you already have your second land before your opponent does so maybe you're go you're gonna hold a counter spell uh so it's a it's a it's a very different uh game and and the play patterns are very different than when you're on the draw your opponent has a second land when you just played a Ragavan, so before you untap, they can already play Bowmasters and the Ragavan dies. These are the matchups where uh, typically things can change, uh, you know, whether you're based on whether you're on the play or on the draw, and sometimes you're more aggressive or more defensive uh, based on that. All right, well, let's get back down to the game. <clears throat> I'm slowly holding on to the last little dregs of my voice that I do have. So I'm going to remind you all at home that two, uh, 929 players turned up today, battling it out in nine rounds of modern action today. we got two more after this, and hopefully they can get themselves 18 points or better to get re-invited back to play tomorrow to battle it out to try and get into our top eight, where, of course, two players will win themselves World Championship invites. 24 players, they're going to get themselves Pro Tour invites. And top 64 are going to gain their share of a $100,000 prize pool. Well, when we look at openers, looks like we might have a keep over on the dredge side. Hmm, interesting. I still see uh, Dark Blast in the deck. I'm not entirely sure that that one's got too many good targets, but especially in open deck, there's any X1s. Doesn't look like it. I mean, there's a lot of undefeated players because we we had almost a thousand players. So, uh, yeah, we're 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 gonna be able to pick pick some uh, cool matches in the in the upcoming round. Still, we're getting to that that stage now, right? Where you know some people are starting to lock themselves into day two already. They're just trying to get give themselves the best possible shot in day two. Um, you know, by able to calculate the most points possible. If you can end today nine and zero. Oh, if you give yourself the best possible chance of getting into the top eight tomorrow, or at least into the top 24. 
<clears throat> Some people are asking in the chat if you're six zero, you just take three draws in the next three rounds. Like, do people do that? Because that gets you to twenty one points. Uh, so it is something you can do, uh, but it doesn't make a lot of sense because you're also just aiming to make the top eight. You're aiming to make the top twenty four, for which taking three draws instead of playing the three three turns doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. I'm taking a mulligan here on the other side. In my own head when I'm talking, I'm sounding like Henry Cavill in The Witcher right now. <laughs> I really hope I'm coming across like that, chat. Not just some uh, lame duck. <clears throat> of course, no gem sign cavern's going to be able to be deployed here from Rao on the left of your screen, as they will be on the play. And that's scary. Playing against Dredge while they're on the play and they kept seven. I think we got a keeper just to tell which one we want to pick to the bottom of our deck. Yeah, I think Dylan is really incentivized to really try to mulligan aggressively to find that uh, Void Walker if he doesn't really have anything else. And mm -hmm. actually, he decides to mulligan again. I, yeah, <clears throat> I, I think that makes sense. Like, if you only have very few cards that uh, do something against your opponent's deck, uh, I think you should try to find them. Because if you don't, then, well, we saw what happened with... Uh, with uh, Dredge in the first game. We've also seen how powerful it can be, right? Like, game two was literally one off the back of me getting another Dolphy Void Walker into play. It was like, oh, I can't mm. be it. Cool. Scoop. <clears throat> Everyone's just going to finish up shuffling. See, like, we've seen more shuffling in this game than we've uh, actually seen gameplay. Okay, can we find a two lands at Dalphi? I believe that's exactly what we're looking for in this. I'm not sure if this is a, a keep or not. Round the left of your screen, ready to go, itching to go. Look. It's like, I'm on the plate, I've kept the seven. Watching his opponent just mow more and more and more. Looks like we've got a keep on five. Maybe not. <laughs> We've got two more cards to pick back. These two are going to go to the bottom. Yes, they are. And we are off to the races at game at number three. Starting off with just a fetch land. Arid Mazer. Verdant Gatcombs on the other side. Pass go. Crack it end of turn. Are we going to see a underworldly gaze? Or just a tap land? Just the tap land, blood crypt's gonna come into play. Two life not paid. More shuffling. <laughs> Welcome to modern. <laughs> fetch, pass, fetch, <clears throat> pass. Luckily, uh, Sensei's Divining Top is not uh, legal in the format anymore. That's a cool card in theory, and it was a cool card. I, I played it at uh, in standard at nationals uh with counterbalance that was a really fun deck uh but yeah in practice when you mm. top every turn and you know you you spend all the time just looking at the top three cards of your library your opponent's just sitting there it's it's not a good it's not a good experience okay another fetch land it's going to find our second uh mana source and this is key for dredge two's kind of the sweet spot that's where we can start casting things like our cathartic reunion um and our thrilling discovery Kind of one of the upgrades that we got a little bit uh, a little while ago in Strixhaven. Which one of these two are going to get deployed this turn? What do you think modern would look like if Fetchland suddenly were not legal in the format? Like a slightly more powerful pioneer. I feel like you you know, the you'd get restricted a little bit more in your deck building choices, right? Yeah, I think it wouldn't be that easy to play, you know, four, four, four or five color decks. But I think maybe the mana base is maybe you still have, you know, all these lens like, uh, I don't know what's legal, gemstone mine or, you know, something else that you can still make a five five color or four color deck work. Cathartic Reunion, that's going to discard a Stinkweed Imp. That's going to be our first dredge of five. We find another one, so we get to dredge another five. Here comes another 
couple. Ox is going to be one of them. And then our last judger is going to be this Dark Blast for free. So one Dark Amoeba. Don't think we hit any uh, yeah, not price the best. amalgams there. Two mana, one one fly. Let's go. We just went about it the long way there instead of actually hard casting it. Fetch up a triumph in the turn. Something that we've become used to seeing in these uh, the main decks. How many copies we got? We got three triumphs floating around in this one. <laughs> we, really all, we, were, we really are spending most of the time just shuffling, shuffling the yep. cards. Yes, we are. <laughs> we're counting cards off of the top of the deck. All right, let's hope Dylan has something something here he can play. <laughs> that's another, that's <clears throat> another two fetch lands. <clears throat> so maybe maybe a treasure loot Kabu or something to, to really start, you know, putting some pressure on Raul. That's exactly what Dylan needs. But unfortunately for him, looks like he's just passing the turn. And that's exactly what Raul wants to hear. He actually draws a card, so nothing he can dredge there. Yeah, Dark Blast was the last dredger they could. could and yeah. obviously the card he drew is one of the ones he wished was in the graveyard last turn, a prize amalgam. There is an ox. <clears throat> yeah, this is going to be another way of uh, not only filling up our graveyard, but adding a lot to the board if we can find some good hits here. So, discard our hand. We know that's going to put three dredges in, plus this prize amalgam. First dredge. It's going to be for five, this Stingweed Imp. Finds a couple of thugs and Dark Blast, nothing else. Second Stingweed Imp. Another five. Another thug. All right, there's at least a creeping chill. There's the three one zombie, so that's gonna be able to come back because we're gonna gain free life this time. Yeah, get freely into play. Silver moat goal, uh, ghoul is the uh, the free one that you're talking about there. Bug is gonna be our last one. That's gonna do four, one, two, three, and four. I think that's a poison, uh, poison algorithm and an archimeba. It's a great last hit for the end. So triggers are gonna start happening. Free life to your face. I'm gonna gain free life. Is going to be important for that ghoul. Now my Narcomoeba is going to come into the battlefield. That's going to trigger my uh, prize amalgams at the end of turn. And then I'm going to go to combat and attack you for one. Now how much damage is going to be on the battlefield? I think we gain add another nine power to the battlefield at the end of this turn. Yeah, look at the graveyard. I think the graveyard is bigger than the library at this point. So I wouldn't be surprised if Raul is able to just mill the rest of his library next turn. Dredge, dredge 101. All right, that's the ghoul coming into play <clears throat> thanks to the life drain. There's oh, another double ghoul. ghoul. 12 damage going to end of the battlefield. Uh, power going to end of the battlefield. <laughs> and also double amalgam. Thank you very much. Well, we know Dylan doesn't really oh, have okay. any sweepers. That's what I'm looking for. I'm like, do we have anything at all? Any uh, anger the god type effects? Doesn't look like we do. This could be a really quick game three. Yeah, great draw by the dredge player, and you know, mm. if you if you get to execute your game plan without your opponent uh, interacting with you yeah. at all, obviously Dylan took took two mulligans. Obviously that that that's not great. He was looking for the for the sideboard cards against against uh, Raul's graveyard. Unfortunately, have hasn't find it, and that is the that's it. It's gonna be the second loss for <clears throat> Dylan. Dredge Raul. going to six and one yeah, though. Really let's cool. go. Well, we've got a backup feature match for you all, so let's see if we move across to that now. Uh, we have got Arnie still up a game against this uh, this Martyr deck. Is it Merktide versus Martyr? We've seen this Martyr deck quite a lot, but it's floating around the top tables and it's playing against some of the better players in the room. So we decided it's going to keep being on the camera. Yeah, he also managed to beat Titan last round, which can be a great matchup if you look at the if you look at the list on paper. But he was able to draw a bunch of reprieves and follow that up with Elish Norn. Uh, March of the Machines, which basically means that the Titan deck doesn't really have anything relevant for, for the rest of the game. Blood Moon. I wouldn't say that this is the best matchup for Blood Moon. Does turn green off. The one ring off the top got slammed on the battlefield. Draw in an extra card here. Play our planes and go. Imagine Delirium's on, so we've got four power flying in the air. Um, I'm pretty sure that Dragon of China should be turned sideways, but I don't think it's going to matter too much. This is going to be uh, exiling that in response to the tap trigger. Oh, cast into fire. Okay. Yeah, cast into fire. See them popping up a little bit. 
in modern these days. <laughs> Eagles oh, of Lord. the North. All right. Well, that's a 3 3 flyer. I've seen way too many of these Eagles of the North being cast in this tournament so far. Of course, 3 3 flying. ETB gives all creatures plus one, plus O, and first strike. And yet, yeah, tack. I'll take that trade. Wow, that's a Merc Knight off the top for Arne, and Arya that doesn't have anything going at the moment. Lots of lands, perhaps flooding out a little bit. We see a tap at the uh, top of the deck there, hoping for potentially like, yeah, another yeah. one ring, maybe. Uh, Wrath of God would be up there. Wings of Abandon. I think it was just another basic land. Wow, <laughs> Martyr with a basic land in hand, not the, not the best draw. This is going to be an attack for seven, dropping down to three. Hope and yeah, reminder, Arna has not lost a game this tournament, and I believe he is on a very good... No. Nope. Wow, actually hasn't lost a game still. 7-0, 14-0. He's pretty good at magic. Thank you it? very much, Is it work tied. All right. Don't know if you know this, but Arne, he's pretty good at the magic. This game we call Magic the Gathering. He certainly has a great day. This is like the... The day where not only have you picked a good deck, you're getting good matchups, everything's going well, you know, you're you're not getting unlucky in, in uh very close spots. So yeah, everything everything going super well for our, for Arna, who as you said, obviously has been playing great, has been testing a lot. So as they say, practice makes perfect. And let's take a look if we have another Nope, we've got no more backup feature matches. No more backup. I'm gonna have All a little right. look at how many matchups are left in the round. Looks like it's three and a half minutes left on the clock for the round and about good 25 matchups playing so we're going to ruin my voice a little bit more and we're going to do some talking chat so if you've got any questions for us do whack them in the chat and we'll try and answer them maybe how, what do these events look like what else can you do if you're not qualified but you're mates to go and you want to go with them what does playing in the world championships like what's it like being a hall of famer any of these sort of questions you want to ask throw them to us <laughs> i'll pass them across to, to martin user um it, it, it comes with a really cool ring it, you but... do get a nice you do get a oh, it's basically the one ring, right? It there, is. There isn't another that looks like it. We were talking about that before. Um, da, 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 da. How can I have a mustache like yours? Uh, a lot of hard work, root boost, and um, just grit and determination, basically. You really, you, really got to commit to this. Are you registering Martyr for Modern FNM next week? Unfortunately, in my city, <laughs> we do not have an, we do not have FNM. We only uh, sort of get together with some old school friends for a Monday night draft every week uh what else do we have i was about to say mm -hmm. let's have a look have you got can you see if there's any other unique decks still doing well in the tournament uh yeah that's a good question actually yeah we can talk about the you, standings right yeah, yeah I'll, I'll pull up the standings you go have a little look at that and let's have a little look what's going on looks like uh if i don't think the video is choppy for anybody else if, if it is choppy for you make sure you refresh your screen and check your internet at home so before this round started we had uh for 12 players at six and zero we also had a bunch of players with a draw one two three four five six six more players with a draw so 18 undefeated players out of which we had a merc type player scales living in yavmod rhinos martyr ragdus grief yavmod titan monogreen tron okay that deck is also kind of falling off the radar i, ha I haven't seen that deck do so do you super well in a while? Do you know about my um the spies for Tron? How like it's kind of a meme with me and like, how much I don't like Tron. Yeah. And then obviously I go to Pro Tour uh, Barcelona and the breakout deck of the tournament is Tron. Tron. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like I mean if you and people trying to find like good questions about like, oh, how does Tron do this? How does Tron do that? And I got a lot of DMs, people in my DMs are kind of smashed me for that. Eighteen undefeated players, five of them are team Rhinos. So well, makes that sense. is the most the, played deck in the room as well. Right, but still, like five out of eighteen, I think I think that is uh that is pretty good showing. How many Merc tied? I think it's just Arna. It's just the one Merc tied deck. So yeah, it's it's a little bit of everything and Team Rhinos on top uh at the moment. <clears throat> Chan wants to know why are you not playing in this event? because uh, you're here. casting it. Yeah, I'm I'm here hanging out with Easy Will. questions, uh, chat. Easy questions, easy <laughs> answers. I'm here hanging out with Will. Thank you very much. Yep, it's a uh, it's a big it's a big mustache these days. I don't know. I'm trying to get the curl going in it. It it does it does kind of make me feel like wow I'm looking at these games I kind of wish I was playing but I played so much you know already that uh, I I've I've gotten my fair share of of, of playing uh, before but yeah I'm 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 definitely itching to uh, play you know in one of these pro tours or one of these I, events again. I actually qualified for this. If I wasn't casting, I was qualified to play. So before I knew I was casting it, I played an event, won it. So 
I'm out. I actually can go get my goodie bag any time yeah, I want to. Yeah. Which, of course, if you could qualify for the regional championships, you get your nice little swag bags. You get your, your, your fancy promos that you can only get at these events. So, you know, if you uh, maybe you're watching this and you want to say, how do I get it? How do I get where another 929 players are? Well, you can do that through the local game store. Your local game store, if they don't run events to qualify for this, they can get hold of Legacy. Uh, I'm sure the email is on the website. You can go uh, email, get your local game store to email them. They'll sort out how they get the package, how they get the invite. They can run their tournament. And then whoever wins that tournament gets to, an invite to come to play with the best players in Europe and tends to give them a shot at getting on the Pro Tour and playing with the best players in the world. So, you know, I feel I'm a big uh, enthusiast for Paper Magic and I want to help everybody that possibly can get to this scene to be coming to these scenes and playing and taking part in this amazing atmosphere we walked in this morning we we're like well this feels like a gp there's so many people here it's yeah. crazy and obviously if it doesn't do too well well guess what we're in belgium we're in again it's an amazing city it's absolutely beautiful city had a little walk around last night and uh, we're actually staying in a cathedral aren't we we are staying in a monasterium Understood. where there's like spots for praying and all that and it looks like it's a it's this very old building that I'm just thinking, how did they turn this into a hotel? Isn't this some like sacred, you know, place Land. where what are we doing here? Should we even be here? It's pretty crazy. What's chat saying? Um a lot of people want to see uh a certain player playing um Titan. But uh I'll pass the message on to Skira and Philippa. And maybe they can make your your dreams come true, chat. But it's going to be on them. Uh, where else? Yeah, Arnie is basically putting on an absolute masterclass of that deck. Like you don't go absolutely undefeated at this level and not drop a match. But that man's trying to do it. He I mean, did, he did play against Andre Strasky in the first match, and after they finished, Arnie won two zero, and he's saying, "Hey, you know, at least I'm 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 going to make sure I'll." Uh, I'll give you some good tiebreakers, right? And Andre says the same. He's like, you know what? I'm I'm gonna make sure I do the same. And since then, neither of the two players lost a lost the no. game. So they have won, they have both been on a on a very good winning streak. Obviously, Arnett at the top of the standings. Andre also what's uh, that? What's doing Andre still on? very well. He is on Amulet Titan. Oh, okay, okay. Like that one. Uh uh, if he wins the whole thing, he'll get an interview. Sure. Why do people want to see Mill? Do we even have Mill doing well? Is there a Mill? There, that, somebody that... mentioned that Mill was like five and one or something. Let's have a little look. You know, if, not, uh, I'm not saying that yeah. chat's trying to chibate us here, but there's a chance they might be trying to chibate us. Five and one. I see Dredge. I see Domain Zoo. I see Mono Black Golfers at, at five and one. Oh, actually, uh, chat isn't chibating us. There's um, actually uh, Mill at five and one. Yeah, 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 five and one. And we have Frank Karsten here who's helping us, you know, fix the mislabeled decks and everything. So what you see in Melee is is uh, what the players are actually playing. So if you see a Mono White Eldrazi deck, the player is actually playing Mono White Eldrazi this weekend. Not that there is anyone uh, doing that, but I know that it's, it's one of the archetypes that a lot of players sometimes use because they want to be clever. Rag does grieve. Grixis what? did... Grix, Grix's uh, Death Shadow, five and one. We can uh, maybe feature that. I'd like to see a lot more Death Shadow. Uh, That's pretty cool. I do yeah. Love that deck. Chat asking about what do we reckon the biggest losers are this weekend so far. Well, lucky for you, we have a meta game breakdown of today, and we have uh, we'll have a conversion tomorrow. So tomorrow, make sure you tune in, and we'll tell you what decks from today, what percentage are managed to make yeah. it into day two. Maybe we can get the meta game up on the screen for everybody to see, like how. The meta game? Can we get that on the screen? I think just in general, the deck that's kind of trending down is Living End, because at least in Barcelona, right after the bans, yeah. Living End was doing really well. But right now, if you take Team Rhinos and Living End, uh, they're both getting hit by cards Mes like Chalice, uh, Chalice of the Void. But Living End also gets uh, kind of hated on by Graveyard Hate. So you have to fight through multiple uh, different pieces of sideboard cards, whereas uh, Rhinos mostly just uh care about the chalice so this is what everybody bought this weekend 929 players decide to split the the choice of what they could bring to modern because it is a huge format with lots of different cards in it and team of Rhinos is the most played deck and five players currently undefeated with it you know we were speaking about alexander haynes earlier well mm -hmm. he's just turned up in the chat so good uh afternoon good morning mr haynes what's up alex hope, you, hope you're having a good one my friend <laughs> Between my mustache and deep voice, Will is giving superhero vibes. Yeah, I do apologize, chat. If you just tune in, my I'm 
losing my voice for the sake of commentary, but I'm um, only a couple more rounds to go, and I'll be here to make sure I rest it up tonight, ready for tomorrow morning, where we're going to be giving you six more rounds of action, followed by a cut to top eight, where we're going to find out which 24 players are walking to the Pro Tour, which two players are going to be going to the World Championships, but more importantly, which one is going to be able to call himself the European Regional Champion as they walk into that Pro Tour. A very prestigious title to have and walk into these events. Only a handful of players have managed to get that title so far, but we're going to be crowning one more this weekend. The chat has been asking for Christian Kondic the entire last hour. Uh, I don't know if it's a very popular Skira's player. Like Tell Skira, there's, a, there's one deck, one player. We have to feature to this player. They haven't stopped. He's an, uh, he's an, he's an amulet <laughs> titan. So, someone mentioned in the chat that they're getting married this weekend. I'm not sure if that's true. That, no, that could, that that could, could just be, be a bait or that next weekend or, or something. But uh, Christian is 5-1. and one. He's playing amulet titan. So uh, we, could certainly, we could certainly make that happen. But it is on uh, Philippa and Philip. Uh, yeah, don't <laughs> come at us. If they don't pick it. Don't shout us. We, we're trying. We're trying our best. Imagine getting married at the RC. Hey, look. People get married all over the place. Uh, give us scales. I do like scales. Again, another uh, Aquifer Soul Cauldron's deck. And I, I've told you how much I do like that card in modern at the minute. So it, I think there's three decks that really utilize Aquifer Soul Cauldron. You've got Yagmoth is the main one. Then you've got scales. And then the next one is Heliod. And of course, you see that on our metagame breakdown. A couple of players did bring Heliod combo. Six players. Yeah. I know it's only a, you know, a big field, but six players. We saw one of them doing well in our feature match the, uh, earlier on. Uh, I think that could be an underrated deck. You know, just being able to get infinite life and then into infinite damage. It's, uh, it's pretty good. Wow. So you saying chat? Let's have a little look. See. I think um, the problem with, with that deck is that you have to run X1 creatures. Like, you have to run cards like uh <clears throat> prosperous innkeeper or the white one one that whenever a creature comes into play under your control you gain one life and you know if you have to run these creatures then <laughs> bow masters that's not going to be a good experience so uh if you can dodge that uh dodge that card then yeah that that could be a well Do you remember um let me roll back to i don't know six months ago when creativity was the best deck uh -huh. it was everywhere yeah, and I now that. it's dropped all the way down to just yep. 14 players, 1.5% of the map. That, yeah. I mean, it's it's a lot harder these days to try to resolve a creativity on a 1-1 one, one token. You know, again, once yeah. again, we're coming back to Bowmasters. We're coming back to, you know, Fire and Ice and all these cards that people play a lot. Of. So, uh, yeah, that's that's why you don't see uh, that much of this, of this deck anymore. So we've got... 14 more tables left to finish, ladies and gentlemen, with seven minutes over time in the round. So that's why we're, we're basically talking, you must be being, why are they not to pay more matches on? We haven't got any more. So it's either this or we get or we give you the, uh, you know, we'll be right back screen. And let's be honest, it's more fun hearing our voices, uh, or at least my voice at the minute. It is pretty croaky as we go along. What decks would you all be bringing, chat? If you were hit coming this weekend, obviously we've got the... Uh, a lot more regionals around the world, depending on where you're watching. If you're in Europe, this is your one. We've got America, Canada, Australia, all the, the you know, different ones around the world are going to start happening now. We are, I believe, the first one that's uh, kicking off this season's RCs. So maybe you're going to be going to it, or if you could turn up, what deck would you play? What deck would you want to be turning up with this weekend uh, in an open deckless tournament? I'm seeing Merktide, Merfolks, Raktos of Oaks. I don't even know what timeless low it is maybe the format timeless team and merc tide so that's kind of something so merc tide's traditionally always been like blue red kind of nice mana base it would play blood moon but they've been uh splashing uh, or at least some people are splashing mingu's uh probably been on this train as well of scra uh, splashing uh, devoted druid for the green okay. to be able to you know uh end a turn get two more cards that i can play for my turn play it it gets bigger for every single spell i play i don't know if it's if the card itself is worth hurting your mana base more? Yeah. Or is the card just really that powerful? Yeah, I mean, only it's, way to find out. Well, mate, I know there's a couple of people that are... Oh, uh, Questing Druid. Sorry. I don't know what I said. Questing Druid. Thank you, chat. Um, du -du 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 -du. I don't even know what Nissa Jund is. That's great. Looks like people do want to see Mill. I got Philippa to the left of me taking all these requests down. So if you do want to see a, ch uh, a deck chat, I need you to at Philippa with your, uh, the deck that you want to see um, on camera. Because uh, she's sat right there looking at her phone on Twitch. So even if you ask, she's going to see it. And she's going to pick the next feature, actually. So make sure you're at Philippa with what decks you want to see 
moving on. But on that one, we're going to have to call an end to this round because I don't think my voice is going to be able to take too much more of this. So that is going to be the end of round number seven. We're going to have a short little break while we get the, uh, the rest of the matches in the room finished. And then we'll be right back with Skewer and Philippa for round number eight. Don't go anywhere. See you shortly.
Welcome back to the Legacy European Tour. We are here at Regional Championship in Ghent and going for round eight already, eight rounds of Magic here. Today we have nine rounds and players with six wins or more make it into day two. Let's take a look at our most played cards for the tournament. These are cards in sideboard and also mainboard. So we see Orkish Bowmaster, the most played card here in the tournament. Yeah, Orkish Bowmaster is everywhere and seems to be everywhere. Um, and this informs the way you play and choose your deck for the tournament, because if you know Orkish Bowmasters is everywhere, regardless of the shell, whether it's Golgari Yogmoth, whether it's, you know, Ragdus Grief, whatever the shell, you know you have to play against it. And so you would think, well, if I have to play against, Ra against Orkish Bowmasters, maybe I don't want Ragavan in my deck. But well, actually Ragavan is the third most played card and the second most played non-land card. So it seems that Orkish Bowmasters goes in tandem with Ragavan, which is probably thanks to Ragdus Grief. Um, but interestingly, and that, that's an insight you pointed out, which I really like, there are more Bosages played than Forests, which is a very interesting observation. And I think it also informs the way you play because I, some time ago, I thought Leyline Binding is like one of the best cards in the entire format. It warps your mana bases, it tags anything. But when Bouseju is so highly played, it becomes a liability at some point, you know, because you take, let's say, their primeval titan. Okay, boop, destroy, get a titan again, you know, or against Yogmoth, boop, get it again. And so. Based on the cards I see, I wouldn't want to play Leyline Binding, and I wouldn't want to play Ragavan too much. Um, what are the conclusions? Well, I mean, well, depends. Different play, different players uh, make uh, different choices. For example, Blue Red Merktite plays Ragavan, but just sides it out against Bowmaster decks. Uh, but yeah, I think overall these are very interesting stats. And the first sideboard card on the list is one, two, three, four. Is sixth in subtlety, seventh in Chalice. Eight fish in endurance. Yeah, and we have a lot of different cards here, and uh, from various archetypes, we have Tishana's Tidebinder entering the list as one of the cards that was released most recently in Lost Caverns of Ixalan. We don't see, for example, Leyline Binding, as you said as well, yeah. losing some power there, uh, and we see. Ragavan, the third most played card. So, as you said, a lot of players still playing it, maybe siding it out after seeing Orkish Bowmasters. Let's take a look here at the match that we chose to feature for round eight. Players at six and one, we have Vimir Mil versus Temur Rhinos. And why do you think Mil doing pretty well here in the tournament? Excellent question. And so the chat asked, and we have delivered. It is Mill, yes. It is Demir, it is Mill, yes, yes, yes. Let's hype it up, chat. This is all because of you. This is all thanks to you. Uh, Demir Mill, uh, it's, a, it's a deck that attacks from a very weird angle. And this angle seems to be paying off. It doesn't, it doesn't play, mm, let's say, predictable magic. And I will just double check if we've got Tishana's... No, uh, not Tishara's. If we've got Tasha's Hideous Laughter, we do have three copies of that main deck. It's great against low curve strategies. It can no two shot opponents. Um, yeah, I'm curious how that's going to work out. We've got the Crab, play a Fetchland, Mill 3, crack the Fetchland, I think is going to happen, Mill 3 more. And our Surgical's main deck, which can just take care of. A given payoff completely if you mill off crushing footfalls, surgical it, yeah, and Bob's your uncle. And we already have the crab there starting the meal, and fetches work very well with crabs, uh, and more cards being milled here. And yeah, and, and if you're a mill player, you will be tr keeping track of everything you've milled. And now it's an open deck list. So you can very easily compare what you've milled to the exact configuration. So you know, for example, okay, there are three fire ices left and there is one endurance possibly, right? Now, speaking of endurance, let me check because endurance is the best anti-mill card that's intentionally the best against it. Nobody plays it because of mill. Let me check how many... Four copies. Four copies. There are four copies of Endurance in Lorenzo's deck. 
Womp womp. You can always try to mill the endurance and then extraction. You will you will have to. You will have to. And the crab already doing some work. A lot of cards milled there for Lorenzo. And land here forest. So so knowing the configuration, and again. Um, Dimir Mill knows the configuration because it's open deck list. You really have to win that game one. Because, like, games two and three will be so painful. You really have to win game one and then hope for the best for the for, for the other ones. But... Oh, violent outburst here and let's cascade. Crashing footfalls. Let's make two rhinos. Yeah, that's, that's a decent clock. Let's see if there's any answer. No, nope, it resolves. And up here for João. Deciding what to do in the face of those two rhinos. Uh, is there a land? I'm also curious if there is land or not. Against Mill, you have to be very careful about uh, fetching as well. Yeah, f fetch runs with, with the crab are doing a pretty good job. Like, multi-crab openers also are so hard to beat. And you can also get trapped. So if your opponent is fetching, you can always play trap for free. Yeah, 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 yeah. Another crab. Okay, let's see. We have a land, so let's mill six cards. Lorenzo just milling six more. And we see some interesting cards there. Crashing footfalls, force, lands, subtlety. Okay, draw. I don't think Mill's clock is going to be faster than, than, than Rhino's is. Uh, but if there is something like a bounce effect, kill one of the Rhinos, then it would help Mill significantly. Attacking here for eight. And João just taking eight damage. I can see a lot of people mentioning echoing truth, but I'm uh, I I have not seen that, so that's the main reason I'm, I haven't mentioned it. Is it in in their hand? There's one copy in the entire list, by the way, but I have not seen it in the hand. Two mana, instant return, target non land permanent and all other permanents with the same name. To their owners and that does work pretty well against rhinos yeah very much this can swing the game completely yeah double checking probably looking for the number of forces i think that could be the thing happening here and just drawing card here Returning, I think, the Oboro to hand. Yeah, let's see how the situation develops. So we've got two tapped rhinos here, double crab, I think, field of ruin there alongside. Well, I think Dark Slick shows any blue land of some nature.
once again taking a look at that graveyard. There are a lot of cards in João and um, and deck that it does matter how many cards your opponent has. It affects the cost of some of the cards as well. Land here. Yeah, thinking through his options. No, mill at nine life, very close to dying. I think it's like half ish library milled. Looking again, how yeah, many yeah. cards exactly? Yeah, double, double, triple checking. I think mill is also very, very good in close deck list because you can actually see the opponent's almost entire deck list. My need to block there with one of the crabs. Those rhinos do have trample. Yeah, so let's see how that th the resolution of that is. I've heard there is a force of negation in Rhinos' hand, and while there is drowning the lock, there is not enough there is not enough mana to do everything. Echoing truth, we've got a reader, and because we've got a reader, let's show that to everyone. And it gets forced. No. Now does João have anything to answer that force? One mana. Oh, fatal push. Okay. Getting rid of uh, one of those. Yeah, we're just taking a life. Uh, and every single turn is really important for him. Could be the difference between winning or losing. Let's end up here. Draw a card. Yep. And oh, he's shuffling so fast. I think dress down that was. Uh, that was. Oh, uh, hideous left, I think. Okay, two mana. Dress down. Oh, it's uh. Oh, okay, it's it, it's cycling mill four. It is cycling mill four draw. I mean, if if game one goes to Lorenzo. The full set is certainly, certainly heavily advantage to him as well. Milling some more cards. And, uh, yeah. But Juan at five life. Only one mana up. Only one crab. Oh, yeah. Very tough spot. Now he's at five. There's also a double dead gone, so we can just bounce the crab, uh, which we do, and that is uh, game-ish. No? Yes? Yes. Okay. This is game. Uh, how did you feel here? I mean, it felt like Jerome missing something to be able to uh, mill the opponent. Those 4-4s four made a lot of pressure. Yes, they did, yeah. Yeah, they did, and I really don't think our hero, uh, the, the mill, mill player deck we have not seen very much, will be able to pull through in the face of quadruple endurance on top of the, you know, main plan, which is putting 10 power or 8 power on the battlefield very, very fast. So, ah, it's going to be really difficult. Interesting thing about Lorenzo here. I actually saw Lorenzo yesterday at the last chance qualifier, so I think he qualified through the through the last chance, or at least he was playing it, and I think he top baited. Oh, let, did he? Let me take a picture of our top bait from yesterday. Yeah. And I will tell you in a second. But I think he did top bait it. So I mean, going from qualifying at a last chance to being here right now, six and one, already qualified for day two. 
and we can show here the deck list for our meal player. Okay, so 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 first first we've got Rhino. So as I said, if you look in the sideboard, uh, oh triple endurance is it? Okay, it doesn't make it much better. Uh, but I thought I saw four. Still, triple endurance, quadruple mystical dispute, which gets cited immediately. Um, and with the seven cards, I think Rhinos is heavily advantaged. They can trim on other cards, but everything is pretty good. Like you can probably cut subtlety and cut bone crusher, and then side in the other ones. Merktite is such a good card on turn two because they with you and just slam it, you know, an eight eight and go to town. Uh, Tishana can turn off a crab completely. Uh, so there's a lot of uses for, for almost everything here. And I think this is not our Temur Rhinos player, actually. Our Rhinos player is Lorenzo. Oh, okay. It's okay. It's that that's why it's it's mm. three endurance, not four. Okay, that makes sense. But uh, the idea is is the same. I did confirm that uh Lorenzo was one of our top eight players yesterday here at the last chance. So in the last chance yesterday we had 380 players and the top 16 qualified to be here today. And Lorenzo was one of those players. And I know that Lorenzo already top aided other events here at the Legacy European Tour. So it just goes to show you keep showing up, doing good results. Yeah. And let's take a look here if our players are already playing. We already have the corrected list here with the four endurance sideboard from Lorenzo. Yeah, but the, th the thing is that uh, winning through. Disputes, winning through endurances, winning through you know so many actual rhinos, winning through so much interaction, it is going to be a pain for Dimir Mill. Like, I mean, João did manage to meal six opponents, losing only one game so far, one match so far, and six and one. And let us know, chat, who are you rooting for? Mil or Temur Rhinos? What deck do you like the most? I think some people like Mil just because it's not played a lot. And it's yeah. one of those under the radar decks. It's, it, yeah, it's like an underdog type of situation, yes. right? It's an underdog type of situation where you root for the thing that you don't seem often. Like, you know you will keep seeing Rhinos, so you're rooting basically for anything that's not Rhinos. Uh, so whatever's on the on the other side, you root for that. But Mill Mill has got haters and lovers. L Mill is like Marmite, basically. I think no crabs there in the opening end for João. Oh, I can see Solgate Lantern. I think. And we see here Lorenzo also deciding. I see Lance. I'm not sure what the other cards are there. I, I think I see a violent outburst. Yeah, it's difficult to see. Fire and Ice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Lorian revealed. Now, technically, if there are no endurances in the opening hand, the other ones can be uh, just milled over. But the big issue is that some of them are milled over and you still play an endurance. You get endurances back into the deck and you can just keep endurancing. I'm not sure if Jerome has access to Surgical Extraction, but that's a key card here as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a mole here for Lorenzo now on the draw. And somebody making a very funny comment. Mulligan is one more card to mill. 
Yeah, yeah that's fast. <laughs> Some people overboard even. Like I actually mill up to like six uh, sideboard up to like 64, 65 uh, to make it uh, even worse for mill. Both players already made it into day two, but obviously starting day two with a score of seven or eight wins is much better than six, especially in a tournament where there are over 900 players and only the top 24 qualifies for the Pro Tour. So really important what score these players start with tomorrow. Oh, and we see Gemstone Covers. I mean, Covers is such a strong card. Uh, and the fact that Rhinos can take full advantage of it just put, makes it that much better. Like, you're literally stealing, being on the play, and you're still up that card. I mean, of course, you have to pitch it, but... Um, for example, this allows you to go to actual turn to Rhinos. And we have Island here being fetched by João. Preordain. Mil does have some uh, very good matchups in this meta as well. Okay, so yeah, let's see. Lorian revealed. Lorian revealed is shuffling, which is yeah, which uh, could walk into a trap. Shuffling here. And we do see the trap, actually, yeah. So it is the trap. So there was a shuffle, there is a trap, and the worst feeling, if you're the, the opponent of Mill, is when they go, okay, trap you. Uh, trap you? So trap you. And then you're like, come on. How did that happen? So multi-trap hands can really uh, do you good. But there is just one trap. And this is the thing. Until you have milled over the entire deck, it kind of doesn't matter because you're not stripping your opponent off of any tangible resources. But trap is really important, especially if you can follow up with something like an extraction, starting to get cards in the grave as soon as possible. Lorenzo here getting Steam Vents. Yep. Steam Vents has been searched out. Shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Fetching out things thins out your deck very marginally. <laughs> so I guess it kind of helps Mill by these like two cards or something. Playing a forest here and passing. Uh, this is a basic swamp, so we've got island swamp, and I'm not sure if we if we see any properly relevant cards. Three mana available for Lorenzo. And okay, so now we cycle this. The opponent mills for your joy card. Now we can respond with. Outburst, which is a heads-up play, because otherwise we could have milled Rhinos or Endurance. Oh, oh actually, we would have. Uh, we would have? Yeah, we would have. We would have actually milled four, including Endurance, which may have been surgical. Or oh, Crushing Footfalls, which would have been surgical. Now we've got eight power on the battlefield. The mill resolves. That's four cards. And we draw a card from the cycling of Fracture yep. Sanity. Drawing the card here and tapping draw for the turn. 
extirpate. Ooh. I do see extirpate there, right? Oh, we have not oh, seen that. Oh, there's two. We have not seen that for a long time, Philippa. Extirpate. This card, right? Yep, there's two of them in end. And preordain here. João might need it, might be in need of a third land. Count trips should help. They they properly increase the density. But the thing is that okay, even if he if he has that land drop, extirpate doesn't do anything against eight power on the battlefield, right? Like you yes, you can get rid of all the uh, all the rhinos, but what about the board state? We did get the land there. And Juan taking a look here at Lorenzo's graveyard. Okay, now we see, I think, Soul Guide Lantern. Okay. One mana remaining. We know about the extirpate in end. Uh, this choice is barely relevant. Uh, it's only relevant in that when Lorenzo endurances himself, which is already very bad, um, then he wouldn't shuffle something back in. Now, one could ask, why would you even want Soul Guide Lantern against, against you know, non-graveyard deck? But that's exactly the point. When they play Endurance, target themselves, you exile their graveyard with Soul Guide Lantern, and they cannot shuffle anything back in. So th that's the use. And then we have the extra paid. So endurance is kind of covered. Ooh, we extirpated Flame of Ano. Ooh, la la. Why do you think that decision here? Yeah, it's a good question. So le let me think. So there, there are no creatures to be killed. Maybe it's a way just to make sure Soul Guide Lantern doesn't die. And then you're covered against Endurance. I, th I think that might be the reason, yeah. But again, we have to somehow kill double Rhinos, which are attacking for eight right now. now people and are Char ma mentioning, Chat is mentioning Breach. Yeah, 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 I saw that. But the... Okay, there are two ensnaring Bridges in the sideboard. So yeah, that, that could be the case. So there's mystical dispute in end. Yeah, attack for eight. I mean, shardless plus dispute, that's strong. And we pass back. But we know about that dispute now. Yeah, we know the bit about the dispute, we know about the shardless. And maybe, so Lorenzo knows about the, the existence of bridge. So he's now holding up hardcast dispute to be able to cover a potential bridge play. Yeah, that's, that's pretty, pretty heads up. That makes things very tricky here for the mill player. And I think we're cycling again. Yep. The Fractured Sanity. Yeah, yeah. How many cards left in Lorenzo's end? Uh, yeah, so one play available is to extirpate the disputes. So that could be that could be good, but you're still taking eight now. Ooh, and there's violent art burst Ooh. as well. And unfortunately, it's not lethal because that's four plus four eight plus two of the outburst buff. That's ten, but you could do it, expecting that the opponent cannot possibly fetch anymore. So that could be one way to to do it. And here, Juan just takes the damage, going down to three life. Okay, so we're not we're not doing this. And passing, Lorenzo just passes the turn. And a quick look there at the graveyard to see what cards we can find. And taking that mystical dispute, uh, showing it there because there's extra paid. 
So extirpate. Now Lorenzo could potentially dispute the extirpate, but <laughs> yeah, 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 that wouldn't make sense. That, so. uh, that actually wouldn't be even legal, I think, because extirpate has split second. Yeah, yeah so, so it's not like it cannot be counted. It it cannot be reacted to. Exactly. Yeah. And now with that mystical dispute out of the way, we have the shardless agent violent outburst. And then we just slam and snaring bridge. And this game might take quite a while longer. Let me check Lorenzo's deck list. So we know uh, fire. Okay, we could go double fire ice and fire you, fire you. So that's one option. We have Boseju single copy. We have Ottawara single. Whoa, just oh, oh! top pick Boseju, and that's it. Oh, oh. <laughs> well, oh, well, 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 okay. that that makes it. <laughs> uh, so Lorenzo top decking the Boseju, being able to destroy that bridge. <laughs> and that is game 2-0 for our Rhinos players. Congratulations to Lorenzo. We have here our backup match, which is Jeskai Bridge versus Rhinos. Both players only with a draw and six wins. Yeah, undefeated. So, Jeskai Bridge, a deck I don't hide my affinity towards. Undefeated right now, 6-0-1, oh, a combo deck with a very strong fair plan, playing multiple spell pieces and multiple Teferi Time Raveler to combat Rhinos, and currently one game up. Charles on the battlefield, grinding station Emery. Uh, let's see what's in hand for Yari. Uh... Oh, oh. Yeah, he's keeping his cards pretty close to his chest. Yes, I mean, there's Breach. Is there? Yeah. If there I... is, I mean, that's good. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 I think there is. If it is, then we're probably just shaking hands unless there is, like, force of negation. Boop. Okay, there is Breach, there it is. Oh, there's Endurance. Yeah, Endurance... Yeah, we were going to be endurancing in response. That's not the correct mana if we want to endurance. Uh, yeah, that's not the correct mana. We will fix this in a moment. So it looks like the judge yep. is going there. Yeah, I, l I let them know immediately we're going to fetch to change that. Isn't so it's an island? What where are the other two lands? Isn't two so breeding it, pools? It's island steam vents breeding pool. Okay. And we need double green, so yeah, yes. now it's correct. Yeah. Now it makes sense. So now steam vents and breeding pool up. So the thing is that it doesn't mean that Yari cannot win. Okay, and let me explain to you why in a very convoluted way. So, Breach enters play, uh, wants to enter play, Endurance puts everything back on top. Let's say Yari says resolves. Everything gets put back. Now, Breach resolves with an empty graveyard. Yari has got another Emery in hand, so we can play the other, another Emery, trigger, keep one of them from legendary rule, mill four which makes the graveyard 4 plus Emery, which is 5. Now you can start looping Moxamba and win. So, this endurance uh, doesn't do anything. Like, literally. And this is the strength of the deck. I've experienced it a lot. Um, soft hate like endurance can be just played around. Yep, so let's... 
take a look here. The bridge resolves, and as you said, oh, I saw. Okay, there is there is another endurance plus footfalls in the in the hand. Ooh. Okay, so double endurance then does it, but that's not an issue either, I think, because first, when will Mike do it? That's the first question. Maybe now. And if he does it, then Yari is left with. Okay, okay, that's okay. But again, this is the thing. This happens. Yari is uh, Mike is left with shardless. That's it. Okay, and then endurance as a creature. So that's five power, three attacks. Station is on the battlefield. Emery is on the battlefield. Another Emery in hand. I, I don't think that's terrible. You go double endurance, and we're still playing. And Yari up a game here. Mike does not have any cards left in hand as well. Place another Emery. So we're going to mill four more cards. We have five in the grave right now. Uh, unholy Heat in hand. That's okay. We can still top deck breach and win. We've got Unholy Heat to kill Endurance. Um, what we can do is also sacrifice Station with Station and replay it with Emery just to get more cards in the graveyard. Uh, potentially hitting like Mishra's Bubble to start looping. So I don't dislike Yari's position at all. Oh, and he's also up a game already. Taking a stomping ground here, tapped. <laughs> he did invoke the other endurance. There Ooh. was a second endurance. The first one was just paid for. Yeah, and we, I think we drew a land. So right now, Yari can do a lot. Let's see what the top deck is. If it's bridge, we, it's GG. Uh, but that's <laughs> very frequently the case. That was a blue spell, I think. Mm, so you you can begin by by stationing yourself. That's one way. Because you want to start drawing cards. There is oh there is force of negation. So we unholy eat the endurance and uh, Mike checking there for the delirium. Yep. There is delirium, so the endurance is now gone. Okay, we see that trick. Oh my God, uh, Yari really knows what he's doing. And we mail f uh, these cards, so you just replay because why not? And oh, Charles off the top. Wow. Yeah, Charles off the top with the phone in hand. That's good. So attacking for two. Yeah, every time. And <laughs> Charles agent. Yep, yep. We know the drill. We know. Crashing footfalls will be the revealed card. We know two rhinos will enter the battlefield. Yeah, so now Mike is presenting lethal, so Yari better to top deck breach. And can somebody make a rhino count? How many rhinos we see during this weekend? Oh my god, yeah. Oh, Saga was the top deck, so that's GG. And we equalize it, 20 minutes on the clock, Yari, Mike, breach, rhinos, one and one, going into the final... Uh, final game of this match at an undefeated table. Both players, mind you, qualify for day two already. Yes. It is important, though, to try to get the best score possible because over 900 players here today and tomorrow only top 24 gets the invitation for the Pro Tour. First and second place get the invitation for the World Championship. So these are very important games. It's very important to start day two with a good score. Yeah, now they will be looking through the decklist. So as they are looking at the decklist, we will look at the decklist. So let's look at them one by one. And first we have Jeskai Bridge. And I know you're a fan of this deck, so can you explain, chat, how does this deck work? Yeah, so the, the, what the deck does is that it wants to put Thassa's Oracle into play to meet this condition and win on the spot when the library is empty. In order to make it empty, you need Breach, Grinding Station, and a zero, preferably Mox Amber, that you can keep adding mana, sacrificing it, mill yourself, replay it, get the mana, and thanks to the fact that Station untap itself whenever an artifact enters play, you can keep doing that until the library is empty, play Oracle, and win. In this matchup, Forte Fairy is absolutely stellar. A double Flaster, double Force of Negation, one EE, uh, one another Spell Pierce in the sideboard, two Spell Pierce main deck. These are a lot of tools, so I really like Yari's position. But take a look. Let's take a look at the other deck list. And Rhinos, you know, Rhinos is a classic deck. 
and we know what it does. No, oh, looks like we already have a board, though. The, okay, no, 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 no. That was that was the backup. I think that was the oh, backup. Okay. So um, we have here the Rhinos deck, m pretty much what we have seen all weekend, right? Any specific different card in this particular list by Mike? In this particular list, let me take a look. Yes, there is a Tice Scorn. I mean, that's a card that I have not seen for quite some time. Uh, An Tice Scorn is a counter spell that says counter target spell, but... Uh, this, call, this spell is cheaper if an opponent casts two or more spells this turn, so it meets the cascade condition and you can counter something, which, you know, might be relevant, but yeah, it's, it's just a single copy in the main deck. Uh, I don't see any more in the sideboard, uh, and the rest is pretty standard, except for maybe a single commandeer. Uh, and yeah, I think that's it. What do you think is favor here for game three? with the Jeskai Breach player on the play. Oh, yeah, yeah. Give me some breaches. No, like when you open with... Uh, actually, in, actually, Yari is not playing any Ragavan, so you can't open with Ragavan, but you can open, you know, let's say Double Bubble Emery. Uh, no, the Nard draw, which I have had multiple times, is turn one Emery with Moxamba, hold up Spell Pierce, or hold up Fluster Stone, which is absolutely disgusting. And our players here starting to shuffle. And these players must be so tired. It's been eight rounds of magic. One more today. And um, it's it just a lot of games, a lot of triggers to be remembered. Which deck do you think from all that we saw today is the most difficult to play for the longest time? So the one with most triggers to remember. Well, so let me give you two two options or two two answers one is hardened scales and that's a pretty obvious answer i know i know but hardened scales and the arithmetic it requires all the math thing you know quadratic equations you have to do on the fly it is it is very very tiring however i would say that jeskai bridge that's on the left also is in that category it is pretty tiring it is pretty convoluted um not when you do your thing but when you do your thing and you want to play around stuff, you know, sequencing the, the, the artifacts. Mm, but yeah. So it actually matters a lot because if you know that you get tired as a person, because you know, we have got different bodies, different, uh, different function, uh, functionalities. If you know you get tired or you lose focus, you might actually choose a different deck knowing that. And that, that's actual, genuinely useful, a, a, a useful metric. What score is necessary to make day two, Philippa? Six wins takes you to day two. So both of these players are happy to already have, have made it to day two. Uh, but of course, the better the score, the best to start day two, because the score of today also matters for tomorrow. Oh, certainly. It's I not mean, like it resets. Yeah, yeah. The better you finish today, the better tomorrow. And we do see double bubble, but unfortunately, without any emery so we're we're suspending some rhinos which is pretty scary uh for yari but it's at the fairy deck so it might actually be scary for mike because if the fairy slips through the cracks that suspension my end, uh, unfortunately. And I have the news that Arne lost the first game of the of the tournament, but he's 8-0, so he still <laughs> won the match. <laughs> okay, so he's literally undefeated, but he just lost <laughs> a single game. Yeah, so probably he's now... He's just 16-1. and 16-1, and one, Come yeah. on, Arne. If, you, if only you played well. You know, variance catches up to everyone. Okay, so joking aside, excellent result, undefeated. Uh, and now we see Fetch. 
Yaru is keeping that Mishu's bubble, which makes me think he drew Emery off of the first bubble, or saw it from the first first one, and he doesn't want to crack the other one to make it cheaper for this turn. Uh, but we will see whether that's true. Uh, for Mike, I see another footfalls. I think subtlety, double Lorien, fire ice land. So kind of clunky, you know, double Lorien, crushing footfalls. They don't do anything. Fire ice, I guess, is there. Oh, as for the die rolls, I talked to Arne actually, and he was like, he's at 2-5 in die rolls or something like this. Oh, that yeah. makes it even more impressive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, he was mostly on the draw. Assuming that that counts, that changes anything. Okay, so now we see turn to station. So this is both the most inconsequential and the most consequential play. Let me explain why. So on the one hand, Yari has done nothing. Nothing, right? Turn to station does nothing. Uh, doesn't mill. It, it, nothing, right? But it makes it so that Yari can string a combo uh, requiring less mana, right? So we're coming back to the point of bottlenecks. Mana is going to be much less of a bottleneck because you just need to have a legend and mana to play bridge rather than legend, bridge, and station. So, basically, this play does nothing Yet. until it does everything. Exactly. And here we see Mike uh, cycling that reveal, getting a breeding pool and tapped. And now tapping for another crashing footfalls suspended. It's not as good when you have to suspend it. It's better when you cascade into it. Yeah, I mean, if you suspend it, it's glacially slow. Oh, and now, yeah, double rhinos, uh, double rhinos suspended. Let me play EE. -E. Let me play Emery, and an Emery which can keep replaying EE. -E. Now we know there is fire ice, which will probably take care of it. And I'm wondering if Mike has any force. I don't think so, but I think there's oh, a subtlety. Yeah. Well, subtlety in Emery when you know you've got fire eyes is kind of weird. But then again, Yari will put it on top and then replay it next turn. So the question is whether you want Yari to waste mana again, but it's just one mana. So it's not much, much of wastage, I would say. So if I'm Yari, I would be pretty happy about this play. And we see there the subtlety being pitched with Olorian's reveal. Yeah, I think I think as Yari, I'll be perfectly happy with this play. Exactly, just put it back on top. Uh, there is Flaster Storm in hand, so he is ready for any, uh, for example, Flame of Anno destroying EE. Oh, did you see third Rhinos? He he literally drew a third La Rhinos. Well, <laughs> unfortunately, that is not oh, great. Oh, and missing the land drop again. And and tapping here. Draw Emery. Play Emery. He says resolve, trigger. Trigger resolves. Let's flip, flip it. We've got, okay, so many artifacts to choose from. But he has fire eyes. So I'm curious if Yari is going to counter this or stay patient. And that, that's a real decision here. That's a, that's a very tough decision. And I, it looks like it's countered. Yeah, I don't envy his position, but. Both players only with two lands. Uh, draw. And there is a land off the top. So now I think we can suspend the third rhinos and hold up fire eyes. Two mana to kill it on the main phase. So if, oh God, so if Mike kills it right now to play around counter magic, and Yari top decks a land, he can just slam Teferi, which he does have in hand. But then if you don't kill uh, Emery, you can, uh, Yari can start drawing, uh, no, getting mana from Moxamber in the graveyard. 
And here, getting rid of that emery oh, God. and so, third crashing footfall. Land of the top, and I think we're done. No, 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 no. Oh, that was iteration, I think. Ah. Iteration here. And let's see if we can find that third land. Hey, that was so close to a GG. Oh, oh, no land. We see the fairy force and something else, but no land. Oh, no. I mean, force is the take, but... Oh, my goodness. Missing heavily on the land. Taking off the jacket in disbelief. Oh, yeah. Oh, la, 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 la. Oh, he didn't take the force. Exiling the oh. force there. Oh, he took Priadane, which makes sense. So now we're getting a single copy of Rhinos. Now the best draw for Mike would be something like uh, Flame of Ano or Tishana to make sure that this EE doesn't do the thing. But that's force of negation. So Ooh. he so he is covered against the Teferis of the world, but that was the window. Now I think the window may have just closed. Now we see a land. But my that might just be that too late. Uh now I think Yari will wait a turn with the EE to get rid of double rhino. So he might play like preordain shock pass. A lot of decisions here. And a lot of possibilities for Yari. Yeah, I, I think this is preordained shock this in pass angle to get double double rhino. Preordain. Let's see if it resolves. Because Mike does not know that Yari top decked the third land here. Yes, yeah, that's true. Like, exactly. Like if this baits out the counter spell. I mean, Yari would be would be would be thrilled. Oh, it has to be so tempting for Mike because he might. Okay, but the result, but it must have been so so tempting. Let's draw. And another preordain. So now we are playing that Steam Vents untapped. Yeah. Holding two mana up and passing. Yeah. Mike can't do anything, so he will just cast the Rhino. Yep. And and in the upkeep, he will destroy all of them. That's to play around a top deck to Shana. Uh, uh, oh, that's a top. Shardless Agent. Shardless? Okay. <laughs> Classic. Is there any? Crushing footfalls left. Yeah, there is the last one. Classic. Okay, let's find that one card. Yeah. But now, oh, okay, he'll... there it is. And he also he's actually for holding up force of negation right now. But yeah, this is the the rhino special as we call it. No more rhinos in the deck. It currently, yes. There is double uh, unholy heat, I think. Draw. Land, so we can go like Teferi and Holy Heat. Teferi will eat Force of Negation. It's not lost, but this is certainly we are served the Rhino special. And to be fair, most of the Rhinos were not cascaded into. What? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. A single one only. Yeah. Okay, so one mana. Oh, preordain first. Uh, that is one play, but because of is uh, there any more explosives left in the deck? Actually, there isn't. Actually, there isn't. Um. Okay, he might actually not even play the fairy. Just double heat. But, yeah, heat, heat, he says just, okay, okay. One Rhinos left. 
A land off the top. We've got double counter magic. I'm not sure Yari can actually grind through the Rhinos plus double counter. He had one perfect window to probably just win the game outright. Not finding that third land back then. Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. Draw. Let's see what the top oh, deck is. It's another land, like, th the wrong order. Like, had he drawn, like, maybe Flask the Storm? Actually, Flask the Storm would do it. Flask the Storm would be the, the absolute nuts, because he goes to Fairy pro Protection. But the Fairy. But we know that Mike has answers in end. Yeah, multiple of them. We can just force... And Yari here, really hoping this fairy resolves. Yeah, and and he doesn't know that Mike is actually thinking which counter to counter it with. I mean, that's that's a good issue to have. At least you have an for answer. Mike, for at, Mike, yeah. Yes, at least you have a counter. Oh, okay, okay, I get it. So he's thinking, what if you play Breach? However, if you don't counter Teferi, you're certainly not countering Breach when Teferi resolves. Yeah. <laughs> so... That's the thing about Teferi, it just makes you use your counters. Okay, there's another argument I see in chat, which makes sense, playing around spell peers potentially. Now, if he plays around spell peers, then... Ma oh, he does! Okay, that's... Playing around a spell piece, forcing their... That is pretty heads up, actually. Okay. Pitching the other counter magic. But this is an opening then for Yari, I think. Because now, two answers, answers have been used. If Yari, classic spot, top decks Underworld Breach, he might just win on the spot. And uh, this is a, a very popular thing in this deck. You trade, you trade, you trade, resources I mean, and yeah, then you just top the breach and you should be good. Yeah, but let's see here what Mike top decks. Might be another piece of counter magic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's see what happens. We go upkeep, remove, uh, remove, yeah. Get play. two rhinos. Draw. What's Let's the draw? See. Is it a cascade? Oh, I think it's a land. Yari down to nine. Well, down to nine, so he can easily fetch because he's dead to a single attack, anyways. Yari has got. Oh, yeah, it is a land. One draw step. <laughs> One draw step. One opportunity to seize it all. What is it? Yeah, what is it? Is it bre breach? Yeah. Literally, is it bre breach? Drop. Oh no, Yari making us suffer, uh, getting the cards oh, very close to hand. He's fetching. Fetching. Oh, so may he may have drawn like maybe like preordain? And he wants to like thin out like the last possible thing? But yeah, yeah, he's. I, I saw his hand kind of shaking, so I think he's in it. Whatever the draw is. Oh, preordain is just so much sweat. Okay. Making a sweat oh, all year. We Ooh. had the desk. Oh, clever, Yari. Clever, clever. You had it hidden all uh, the whole time. Okay. Activate. Flip it. Emery. Emery and Ember. Oh, uh, this Locked is Emory. 10. Emery doesn't do it. Ooh. Emery doesn't do it. What is the card left? She can't chomp. That's not enough. Because that's 8 coming across. But Yari still has an, a card in hand, yeah, no? And he, yeah, and he, he hasn't conceded yet. 
The ferry. I think it was the ferry. So. The ferry. We can bounce one right okay. on draw card. Okay. Okay, Cookage. Cookage. Bubble. Mm, bubble. You. Let's see what that is. Oh, <laughs> doesn't let us know. Yeah, pass the turn. Draw card. Draw, draw. I think it's force. This is six damage. If it's at Yari, he's he's at one. But he has that subtlety. That's subtlety. Subtlety. Which doesn't do anything against, against a potential breach. So Yari has bought himself double Droster, basically. Oh, this is so close. I literally cannot stand it right now. And six mana for Yari. So mana is not a bottleneck. He's looking at so many cards. The first extra turn. But do you kill the Teferi? I mean, I think you have to. Kill the Teferi. I mean, leave ah, Yari at three. If you attack for five, Yari for five, then he absolutely has to react to both threats, and he does. So suddenly he has to be hard cast right now. Yari at one. Yep, and yep, yep. Settled. Let's just see what happens. Let's just see what happens. Shields are down. Uh, as down as they see. can. Ooh, breach of the top. A breach breach of the top. and the other card is iteration. So taking a quick look oh. there at the graveyard. The madman did it. Oh my god. Look at that breach. Two mana. Oh. Let's wait. The fairy plus first. The fairy plus, yeah, yeah, you have to do that. But, if, but the breach resolves. Mike is like, okay, let's see what happens. But we know what's the result. We're going to keep looping zeros, adding uh, blue or white mana in the process and hard cast fast as Oracle with an empty library proceeding to winning this game. And oh, oh yeah, I think they're talking through it. I think they're talking through it, Yari, at a literal one life. Okay, and I think I think Mike is making him do it, and Yari's like, oh, okay, okay, no problem. I, I'll just do it. And do it doing will yeah, I will just see go through the actions, but Oh my god, that was so exciting. And this is, this is, this is how we do it here. Top deck breach, win the game. I mean, honestly, I've done it These so many games times. have been crazy. First, we see the Buseju against the breach yeah. in the meal matchup. And now we are seeing here these breach top deck closing out this game as well. But let's see Yari doing it. Yeah, I, th I think they're mainly talking and describing the combo, which is, which is like, if Mike has not ever played against it, which is possible, um, this is quite diff kind of maybe difficult to grasp at the, at the first moment, especially if both players are pretty nervous. Uh, but unless Yari, I don't know, faints, that's a win for him. Let's hope that does not happen. And the thing is that he, he can't even really mess up too much because he can always... Like, he's got the full graveyard at his disposal. Um, so he can't just accidentally exile Oracle. Yeah, he probably announced that, I know, I'm looping X. Now imagine the combo player that would say, just in an imaginary world, well, I never actually comboed. I don't know. People usually just <laughs> concede when I do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I play Breach and they just scoop. Okay, there is Oracle. And GG Yari goes to 7 0 and 1 undefeated. Jeskai Station Breach player. Combo players unite. And what a game we got there. It was, it got us sweating. Like, what cards are we top decking here? It was a really, really a great <laughs> game. And a great game also to end our casting here for the day. Because you do have one more round, but it's with Martin Musa and Will.
Gabriel Nassif, actually. Oh, really? Yes, Gabriel, okay, tell us about that. Yes, yellow hat Gabriel Nassif is actually stepping in to cast the last round today with Martin. Will is taking Ooh. a break to make sure his throat gets all and healthy for tomorrow. That uh, is great. Only one round left for the day. We probably will see maybe some win animes into day two. So if you are not aware, this is day one of the regional championship. There are nine rounds in day one. Players with six or more wins advance into day two. There were around 950 players today. Tomorrow we do have six rounds and then a cut to top eight. Top 24 makes it into the Pro Tour and first and second place get an invitation for the World Championship, the biggest event of the year. So a lot in stakes here and it has been such a great day. It's been it great to cover Modern. It has. I think the format, it's so much fun. We saw so many different decks. Yeah, I'm excited to come back tomorrow better, stronger. But uh, for today, we can take a bit of a break. You and I pass the, the mic to Martin and, and Gabriel and uh, yeah, finish this tournament up nine rounds tomorrow, six rounds plus the top eight, so nine and nine. Um, yeah. I hope you are enjoying at home. That's it for me and Skura today. We will see you tomorrow and we will be back soon for round nine with Martin and Gabriel Nassif. Yep. See you soon. Cheers.
Hey everyone and welcome back to the last round of day one of the European Championship uh, in Ghent. My name is Will Hall. Uh, wait a minute, no, that's wrong. Will actually lost his voice, so I'm here. I'm here with Gabe Nassif, a Hall of Famer. Most of you might know him as Yellow Hat, streaming on Twitch, on YouTube. You know him as a, as a content creator. You know him as one of the most successful Magic players of all time. Uh, he's going to be filling in for Will for this round. Gabe, how are you? How are you, you doing? Hey, good. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, yeah, there's there's no better expert to you know fill in uh, when we when we talk about modern. So I'm gonna be asking Gabe a lot of questions. If you have any questions in, in the chat, you can you can post it there, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna let you you know ask Gabe some questions uh, during the during the sideboarding, for example. But I think the players are ready. Uh, we can maybe go straight to the first feature match. There are three players undefeated at, at the moment at eight and zero. The first table is Hardened Scales against Golgari Yavmod. Unfortunately, one of the players. Uh, didn't feel comfortable playing in a feature match, so we're covering RNA Hushenbet on table two, playing against uh, Yari Wrench. But they're on the backup feature match because we have something cooler we picked for the first feature match, which is a five color creativity deck, which doesn't sound that exciting. Uh, but when you get to take a look at the list, there are three copies of Manatite in the main deck and three copies of Reprieve. Uh, what do you think about that game? Yeah, for Spike, people usually play Spell Pierce in that slot, but he decided to, I guess, make it a little easier on the mana and, yeah, play for Spike, the white for Spike, mana ties, hits creatures, something like a Void Walker, maybe even a turn one Ragavan. So, you know, um, creativity. Uh, deck that's not super popular. It used to be at some point in, in modern considered one of the best decks. It was kind of my deck of choice for a while, uh, mm. I don't know, six months, a year ago. But, what, um, what happened? I think... Lord of the Rings happened? Yeah, probably just Lord of the Rings happened. Uh, we tested it a bit for Pro Tour Barcelona, and it was just nothing special. Uh, I think the the One Ring was pretty decent against it, you know, against Archon. It kind of nullifies Archon. That was mm. one of the reasons. So you had a, a you used to have a good matchup against Omnath, which was popular, and then when they got the One Ring, it got a little tougher. So that was one of the reasons. It's probably not as easy to to resolve creativity for one these days when everybody's playing bow masters it's also like the most played card in the field so maybe that's also a reason that uh you know it's just it just, it just got a bit harder yeah bow master uh, is a great point there is all these matchups where you're kind of okay like against yog it wasn't the greatest matchup but you were kind of okay uh against scam i'm assuming it was just you know rag mm. kind of the same thing and that extra little bow master now they get to ping your one ones they get to pressure ran a bit more it, it kind of all these little things from mm you know, Lord of Rings that added up. But Sydney doing doing good, you know, seven and one. The deck's been yeah. kind of getting getting a little popularity on Magic Online too. Seen it more and more, but I haven't seen Manatai. There's actually also Transmogrify. The game is underway. Simona starts with a grief on turn one with a black source in play. You know what that means. Uh looking at that is a manatize, but you actually can't use that because there is a there is an untapped land. Also, Sydney was on the draw. I think there's a prismatic ending. And that's a ley line binding and two lands. If you're sitting there as the Ragdos Grief player, uh, what are you taking? I guess it depends on the struct on the on the on the context of your hand. But uh, what are you most likely taking here? Um, I'm guessing binding's gonna go because he's got the double fetch land draw to enable a, a one mana binding. Mm. And then after that, it depends on the rest of your hand. Either Manatize, if you have, you know, you want, you have a follow-up play, or Transmogrify, if you have maybe a slower hand and you can't really get, deal with stuff like. But you know, you're you're playing you're playing Ragdos Evoke. You've got Bold Push main deck. You've got Bowmaster. So mm. Transmogrify shouldn't be too scary. Right. So so I, I would guess the Manatize is gonna go there. Um, but I, I guess ending is is decent too because it just deals with a void walker for two mana two for two you're trading uh, two mana for two mana yeah and of course there is the one dead after uh, no, not dead after all so grief's coming back leyline binding hit the bin as you mentioned yeah it's pretty rare but you could actually find reasons for all three cards if you have a fable for instance if you think your next good good play is going to be fable then taking mana ties makes sense for instance right Simona is still deciding. Looks like Prismatic Ending is the choice. Yeah, I guess, I mean, knowing my opponent has the mana ties is going to make it a little easier to play around it. Uh, also, keep in mind, this is a tournament where we have open deck lists. So 
We had a tournament last year where one of the Boros players, uh, there were a lot of highlights uh, with the player casting Mana Tithe on Archon was one of the cards, like, you know, countering seven Mana Karth. And uh, with closed decklist, that's a lot easier to do. Uh, here, Sydney just choosing to play that in open decklist anyway. And I guess you made a good, you, you made a good, good point. If you're playing spell peers and maybe you decide that there's a lot of creatures, maybe you want to counter Ragavons, you want to counter, you know, Bowmasters and stuff like that. Maybe I guess that makes sense that uh, Mana Tite could be good as well. Yeah, I would expect that card to be uh, worse in open decklist. So I'm a little surprised, a little easier to play around. But Creativity is a deck that can punish you if you give them too much time. They have cards like Ren, Teferi, Fable, so mm. they, they can just, you know, what are you going to play? Just play with Sphere of Res Resistance the entire <laughs> yeah, game yeah, yeah, just because yeah. they have Mana Tice in, the, in their deck. Yeah. All hey. right, land number two for Simona. Daxon passes the turn, so obviously knows about the Mana Tithe, not going to play a two drop into it. Sydney also drops a land and passes. Speaking of Mana Tithe, I was recently, uh, we're talking about pre-modern and some of the cool decks from the past. Uh, one of my favorite decks of all time is the Char, Char Belcher deck that you played in my first Pro Tour, which was Pro Tour New Orleans. Wow. Um, that deck had four, four spikes, right? Yeah, it was kind of our interaction tech because the mm. format was so fast and pretty degenerate. And we wanted to keep Mono Blue. Obviously, Mono Blue doesn't have discard spells. It doesn't have removal spells, really. And keep in mind, there was no open decklist back in the day, even though I, was that the PT yeah. where there was an incident where some deck decklist got leaked, so they published everyone's decklist to on the walls. On the walls to, to make up for it. So <laughs> they literally printed everybody's decklist and hang the hung them on the walls around the tournament area. So before the round you just went to find your opponent's name and, yeah. ch and check their deck in day in, in, in day two. So so arguably that maybe you know hurt me people yeah. knowing about four spike, but yeah it was a really fast format and same thing, you know, what are you going to do? Just pick a turn off yeah. and play with the mana up, storming yourself just because you know your opponent has four spike. So, yeah, he took ending. Not surprised to see turn three Voidwalker. That that makes sense given his uh, decision on the discard from the the second Grave Trigger. Wow, so Simone waits a turn to play the Voidwalker and Sydney plays the mana type anyway. That taps Simone out, but basically just makes it sort of that, you know, f f uh, ice your land without really drawing a card. Uh, Sydney follows that up with a Prismari command to kill the Voidwalker and make a treasure. Treasure is pretty important in a, in a matchup like this where the Grieve deck has a lot of removal, so you can't really count on your uh, Dwarven Mine token to survive, but targeting a treasure with, uh, with the... Um, doesn't work with transmogrify, unfortunately. Oh, there's transmogrify, right, right, right. Yeah, it does work with creativity. So he is setting him, setting himself setting himself up for a top deck creativity if he gets lucky. He he used that mana thice you mentioned probably to um, negate a scam play. You know, um, right, right, right. If if Simone had another of these one mana black mm. spells. He, he was fine with it. He figured, okay, that Mana is not going to do much for the rest of the game, so might as well make sure that Voidwalker dies. And um, we see Sydney realizing he's not really going to get a, a, a clean shot with Transmogrify. He just goes for it and hopes that somehow Simone doesn't have a push, doesn't have a Bowmaster, doesn't have a, a, a Bolt. But uh, unfortunately for him, um, that was not the case. That is a Teferi. Time Raveler, I yeah, believe. Very cool art of Teferi Time Raveler. I think there's a Terminate in Simona's hand. Not exactly the card he's looking for. No. Teferi bounces the Grief. So Sydney pretty much clears the board, makes it so that Teferi is on the board in case that he wants to try to resolve another Transmogrify or a Creativity on that Treasure Token. Doesn't have much of a choice since he's down to two while we've been, right. you know, talking, talking, talking. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Goes down to one from the trigger of the Wicked Roll. Fetch line here and there. Damage adds up. Sydney down to one. And we know that Simone plays cards like Cola Guns Command, Lightning Bolt. So he has a lot of draws to just end the game on the spot here. Yeah, a Shield Red would win the game. So lots of choices for Simone. He can just play the Grief, 
try to get a good card from Sydney's hand, who is also just down to the, the fairy on one counter. That's not going to do a whole lot for the next couple of turns. Yeah, Grief, definitely solid hard casting a Reef, making sure you only have that one draw step to get lucky with creativity. But he has a lot of cards in hand, so he's probably considering pitching Grief to evoke and maybe a more impactful creature. There is there is a there's a mana tide in Sydney's hand, but he I think that's only a mountain untapped. Although these days this land could be anything. It could be <laughs> it could be an island. It's more blue than red, but uh, I believe that isn't that, that isn't that, that is an actual mountain. Can't quite tell what the rest of the cards in Simone's hand are. Yeah, you mentioned that Terminate. I think there's like a, a Fable. Yeah, a Fable of the Mirror Breaker, a Terminate, a Grief. Nothing that really, you know, he, he's trying to figure out, okay, well, Creativity is probably a really good top deck for Sydney, but I still have a Terminate, so he probably just wants to play in a way that, yeah, just hard cast a Grief, and honestly, even if Sydney, uh, Creativity, he does have a Fetch Lands. Nope. So you would have been able to creativity for two, which probably would have been good enough to win the game. Um, yeah, with the Teferi on the table, you can't really stop them from doing that, right? So playing the Grief, taking a good card from their hand, and just threatening lethal if they don't do anything good just seems very uh, reasonable there. So 1-0 for our Ragdos Grief player. And here is the deck list. So now you can take a look at what's going on in Sydney's deck. Three copies of Manatide. Three copies of Reprieve, three Lightning Bolts, four Leyline Binding. Lots of interaction, Prismatic Ending, uh, and a Prismari Command, and then the usual suspects, four Creativities, one Transmogrify. Uh, you're casting those to try to get Archon of Cruelty into play, and also Fable, Ren and Six, and Teferi. Looking at the sideboard, playing against Ragda's Grief, what do you like here, Gabe? Veil of Summer stands out, counters, discard spells, just really solid card in matchup, especially when you're on the play. Okay. And as far as alternate alternative like targets for creativity, I'm assuming Archon's still best. Yeah, there are three options in the sideboard. Yona that uh, you can say you, you can name a color and then I don't either you or the opponent or both of you cannot play cards of that color. It's probably good against a combo deck. Uh, maybe not as great against uh, Ragdus Grief, Therostodon. And Elish Nord Grand Cenobite. I haven't seen that card in a while. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, as, as you're saying, none of those cards look particularly strong. Yeah, Basic Planes might come in if he's worried about Blood Moon. Okay. It lets you still use, you know, you've got Fable and Bolts. Uh, lets you cast some of your cards. Lets you potentially cast a, an ending if you ever already have a treasure in play. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming we're going to see Veil of Summer Planes get in. You know, get lost. Not the greatest against a grindy deck that can you know that has a bunch of cheap creatures and can use the maps effectively so uh, i would expect these these cards to come in and maybe just board that mana tithe right right if the opponent knows about it the, be the best mana tithe is the one that the opponent plays around but you don't actually have it uh yeah here is simona's deck list ragdus grief uh the deck that many people thought was gonna you know kind of fall off the map after the ban of uh, fury but here it is at 8 and 0. Oh, looks like a pretty typical deck list. I see one copy of Crocs, so one Bone Crusher, uh, Slash Stomp to kind of go around the, the protection from the one ring. We have two copies of Sh Shield Jet. Looking at the sideboard, uh, what do you think might be coming in here against the uh, against the matchup? You could, you could bring in Explosives to always have that um, you know reset button when they go for creativity. As long as you have Explosives on zero in play with two mana up you can try and, uh, you know, you just kind of counter creativity. Um, he, he could maybe bring the Blood Moons, extra Blood Moons seem decent. I would expect these to come in, especially on the play. It makes it mm -hmm. that much harder for the, the creativity player to fetch properly. Um, yeah, these are the, the two that stood out. I love the one Crocs. I feel that that card just wins you so many games. I feel like as a, you know, Typically slower control deck player, or even team or Rhinos player in this format. Proxa is really good. I was ac actually watching a French friend play the matchup, and he, he ended up getting got by Proxa. Mm. And I'm always a little surprised when I see, you know, a list without Proxa in Modern or in Pioneer, when I see 
Ragdos list was only only one Croxa. I just lose that card so so often. Yeah. And even in modern, I feel like it's it's strong. Yeah, especially combined with all this discard, you know, Thoughtseize, all these fetch lines, you can fill your graveyard really quickly. So getting it back uh, is usually not that hard. Is Blood Moon a thing for you? Maybe like on the play, on the draw kind of thing. Like, do you, or, or or game two, you know, you get your opponent with Blood Moon. Do you board it out for game three because you expect them to fetch basics, or do you think Modern is a format where you still want to have it in your deck? I'm, I, I it, Blood Moon is one of the cards I like the least in all of Magic. I mm. don't mind, you know, very much. I don't mind getting Tron on turn three. I don't mind a lot of things, but I feel like Blood Moon is just. You don't get to play Magic. You only get to play Magic. Have the time, you know, that Blood Moon's screws the player who cast it. Not really <laughs> have the time, but some of the time. And yeah, it's it's tough, honestly. There's there's mind games too. Do you do you bring it in? Do you you know, as someone who mostly plays against Blood Moon, I, I might have lost more games fetching basics, trying to like prevent getting wrecked by Blood Moon yeah. than actually losing to the Blood Moon. So I think on the play, I would expect someone who has Blood Moon in his decks to probably bring it in in this matchup, mm. even though we did see the basic planes in the sideboard. And I feel like Cindy's deck's probably still pretty functional, but it also stops the, the Dwarven Mine uh, one one. So right. Yeah, that's a good point. That, that's, that's a big part of the creativity deck, so... Yeah. I usually assume that my opponents are going to have them on the play when I'm playing something like Creativity or Omnath, and less often have them on the draw, but kind of a thing like it's it's really tough tough decisions to to know when you should fetch around blood moon and when you're better off just fetching the best lands and hoping they don't, just don't have blood moon and here we see simona actually fetching out a swamp with that black green fetch line on turn one does that signal uh blood moon to you it could be a bluff it could be like no no downside really maybe cost him a couple life down the down, down the line when he has to fetch for blood crypt but mm. the the Ragdos um, deck is really light on on red spells, and you only need one. So you know, maybe plan that seed, like kind of get the swamp on turn one when really you didn't even bring in the blood moons. But I, I would assume you know he does have the blood moons in his deck, and that's why he's fetching that way. This is also a great example of you know what's going on through a Hall of Famer's head. It's yeah, turn one. Maybe I'm fetching the swamp just just to bluff having the blood moon. You don't need, you don't necessarily need to have it, but just the threat of you know, making your opponent feel like you might, that might just change their play, you know, moving forward. Maybe they're going to get two basics now instead of instead of duels, and, and that can be the difference between, you know, casting creativity or not on, on the next couple of turns. So certainly interesting. There is the explosives, like, like you mentioned, basically, a, you know, a, a guarantee uh, that creativity for a token is not going to resolve unless Sydney has something like a Prismari Command. Yeah, he he would need Prismari Command. I like I like Sydney's build a lot. I usually prefer these creativity builds. You see sometimes the persist builds. Um, it, it varies a lot. Sometimes it's just a persist or two. Sometimes it's more uh, discard oriented with cards like I think it's called Bitter Reunion, the two mana red enchantment, etc. I like the kind of cleaner version. He also didn't get too greedy. He's only playing two Teferi Time Raveler, kind of trying to keep that. Mana curve pretty low with a lot of cheap interaction. Mm -hmm. And Prismari Command, just nice, versatile card that plays really well. It gives you the artifact, gives you answers to some annoying permanence and whatnot. All right, Simone with nothing but lands and the explosives so far. There's a Death in 3 for Sydney. He decides to tick it up. Yeah, Simone had to mulligan, I believe, down to 6, and just not the most exciting draw. And Sydney must be. Loving life right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. to play the fairy uptick, kind of chilling. You only really get punished by. I think they have. There's one molten collapse in Simone's deck mm -hmm. to kill a, a planeswalker. Yeah, and the fairy on the battlefield also kind of gives you a protection from Blood Moon, even if Simone resolves it. Sidney gets to bounce it next turn and perhaps try to find a way to stop it from resolving in the future or start fetching basics. Let's see what Simone has. There is a black leaf glyph. So there's a red source. Now you know the opponent's tapped out. There's not going to be any mana tithe or any reprieve action. So now you get to resolve your one thing. What is it going to be? It is awkward playing against a fairy because if you play Fable, your token's going to get sort of eaten for free and give give your opponent an extra card. But at least you have you develop your board in a in a in a way. 
Yeah, Fable's the only card that would be semi decent at this spot. We did see Sydney was Veil of Summer in hand. Choosing to tapping out makes sense. Not um, you know, you can't really get griefed and, and, and comboed was was a Teferi passive. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so Simona reading Teferi, that, that, that's also maybe kind of a giveaway. Like, okay, how does this work exactly with, <laughs> with, with Evoke? And yeah, yeah, okay. All right, Simona considering his options. Yeah, if, if Simone doesn't have at least a Fable here, he's going to be in really, really tough shape. What, what other card would even, would even have like half of an impact here? Yeah, I think I think he if he had a molten collapse, I think I think there's a good chance we would have seen him. Yeah. Uh, just slam it already. So uh, master maybe like not awful against the fairy, start ticking him down a bit. But that's that's about it. And and if he bow masters and he's tapped out and can't prevent creativity, but I guess you're at a point in the game where, you know, it, it gets to a point in the game sometimes where you can't really play around anything and you're better off tapping out and hoping they don't mm -hmm. have creativity. So wow. It, yeah. Well, your to fairy pass the turn. Feels bad, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure Sydney's loving that. A super awkward draw for Simona, who perhaps kept a hand with a lot of re reaction cards. That looks like a thoughtsies. That's a duress. Ooh, okay. Veil of summer. Command. Dismiss. One mana dismiss. <laughs> Counter draw. Thank you very much. We do see Sydney a little flooded, just a bunch of lands, Ren, not sure what else. But even even Ren for fetch lands, putting a bunch of 1-1s in play is somewhat impactful. Yeah, and this is so awkward for Simona, who drew his, his uh, oh no, that's a Thoughtseize, who drew his Thoughtseize on the turn when you finally have four mana, so otherwise you would have been able to at least activate the castle, you know, try to draw some extra cards. Yeah. Uh, but now he has three mana available, so... Not really using his mana in a very efficient way so far, just sitting on a bunch of reactive cards. Yeah. It would have been interesting to see Simone's hand if he is playing, you know, super cautiously, always keeping two mana for explosives, or if he really doesn't have anything, because I feel like he should probably be going for it. Obviously, we see parts of Sydney's hand, so I could be biased, but that, that game's going really poorly for you. I think you just have to take chances. There's the Dwarven Mine, end of turn, fetched with Blood Grip, so a free 1-1 one, one token. Ooh, is that a Triumph to go with the Ren? Or is so hard to see with all these cards? I think nice. it's the first time I, I do commentary with all these new crazy alternate arts. Oh, I, I, I'm i having trouble with that with that as well. <laughs> we usually have Chad help us out in, in this situation. All right, probably not a Triumph, or else I might have expected to just see Sydney go, you know, Play a land, cycle, get back the cycling land right away. But I guess there's no rush. He can just play a Ren, get back a fetch. Maybe maybe he didn't even have the, the untapped fifth land. So we'll see. We're about to find out, I guess. I, I can't imagine Simone having a real shot this game. I mean, we, we don't see his hand, but he's just so far behind. Yeah. It's not like he can do miracles at this point. There's no crazy comeback combo combination of cards really that that saves him, it's feel. The best is would be like Molten Collapse on Teferi, hope that resolves, and then have the Ragdos, the, the Grief, Evoke, you know, bring it back play. Yeah, we're also approaching a spot where Sydney might just start hard casting Archons. Thanks to the thanks yeah. to the thanks to the Ren. Um, looking at his mana base, he is he is able to put two black sources together with the uh, Oh, and here it comes. Creativity for yeah. Not sure how much, but good enough. <laughs> Poor enough. enough. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Simone packs up his cards. Uh didn't 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 manage to, to draw out of the mulligan. Too many reactive cards. Sydney's draw was uh pretty good, but also he didn't really have to, you know, fight against too much. So we're gonna go to game three. Does this change anything for you? Uh you know, as as the Ragdos player or or as the or as the creativity player, or is this is this uh still pretty much gonna be the same thing? I think one thing that, that definitely changes is you get to thoughts he's first or grief first. So you're gonna have a lot more information uh on the play as the grief player as if as Yeah. Your your veils do get much worse, obviously. 
uh it's it's kind of like you're you're not seeing much when you see that to be honest because everything everything's worse on on the drawing yeah. magic usually you know all your cards are worse all your cards feel worse what um, what about mana type on the draw in a matchup where okay well now i'm on the draw my opponent has four thoughtsies they have some duresses in the sideboard they're playing four grief and if they if they draw one of these cards on the play, then my mana type is pretty much going to be a dead card because they're going to play around it. Is 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 that a good enough reason to to perhaps board, board that out? Looking at 